இருந்து கொஞ்சம் ப்ளே பண்ணலாம் ஜி இது இருக்கா என்ன சொல்லிட்டு போங்களேன் புரிஞ்சுதுங்களா 
சார் ஏதாவது கொஞ்சம் மைக் ஏதாவது கொடுக்க முடியுமா இதில் இருந்து இதில் இருந்து அவுட்புட் கொடுக்க முடியுமா வராது மைக்கில் கொடுக்க முடியும் ப்ளே பண்ணா
Discovering something extraordinary about ordinary people and saying with ordinary words something extraordinary. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to Western Ghats Lit Fest 2.0 Day 2. Today, we are in for a treat. As the flame illuminates the darkness, it serves as a reminder that education dispels ignorance and enlightens our lives. I invite Srimati Shafali Vaidya, Srimati Sujata Kanagasabhapati, Srimati Sumaida Varma Oja, Srimati Jayashri Santaram, Srimati Swarup Sampatrav to offer flowers to Goddess Saraswati and to lighten up the lamps. heartfelt expression of their creativity and spirituality, a journey that translates language and dives deep into the core of our souls. Jai Shri Man. 
Thank you for the wonderful start to the events of today. It is my honor to call upon our chief mentor, Sundar Ramachandran ji, to address the gathering.
குட் மார்னிங் காலை வணக்கங்கள் இட் கிவ்ஸ் மீ கிரேட் பிளஷர் டு ஸ்டாண்ட் பிஃபோர் யூ ஒன் பிஹாஃப் ஆஃப் தி வேரண்டா கிளப் ஐ ஆல்சோ அண்டர்ஸ்டாண்ட் தட் வி ஆர் ரன்னிங் லேட் அண்ட் ஆக்சுவலி பர்சனலி ஐ வுட் லைக் டு ஃபாஸ்ட் ஃபார்வர்ட் டு தி ஃபாஸ்ட் ஃபார்வர்ட் பாரத் அஸ் சூன் அஸ் பாசிபிள் ஸோ ஐ டோன்ட் வாண்ட் டு keep all of you waiting for the real nice programs that are on uh, offer today <coughs> but i wanted to share a few thoughts uh, and i would be remiss if i did not mention these so first of is uh, that I, we at the veranda club were very thankful we are a very young organization and the kind of support that we have got from the <coughs> eminent thought leaders speakers Uh, who have graced our occasion uh, last year as well as this year uh, we are also very grateful to uh, shafali ji for guiding us last year and guiding us uh, this year uh, i think this year we gave less trouble to her than last year uh, and uh, we will give less tr- even more or less trouble next year professor kanak sabhapati has been our guiding light and uh, uh, he was he is so self effacing and so understated that uh, uh, you will really need to look at what he is really saying and and act upon that uh, you would be surprised that uh, <coughs> he has been meeting some of the the top most political entities and powers that be in this country but you wouldn't know about it and in spite of his extremely busy schedule of his various responsibilities he finds time for veranda club so thank you sir <coughs> now the other thing which i wanted to share was the kind of effort which the the eminent speakers have put in apart from their own professional lives which they obviously have in terms of research in terms of study in terms of field visits to bring to us in a capsule in uh, so wonderfully to bring up bring us bring us up to speed on what they know and on their knowledge it it's a huge amount of hard work and uh, the least that we we can do uh, to reciprocate that is to see how best we can support them in terms of time or effort or financially or even working the ecosystem to smooth the path for them if it is at all possible because yesterday's uh, shri uh, abhijit ji and uh, dr amit tadani's talk you could understand the power of the ecosystem and uh, the power of the ecosystem as somebody famously said the government can be yours but the ecosystem is ours so we need to fight that ecosystem and how we fight it in our own ways each of us will know better than some prescriptions from the top <coughs> the second thing which i wanted to speak about was the veranda club itself and uh, what next for us yes we will continue our flagship events but uh, it has been my passion especially after the kongu tamil sangamam last year that there is so much of richness in what the tamil language and the tamil speakers have to offer that we need to take this to the tamil hinterland at least around coimbatore pollachi tirupur avinashi uti and i was just talking to somebody uh, how can we translate whatever happened here yesterday into tamil i believe there is google translate or all kinds of stuff and have a voice over done and conduct this kind of program a one day program to people around this city they should also get benefited by this that is something that uh, is very passionate in my mind we will try to work on that in the veranda club the other thing is again i go back to shri abhijit joke wokeism that really scared us i mean that, uh, that we didn't realize we thought it was a joke on whatsapp but it's 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 so pervasive uh, how do you nip it uh, maybe veranda club should 
think of at least adopting a couple of schools, whatever little bit that we can do, and try to, you know, counter that uh, narrative. So that is something that we want to do. The last thing that I want to talk about is, <coughs> Uh, it is very important that each one of us uh, are economically strong because even today India does so many things on the world stage because of its new found economic heft and I think each one of us must be economically strong do whatever we can to help people around us to become economically strong and uh, I for one talk to all my <laughs> my all the people who provide service to me and try to send the Tamil versions of whatever is available so that we try to bring them to the right kind of thinking and uh, we need to you know give them the respect and say that yeah they are good thinking people only they have been brainwashed for so long and it's our duty to see that they come to the right path so once again uh, uh, it has been a wonderful yesterday and I'm sure today will be equally or more uh, wonderful uh, it's, uh, it's a byline in our family that Raman Parthupan great Rama devotees in the family so Raman Parthupan Rama will take care Rama will look after but I want to add Rama was was one of the epitome of duty and so we also need to do our duty uh, by what requires to be done. With that, I end my address and thank you very much for giving this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Up next, we are in for a big treat now as we have a special session of Bharat Fast Forward by Srimati Shafali Vaidya, Mr. Anand Ranganathan, Vishnu Shankar Jayanji, along with Sri Rohan Dua, a journalist, executive editor for the New Indian and a media personality. We welcome you all on stage. Vishnu Janji had to leave early yesterday because he had some cases coming. So we have requested Raghav Krishna ji to be a part of this panel. I uh, request him to come on stage, please. Hello. Hello. Namaskar everybody and welcome to day two of uh, Western Ghats Literature Festival 2.0. We have some very, very interesting sessions planned today and this is the first session which is kind of setting the tone for the theme of this festival which is Bharat Fast Forward. We are a very lucky generation of Bharatiyas because we are poised at this point in history with some very, very interesting things happening in Bharat. Today we are the only country which is friendly with Russia and with Ukraine. We are the only country that stands steadfastly with Israel and also saying that the other side also needs to be heard. We are, the, uh, we are set to be one of the largest economies in the world. You know all that, that's been coming in the media. And, but more important than that, I think we are once again poised on the brink of an opportunity, a great opportunity to reclaim our position in the world as Vishwaguru. So this panel discussion is basically going to talk about Bharat going fast forward in a variety of areas. So the way I've structured is, is all of our eminent speakers will get five to seven minutes to make their opening statements. 
then we'll have a very brief discussion and after that I'll open the floor uh, to questions from the audience because that is what is really needed a dialogue between and uh, dialogue between people essentially media and the future of media just one minute then I will request Anand to make a statement his opening statement on Bharat and uh, the equal rights for all citizens which basically means rights for Hindus essentially and Raghav has been doing wonderful work in the field of Indian knowledge systems and the spread of Bharat's soft power. So I would like to talk, I like him to talk about uh, Indian knowledge systems, the future of Indian knowledge systems, their global appeal and about Bharat regaining its position as Vishwaguru once and for all. Uh, Rohan, over to you. Uh, thank you everyone and thank you Shifali ji. You have actually been a very good friend and so has been Anand over the last uh, five or six years, uh, it sort of gives me a privilege to introduce and reintroduce ourselves as a uh, digital media outfit called New Indian. Mm, when I and my uh, partner, co-founder, Arti Tikku, uh, began this journey uh, in 2021, uh, our whole objective was not to take on the monstrous wire or the print or the scroll uh, who had devastated this country uh, for the last 10 years or so or even before when they pursued journalism uh, which I call it armchair journalism. Uh, I take it as a privilege that uh, if my parents uh, uh, sent me to uh, the brilliant alma mater of this uh, country uh, where I could uh, become a fine journalist whether it was St. Stephen's or London School of Economics uh, I never wrote either an article in the mainstream media where I worked, whether it was Reuters, Times of India or Indian Express uh, before I ventured into uh, this journey. Uh, I rather took it as a pride that if I have to move to the hinterlands of my country, then I must report from the field where these armchair journalists today uh, who are on the radar of the investigative agencies that is CBI and ED for having received funds from China or the American billionaires. They continue to, to become the tormentors of India even now uh, as someone famously said ki system to abhi bhi hamara hi hai. Main un patrakaron mein se aata hoon jo swadesh ko swadesh kehna bhi sikhte hain aur jo bharat ko bharat kehna hi swikar karte hain. Uh, मुझे अपने पत्रकारता पे भी उतना ही गर्व है और नाज है कि 2019 में अगर आर्टिकल 370 हटाया जाता है तो हम जैसे पत्रकार 5 अगस्त को ही रात को श्रीनगर पहुंच के वहां से रिपोर्ट करते हैं और आ, ये दिखाते हैं कि कोई भी मस्जिद वहां पे बंद नहीं हुआ जो आपको अगले दिन वायर और प्रिंट और स्क्रॉल में बताया जाएगा कि पहली नमाज फ्राइडे की वहां पे उसी तरीके से होगी जो 370 की धारा हटने से पहले हो रही है। I am going to when the session goes on to get moderated, but I am going to reveal and make some startling disclosures on how certain websites continue to receive funds from a man called George Soros, who has become India's famous tormentor for the last seven or eight years and has been also parallelly elected the governments in several states which I'm going to make the disclosures which hurts me and the sentiments and the collective sentiments of this country and it it should and why it should not when people like Abhisar Sharma people like uh, certain people I don't want to name right now uh, go on to side uh, with the state chief minister's son uh, of a city where we are sitting uh, when he makes disparaging remarks about Hindu dharm by comparing it to dengue. And these same websites still have the gall and temerity and audacity to write the articles by saying that Tamil Nadu chief minister's son is picking up faults and punching holes 
in the weaknesses of this dharm they do not have the courage to call a wrong a wrong to call spade a spade and that is where journalists modern journalists like us who have quit the conventional journalism of the broadcast or print journalism where we were earning more than what we are earning now while actually desolating those comforts of journalism we have taken the cudgels to enter into an industry where we are partnering with lit fest like this and we are taking the voices to the national capital of delhi proudly we must do that because if the mainstream and conventional journalism is not able to do that we are going to be shouldering that responsibilities with utmost level of trust and faith and that is where i believe that from here on this journey must continue it must evolve that evolution must continue and i can tell you i can uh, tell you with utmost sense of responsibility that we at new indian will show what is right we are not going to get afraid or cowed down by the zubairs or the rathis of this world we are going to bring the rangde basanti aapne jo khadna ho khad lijiye hum yahan se piche nahi hatenge that is our journalism very well said rohan and wish you all the best in this journey i know you've been doing some exemplary work and uh, even breaking some stories which are which no mainstream media would ever dare to touch more power to you good luck to you now i uh, ask anand you have spoken at length yesterday about the eight challenges that hindus face in this nation and uh, while i understand your position about what the government needs to do i have a different question for you i want to you to talk about the same thing but from the people's perspective and uh, Uh, suggest what do you think are the solutions what each one of us can do in terms of creating pressures in terms of making changes in our behavior what does the future of bharat look for the hindus of bharat thank you very much shifali and once again my uh, uh, real thanks uh, with appreciation to the amazing organizers of this festival uh, for inviting me it's um, uh, yesterday was a real an honor and a pleasure to uh, be witnessing all those marvelous sessions including the cherry on top which was vishnu's uh, session so thank you so much once again uh, shefali um, so in the 5 minutes that i have i've decided i will not talk about my book uh, um, or the eight reasons there because we did that yesterday and you asked a very probing question and i think i i kind of answered that uh, the best way i could i i want to begin and end on a very despondent note that's how uh, i want to wish you all a very good sunday uh, because uh, when you ask what is the future of hindus and of india when we do fast forward essentially that's the question uh the answer is very bleak is very bleak and i'll explain to you why and why nothing can be done about it so that this is one thing that i have thought about and i think a lot of you have thought about as well and there is no solution to this and it's not just me saying this the person who realized this before us before me uh, was gurudev ramindranath tagore and he realized this more than a century ago so i am not reinventing the wheel here what i want to put across you is think of a solution i can't but here are the facts the facts is that if we move fast forward uh maybe 30 years down the line 40 years down the line maybe not not so far off maybe if we move forward before we move fast forward we would realize that the problem is not so much of demography the problem is of the shift of democ- demography uh india the total fertility rate as india develops economically uh people become wealthier uh they produce less and less children the so called population explosion bogey will no longer be uh, an impediment in our progress there is ample scientific and other data to show this as well uh the total fertility rate in many states 
including states that have more than 30 to 40 percent Muslim population is going down. It's actually some, t it's in Bengal it is less than two, um, which is the case for many European countries. Uh, in many cases it is high, but if you look at the decadal population rate for Hindus as well as Muslims, it's going down. The trends are good across religions, religious communities. Of course, Hindus, it's going down faster. The question is not of population. The question is when a society which is seeped in religious dogma decides to come together and shift en masse. That is what is happening. That was the reason for Pakistan. And that is the biggest worry for this country going forward, even beyond forward going fast forward. There already are regions where you have 90%, 95% Muslim population. I don't even want to talk about Kashmir, the Kashmir Valley, which is 98% Muslim. And you know what happens there. This is not something that I'm going to tell you that would be news to you. When you have a, a Muslim majority state or a population, you know the kind of things that happen and they would happen unabashedly because you are following there the fundamentals. It is not something to be embarrassed about. They would say this is written, you allow this, you haven't banned this, this is what is going to happen. We are going to pass laws already in Jharkhand. You have Sunday being removed from uh, as a holiday, you have Friday as a holiday. Already you have when you had in Kashmir Valley, cinema halls were closed, women were not allowed to do a lot of things that they were doing earlier. You had, uh, uh, you know, a lot of persecutions against gays, homosexuals. Those are the things that are written as fundamentals. Those are the things that are going to happen. So India will not become a Muslim majority nation for another centuries, maybe, you know, uh, hundreds of years. But there will be strong pockets that would be almost 100% Muslim majority. There is no solution to that because everything is happening legally, everything is happening with legal lawful sanction and you can't do anything. Just say there is a meme, sab aap shant rahiye, sab tasalli se ho raha hai. <laughs> I don't, what's the exact language, uh, you know. So Kairana, for example, was 30% Muslim just a decade ago or more ago. It is now 93% Muslim. Two days ago in Malapuram, you had the ex-Hamas chief being linked up. I've just tweeted the video, maybe it's not gone yet. Tens of thousands of Keralites, Indians, are wildly cheering and applauding him. This is the same terrorist whose organization has just murdered 1,400 innocent men, women and children, beheaded children, raped en masse abducted elderly and you have this guy linked up in Kerala, God's own country and you have tens of thousands of Indians cheering him. This is happening. This is happening across the country. You've just witnessed the new riots in Mewat. Let me quote to you from a magazine. In December, 19 December 1947, Mohan Das Gandhi visited Ghasera village in Mewat, that's the region where you have 70 to 80 percent Muslim majority. Amid the tumult of partition, he assured the Mios, the community of Muslims native to the region, that their security was paramount to him and urged them to reconsider leaving for Pakistan. Mios heeded Gandhi's words and stayed back. They wanted to leave. Gandhi went there and said, don't. They stayed back. Now it is 80% Muslim population. You had the new riots. You had the mob entering a hospital, segregating the patients into Hindu and Muslim patients, Hindu and Muslim doctors, assaulting a three-year-old child of a Hindu doctor. This is not something to worry about the Indian Muslim population. This is happening because of demographic shift. And if you think, yes, you may, that I am a Sanghi, I am saying this, let me now quote someone. Quote, the only effective way of solving the minority's problem lies in population exchange. Until that is done, 
even with the creation of Pakistan, the problem of majority versus minority will remain. Transfer of minorities is the only lasting remedy for communal peace, unquote. Who said this? B.R. Ambedkar. He could see it. He could see the, the things uh, almost 80 years ago. But even before him, someone who could see him was, I began the thing and I'll end very quickly, was Gurudev Ramidana Tagore. He said, Islam is a religion that is intent upon destroying all other religions. So I'm not reinventing the wheel here. If you read the scriptures, as Gurudev read, he realized it. And he said, the only way to maintain peace is to succumb to it. Now, that is India for, forward, fast forward, super fast forward, whatever you may call it. But essentially what is going to happen is India is going to go backwards. Thank you. That was a despondent note, you were right. But I am an optimist, so I will quote a Dylan Thomas poem here, which says, do not go gently into the night, rage and rage till the dying light. So even if we have to go into the dark night, like wise men like you say that the night is dark, we should rage and rage against the dying light and we should not go gently into the dark night. My question to you, Raghav, is, okay, please, say something positive <laughs> because I don't want people to go out for the coffee break looking very sad and despondent. My <laughs> so we are talking about Indian knowledge system, we are talking about the world realizing the goodness in a lot of things that are from Bharat like meditation, like yoga, like re realizing the potential of Ayurveda and all your uh, new age healing techniques like NLP, like uh, whatever you call it, there it's ultimately based on our philosophy, it's ultimately based on our techniques, it's ultimately based on the knowledge and wisdom that Bharat has to offer to the world. So what do you think the future is going to be for Bharat? Can we really become Vishwaguru? Can we really regain our status? And please be positive. <laughs> Hari Om, uh, I think from Vishwaguru to despondency, uh, I think uh, but I think it's representative of the schizophrenia that the modern Hindu mind and the modern Hindu society lives in. In fact, what just happened in the last 10 minutes is a microcosm of what our daily life is. There are moments where we feel, we, you know, in communities like this, when we talk about our knowledge systems, when we walk into spaces which uh, represent our culture, uh, we feel optimistic. Uh, we feel that we represent the morality of a civilization. We feel that sense of confidence. We feel the empathy of our ancestors. But you also look at the political reality and you look at the demographic reality, you look at the global reality and you recognize that your optimism has to be tempered a little bit. But it is also the quintessential uh, ability of the Hindu mind to reconcile the opposites. And we are coherent, we are, uh, we are a nation, we are a civilization simply because the Hindu mind has the ability to look at the large patterns and replicate in its everyday life, in its Nitya Karma, the patterns that sustain the entire universe. So for a civilization that has understood how the entire cosmology is created and sustained, I think, and, and while I take Anand's words with a lot of uh, serious uh, concern, uh, I, I am an optimist, uh, but uh, the question really is, what should we do? My friend Pankaj has a very good quip on this thing that we recognize all of this, but you are ultimately like Rama Squirrel, all of us. You take whatever you can take on the back of your uh, uh, shoulders, and you take that sand and you go and build that bridge, right? So that's always been the civilizational way. And I think that gives us an opportunity to look at what kind of knowledge will help us navigate through this. The knowledge of reality, the knowledge of demography is also part of that knowledge. But there is, uh, you know, we at Brihat, uh, where, uh, you know, we work together, our idea is about culture as the, uh, as the primary concern, because everything that we're talking about resides in culture. It resides in the daily exchange that produces meaning and that we learn through the process of socialization. And these are the instruments that we need to recreate because that is what the civilization sustained on. So when we speak about knowledge systems, we are talking about uh, two simultaneous things. One is, of course, the culture. And I'll maybe quickly define or at least offer a definition of culture from how we see it. And the second is the institutionalization of that uh, which gives us civilization. And in that, I think lies our answer of how do we uh, survive, move forward, and potentially thrive. 
we need both Swayambod and Chatrubod. We need to know ourselves and we need to know the enemies. And this whole sense that there is no other, uh, you know, everything is uh, uh, Vasudeva Kutumbakam is not true. Because even if you look at the Niti Shastra that it comes from, the word itself, that phrase itself comes from a very, very different kind of uh, usage in a different context, right? So how do we decode this? How do we understand the role that knowledge systems has to play and culture has to play in this? I'll try and give an example of uh, culture that I recently uh, experienced uh, when I looked at the news from Odisha. About three months ago, there was this terrible train accident in Odisha, right? Uh, just a matter of seconds, the entire uh, train flipped and people died. About 11 days later, because that was a moment of national grief, about uh, 11 days later, the people in that village, all the people in the nearby village, they came together and they offered Pitriruna, the Tarpana, to people who died in the train accident. Now this one single minute, it was just a one minute clip on national television, it tells you the genius of this civilization. And not as Pawan Verma writes about this in the great Hindu civilization, that the imagination of Bharat as a geocultural entity, which is the Icha of the Rishis, and the answer to Anand's uh, you know, provocation to all of us about whether we will survive or not is also in that. It is not just our Shakti. There is a higher Shakti that is at play that is, will always be at play in India. And the villagers, without any state action, without any market incentive, came together and they offered a ritual for somebody that they've never met after death. What is it telling us? It is telling us that Hindus play the infinite game and that is culturalized. And they are able to come together by their own volition to offer something to others that they've never met and will never meet. The people are dead, right? And that is, that is the metaphysics of karma and punarjanma. Why did they do this? They did this because they understood that if the death was sudden, there are certain desires that are left unfulfilled for those souls. In the Hindu way of thinking, you have to offer something so that the souls have their journey. Now, this kind of very abstract metaphysical thinking seeped into the everyday habit is what we call culture. Culture is not food, travel, selfie. Culture is the metaphysics of life, death, karma. And in our understanding, if we have to look at what will help us survive, it is going back to that knowledge which gives you the way to live, which then sacralizes the entire place. All of us have this experience in our own houses because so far, this analysis of a rational kind, which is very critical, very important, does not fully tap into the Daivik Shakti that is actually the basis for this civilization. And if you just understand and reflect on our own behavior every day, in our, each of our houses, there are different spaces. In most of the Indian homes, uh, regardless of religion perhaps, but definitely in Hindu homes, you will have a space which is dedicated to gods. You are the same person and you have extraordinarily bad behavior in the rest of the house. But when you move into that part, you are mindful. You are actually very, very aware of what you speak. You are aware of what your, you know, what your uh, content is of your mind, right? Why did that happen? It happened because you acknowledge that there is a higher presence. You are in the presence of that force and it alters your behavior immediately. And it is through that behavior that we create common action. And it is this we call the knowledge system. The knowledge system is not some abstract where, of course, there is a whole ontology, axiology, epistemology, praxis. We can speak the academic jargon. But the fact is that this genius of this civilization is that the metaphysics of life, death, the metaphysics of what is meaning, what is transcendence, has been culturalized into the everyday living and it has created the sacred space. Now, if we can understand this example of what happens in our own houses when we visit the sacred space, and you then wonder about how did this civilization, without actually having whatever centralized institutions that we see in other cultures, how did it actually come together? What Pawan Verma calls the audacity of ideas, that ideas of karma, punarjanma, rana, nitya kriya, all of these things have built this land of 2,000 square kilometers by 1,800 square kilometers, north to south, uh, east to west, for over at least 6,000 years. What is it that is binding? There is a different Shakti that is uh, at play here and the way to survive, when the way to define knowledge systems is to actually tap into the traditions of knowledge and start, for example, to be very specific what needs to be done. We need to get the Bhairava back, we need to get Madurga back, we need to get Sri Rama back. 
the minute your god start talking in culture the minute our people start looking at our gods in our culture then the forces that you're talking about are not greater than our gods that is the belief that we need to go with very well said this reminds me of a story a marathi story that i read that was about a monastery somewhere in afghanistan and this is uh, when uh, afghanistan is going through the transition from being a hindu stroke buddhist nation to islam has come to of the borders and there are frequent raids from across the border and uh, every time the raids happen the monasteries are deserted because the monks don't fight so what they do is they just leave the monastery as it is and they run away and hide in the cave and then the marauders ke come they break the murtis and that is where the word butchikan came from because there were so many buddha murtis and they were destroyed so that is how uh, the islamist marauders call themselves uh, murti destroyers butchikan so this goes on like over a couple of years continuously and the story starts with there is a very old monk who is meditating and he there is a news that there is a raid there is a raid so all the younger monks are packing up their stuff and they're saying let's go let's go let's run away it's again come so the old monk this time he stands up and says i'm not going to run away i'm not going to fight i mean i'm not i'm not going to sit quiet and uh, not fight so the younger monk say that but you are a buddhist monk how can you fight he says no you have to fight for righteousness you have to fight for dharma and there comes a time when you have to fight and then the story ends with all the other people have deserted him it says this old monk in the monastery and he hears the sound of the horses and he bends down and he picks up a stone the story ends there what happens after that is left to your and my imagination but i found that story incredibly moving because it is a gesture it is a gesture of resistance it is a gesture of not going quiet into the night while believing in your daivi shakti while believing in your culture that really uh, kind of anchors you and that uh, keeps us where we are despite so many transitions i'll come back to you rohan you talked about media and you talked about the corrupt influences in media and you talked about how uh, media is no longer about actual investigative journalism it's not about going into the field it's basically just talking heads in a either in a studio who make speakers fight like roosters you know anand would know what i'm talking about every day he goes on tv channels or it is about uh, already deciding the headline and then working on the story backward to kind of fit the headline so how do we break media especially from this trap and get them back into what media is supposed to be doing which is actual reporting which is actually investigative journalism which is actually informing the people of this country about events happening uh, you know shivali while you were asking the question i began to roll up my sleeves <laughs> this is exactly what any reporter worth his or her salt should do roll up your sleeves leave the comforts of your home come to coimbatore or go to uh, go to the hinterlands of thank you so much go to the hinterlands of up kashmir chatisgarh and rajasthan to expose the rut rut of the conventional media which has not been able to uh, break its mold because it's people like us who perpetuated the myth that only the left liberal media what they say is the gospel truth why because they were also people the black sheep even in the current government regime who allowed this to perpetuate the fine example is what i'm going to reveal now that a leading national broadcaster uh, sunset television which was earlier known by the nomenclature rajya sabha tv it went on to pay a whopping 28 crore to the leading editor of the website which runs and peddles the agenda right now that is the wire a certain mr vardarajan a certain mr paranjoy gua thakurta who is on the ed radar who keeps on selling quad swallow daily non stop on the websites on the social media was getting paid from the coffers of the national uh, treasury so how can we ill afford uh to not allow people like us 
who have reported extensively, who have today left the comforts of our home uh, to report from Coimbatore extensively on what you or Mr. Ranganathan or Mr. Avasti is going to speak because we believe that there is a method behind this madness. When the websites like scroll, the print, the wire, they operate it today, they have luxurious offices in the posh parts of, of Delhi. Why should ED not raid them? Why has it taken eight or nine years of this government to realize that the funding which was coming to a portal called NewsClick was directly operated through China? After all, it was our investigation, investi investigative journalists like us went out of the comforts of this home to sift through the files, sit with the sleuths in the Khan markets where generally the gangs come to operate and clink the wine glasses. We were sitting under the fan, sweating out in the sweltering heat of June, July uh, summers of Delhi, going through the files of how the news how this website news portal news click was getting the funding of about eight to nine crores annually a year imagine can you any of you earn this this huge amount of a year in in, a, in a average in a year art se no crore aap sochiye ek website ke paas aata hai jiske paas mein sirf 6 ya 7 patrakar hain aur un patrakaron ka kaam ye hai subah se sham from morning till evening all they do is just crib about where, why Hinduism is expanding? Why madrasas are getting shut down? Why not? I would do reverse the story. I would go on to support the yogi government when it does geotagging and geofencing of madrasas. Because these madrasas are terror factories. We will call them terror factories at New Indian when we report these. When, because when we visit these madrasas, we believe that it is the same man who from Kanpur are carrying the ISIS flag, disguising themselves as armed officials, as army officials, Indian army officials, Indian Air Force officials, and leading India's first ISIS attack on a train that runs from Kanpur to Chhattisgarh. Just before elections of 2017 in Uttar Pradesh, which sends the largest number of MPs to create a scare that yes, if we come to the power, if Samajwadi party comes to the power, then we will have their support. You better not vote for it. But we will report on their modus operandi by exposing from the telegram and the WhatsApp secret chats how they operated and brainwashed men in Kerala, men in UP. But these uh, so-called uh, websites which continue today, today to receive funds from a man called George Soros, which I have crore Jo funding gai Raja Sabha TV se. Wo us door mein bhi gai when this government was, was also in the power. So someone was also misleading even this government sitting in the higher echelons of, of, of the INB ministry. There are black sheep in this, in this country who under the disguise of giving support to us, that is the media at large or people like you who hold these events need to be exposed as well. And we are doing that. We are doing that. On a consistent basis, we will go hammer and tong at the Abhisars or the Rathis of this world, which we have now. We will be non-stop. You see, the problem here is not because of the fact that just a one man, George Soros, has been operating. There are at least, according to our own investigations, which we have done with several journalists outside, 1,399 such open societies which under the garb of using a coined phrase like independent journalism, they support these websites. I must tell you and I must share my own investigation re revealed that a company called Razorpay, <coughs> a digital payment interface called Razorpay delivered 7.5 crore to a man called Mohammed Zubair under the garb of receiving funds from Dubai, Emirates, Malaysia, Indonesia. How? You think that Razorpay is a digital interface. Razorpay had to issue an 
explanation after my expose saying that we would not like to be associated with this man. Enforcement Directorate and Delhi Police, the financial wing of the Delhi Police had to commission a probe against this individual. I will raise my voice against this man. I will raise my voice against those journalists who continue to receive a windfall of resources from these Islamic countries using these digital interface and then go on to create and wage a war in this country by supporting Hamas. The reflection of this is also seen in a pseudo editors platform which has been made over the years called Editors Guild. You see, I find it absolutely stunning that the Editors Guild comprises today of those journalists who have never even reported and gone to Sopor where the terror attack took place or from Uri or Pulwama where the terror attacks took place and they side with the same separatists. Please pronounce it correctly, it's editor's guilt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is, this is where we need to have uh, the tongue-in-cheek of Anand as well. Uh, I personally believe Shifaliji Anand and Raghav, कि अगर आप लोगों ने और इन लोगों ने उस दिल्ली के प्रेस क्लब में जिसकी आठ बजे एट ओक्लॉक, you see a certain Mr. Sangvi who was once the editor of Hindustan Times, Mr. Sangvi, he would open the cork of champagne at eight o'clock and discuss what are the Hindi chaste abuses that he must discuss with the women of this country. That is the standard of journalism which we saw over the last 15 years where the comforts of Merck's and the BMWs decided the course of the Latians. Why does the phrase Latians emerge after 2009 and 10? Because it's the Khan market gang which today wipes crocodile tears, which today sheds actually so much of crocodile tears when these people are raided were actually the people who were who were clinking the glasses in the comforts of the Delhi's elite press club, where four days after the news click is raided, where four days after uh, India offers support to Netan Yehu, these people go on to claim support for Hamas. They, they run demonstrations, imagine, against their own government saying that why are you supporting a, and, and supporting a, a, a country where, where uh, Kids uh, are getting uh, uh, killed by the Hamas. They run open demonstrations. They run open protests. Imagine the conscience that you have to kill of yourself as a journalist when you go on to become part of this so-called editor's guilt. I believe you should kill yourself with the guilt and the remorse if you have to go on to be part of this editor's guilt. Thank you, Rohan. That was very enlightening, actually. Many of us did not know this. Anand, I want to ask you a completely different question. Not many people ask you this. I am not going to talk about your role as a civilizational warrior. I'll go back to your day job as a scientist, actually. And I want to know what is Bharat's future in the field of science and technology? Because we know that Bharat was the, uh, was the leading nation, leading civilization that contributed to the world in science technology, in math, in metallurgy, in, uh, in surgery, you name it, in medicine, in many other things. But of late we have, we have seen very few, or at least that's a perception, maybe wrong, you might know better, that very uh, less original research or original innovations or inventions have come out of Bharat in the field of science and technology. I want to hear your take on what is the future of science and technology. Can Bharat regain its position as a thought leader in, in specifically these fields? Thanks very much. I'll, uh, before I come to that, I just wanted uh, a leftover uh, response to my dear friend uh, Raghav. First of all, you know, of course, uh, everything that Rohan said I echo, but I always get worried when he says I roll my sleeves and think there is someone else who I remember who rolls his sleeves, you know, and then goes forward. So please be, 
<laughs> the leader of opposition or or opposition of leader we don't know <laughs> so uh, but you know um, jo raghav ne kaha usse mujhe ek uh, as someone said uh, quite famously that while the hindu sharpens ref refines his argument the muslim sharpens his sword you know what raghav said reminded me of that uh, when he talks of divine shakti helping the hindus going forward hindu community that is isolated i just want to give you two or three example and this is not being derisive against or or, or for the divine shakti i am uh, you know a self declared uh, darwinian atheist but i do not mind the believers at all i i i i kind of very much like i am a civilizational hindu and uh, each to his or her own but uh, did this divine shakti help those who were butchered in january 19th 1990 and ran away from a population that was overwhelmingly 98.4% muslim did this divine shakti help those in kerana did this divine shakti or thinking of this help those yesterday in malappuram when they are witnessing tens of thousands of their fellow indians cheering a hamas terrorist who's been linked up and finally i know of one gentleman called mr shankar bhat the only politician who actually helped the kashmiri hindus who were running away after being uh, a genocide was committed against them was bal thakre so he gave refuge to this mr shankar bhat a kashmiri hindu his his children studied in schools because of bal thakre uh, he stayed next to azad maidan and he told me couple of years ago that the funny thing is when the ca thing was starting and the la 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 tera mera rishta kya everything started you said and now you see the resonance here you see indian muslims marching fighting supporting hamas fighting for palestinians rights right and he said i i have witnessed rohingyas who committed a genocide against hindus in myanmar and this has been validated by the united nations and you had indian muslims writing in azad maidan demanding refugee status for those ro rohingyas he said when did any indian muslim march for the rights of kashmiri hindus people like me who were driven out but so this divine shakti is great to channelize your energies or to feel good and calm about things but i am afraid when something is been done legally openly when subconsciously we have accepted five times a day thrown at us that there is no god but allah five times a day and you are forbidden to worship anybody else is that not egregious and rude towards people who have other gods but we've accepted it and likewise we've accepted every other thing that is happening legally you see gujarat has a law where if a riot or communal disturbance happens you cannot sell or buy the property of the person belonging to the other religion congress brought this law but it is there in gujarat it is to prevent large scale migration migrations in and out but in kerana there have been no riots in bengal there have been no riots in malappuram there have been no riots but hindus have been forced to flee so it is happening there is no solution raghav divine shakti uh, i'm sorry i i disagree humbly disagree something else would have to be done but now very quickly to come to shefali my apologies that i kind of uh, 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 went tangential yes um, two two ways to answer this question shefali one i think first it has not been acknowledged enough but i want to acknowledge it and i i do use every platform to acknowledge it that india's finest achievement scientific or non scientific since independence has been to administer a vaccine to a billion indians twice over within a year when we started vaccinating the naysayers or the the latians entitled said look at uh, jacaranda or i've even forgotten her name new zealand prime minister we need a prime minister like her right jacinda jacinda jacaranda whatever the thing is <laughs> okay we bring her to india 
right? And after we had vaccinated a billion Indians first dose, she still had not finished vaccinating New Zealanders who are only 10 million population. <laughs> yes. So uh, it's been spectacular. When, we, when the push comes down to shove, we have shown our metal, And it makes me immensely proud that Indian scientists were at the forefront. However, when you talk of going forward, we not only have to take care of eventualities like this, we also have to be prepared to see what is around us, whether we can use that. And there, I'm afraid, we are lacking. To give you one example, I'll finish within a minute. How many of you know uh, Lakshmi Kutti? Okay, one hand has gone up, but that is my wife, so that, uh, <laughs> because I have told her maybe or she's learned it, so that, that doesn't count at all. <laughs> okay, um, uh, no hand went up. Oh, I'm so sorry, ma'am, one, one hand. So I would say 99.99% people did not know. I was in the same boat as yours. Couple of years ago, even I didn't know who Lakshmi Kutti was. Lakshmi Kutti got Padma Shri four years ago because all her life, she's 85 year old frail lady. She stays in the jungles of Kerala. She has been collecting medicinal plants and cataloging them. Her library is now 500 plants. And each of those plants will have a molecule that will cure cancer or diabetes, where Indians are now, more than 100 million Indians are confirmed diabetics. Confirmed 100 million. 150 million Indians are pre-diabetic. These are catastrophes that are waiting to happen. Because with great prosperity, we have flipped the kind of diseases that were affecting Indians in 1990. 70% before economic liberalization, 70% of the diseases that affected Indians were communicable diseases like tuberculosis, malaria, viral diseases. 30% were non-communicable like heart ailments, diabetes, asthma, cancer. Now it is flipped. 70% of diseases affecting Indians are diabetes, heart ailments, asthma. So we gave her Padma Shri, but now we've forgotten about her. Any of those 500 plants will have a super drug that might cure uh, either cancer or diabetes or asthma or any of those communicable or non-communicable diseases. We should have had 500 Lakshmi Kutti Natural Products Institutes by now, where the mandate would be your job is this is the plant. Find out the active ingredient. Try and see what happens to it. And just to end, if you think this is a figment of my imagination, I want to ask, how many of you know T-U-U? No, your hand going up doesn't count. Yes. So T-U-U was a Chinese lady, 10 years elder to Lakshmi Kutti. So she's probably 95 now. Like Lakshmi Kutti worked the jungles of Kerala, she worked the jungles of China. In 1960s, she discovered a plant. She isolated the molecule out of that. That molecule is artemisinin, and artemisinin is now the only viable cure for malaria. And for that, TUU got the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Pharmacology. And what will happen, I'll tell you. This cornucopia of 500 plants of Lakshmi Kutti, Western Europeans or Western nations, their labs would say, seek access from our government to take this library to their labs they would do it. Lakshmi Kutti is very gracious. She would give them the plants happily. Once the plants are there, they would isolate the molecule. Those molecules would be multi-billion dollar anti-diabetes, anti-cancer drugs. They would get the Nobel Prize. They would go to the Nobel Prize award ceremony and thank Lakshmi Kutti. And we would be overjoyed. We have given her a Padma Shri. We'll possibly give her a Padma Bhushan. Thank you. Raghav, you wanted to answer and uh, after that uh, do we have time for a question answer session 10 minutes okay i'll be brief uh, and i should have expected this uh, i mean to speak about a civilizational hindu uh, without the idea of god as the central uh, force uh, is to speak of temples like a museum right? we can all visit uh, them for cultural artifacts uh, there are two ways to approach the question of our civilization and of our truth. And like I said, we need both Swayambodh and Chatrubodh. 
the idea of uh, a divine shakti unfortunately because of maybe the education maybe because of popular culture maybe because of the influence of the global culture has somehow come to in our imagination be divorced from the real fundamentals of life itself now uh, the first way to approach the question of your civilization is if we were so great why were we conquered the second way to approach our civilization is uh, how did we survive a million years of oppression if you are going to just die in the next 50 years the first question precludes the possibility of an empathetic spiritual inquiry the second question does not the second question can still very critically examine what went wrong correct it but at the same time it has the creative possibility of really understanding your spiritual heritage now whether or not uh, you know in, in our recent examples uh, any any history survey can give us examples for anything uh, but Shivaji Maharaj did pray to Bhavani Mata, right? Uh, Sri Aurobindo did have a vision of Sri Krishna in prison. Swami Vivekananda prayed to Ma Kali, right? So whether, you know, we believe in Tagore, whether we believe uh, in uh, uh, Shivaji Maharaj, whether we believe in Sri Aurobindo, whether we believe in Swami Vivekananda, there is just one idea of Bharat that has held the civilization together. If we are claiming a civilization for India, if we are saying that this is an inherited tradition, Without God as the central figure, there is no Indian civilization which is unique, which is different to any other global civilization. We might as well call ourselves any other civilization. Then the concern of a Hindu does not matter if it is just a cultural entity. Even a you know, secular state might give you temples to have uh, like cultural visits. Right? The reason we care about this and this dichotomy that if we are spiritual and talking about divine Shakti, we will not have the weapons is actually, uh, I, fe I feel fallacious. Because the policy response to actually changing the very constitution, changing the laws, will also come when each one of us expresses the cultural demand. And for us, the culture is religious. Bharat is religious. This is Swami Vivekananda's seminal observation. Unless you and I really demand that our temples be the places of worship where God is central, there is no other force that gets us together. And once we have sufficient numbers of us who actually demand that, then the state better respond to that. That is when the problem that you are articulating of how do we tackle this without the state force is essentially linked to the question of Indians finding their own divine Shakti once again. To see this as two different things I think is not just a cognitive fallacy, uh, but it's also a bit of a, a fear uh, because we don't have any other way. Might as well uh, uh, give it up, right? So uh, I don't uh, accept this argument that these are separate uh, inquiries. I think the first and the Daivik Shakti leads to the Praja Shakti which leads to the Satta Shakti and the constitutions that we need uh, to protect our freedoms. Thank you. Hello. I have time for two, possibly three questions. Uh, please just ask a question and ask the person who you are addressing it to. Not exactly a question, a small clarification or whatever is explanation. The yesterday's that Hamas leader who spoke and all those people who attended are the liberal Muslims of Kerala, the members of Muslim League Party. Okay. They are the allies of the Congress Party fighting election for several years. The hardcore people are the members of the popular front of India, members who are not there. All of a sudden then one credit should be given to the government like the Article 370 is the ban of popular front of India and taking away all the top leaders overnight in a very secret operation, several aircrafts flying to various airports in Kerala at 3 o'clock in the morning, taking around 1,500 hardcore criminals. They're, still we don't know their whereabouts. Nobody, even media is not speculating. That was a fantastic operation, even the national media never covered it properly. There is a small silver lining in this Islamic issue. There are a lot of new ex-Muslims are coming up. In Kerala especially, I have seen there are many of their, this thing, they attract around two to three lakhs followers in the ex-Muslims YouTube channels. They criticize, a Muslim can criticize Quran, he can talk about Nabi as a rapist and racist, but Hindu cannot do it. But these people are doing it on the YouTube channels, they are getting a lot of traction. That is a good silver lining on the atmosphere. Thank you. Uh, 
few months back, I happened to visit Bali. Bali is uh, in, Mus in Indonesia, part of Indonesia, Muslim majority country. Bali is 90% Hindu. And moment you land in the Bali airport and come out, all the st anywhere in this junction, there's beautiful, you know, statues of some stories from Ramayana and Mahabharata, which I, I also didn't know. Every building, the hotel I stayed, the moment you enter the hotel, there has to be Lord Ganesha's statue. School, I visited a school, I entered a school, there's a Ganesha. There's a temple, I mean, there's a mosque. Outside the mosque, there is Ganesha, you know, on the wall. Then, on the hill, their most sacred temple is there. So, no building in Bali can be higher than that temple. So no skyscraper can be built. So so much of this thing has been given to Hindu, Hinduism in a Muslim, Muslim majority country and Hinduism has survived. So in a country where Hindus continue to be majority, why do we need to be so despondent when many Shefali ji and so many of you all are there? Why should you get a sense of despondency? That's my question. <laughs> That's an interesting question, and I think Hindus uh, will also be given a lot of rights in India when it become, we become Muslim majority. That's not a... Uh, no, uh, you see, please try and understand. I don't just, uh, uh, you know, kind of peddle despondency uh, uh, just for the heck of it. No, I mean, I'm not being disparaging. I, I completely understand your question. But this is one of those very few problems that... I cannot find a solution to and it really irritates me you know almost everything you buy by by virtue of the, what I do uh, it is by habit I want to find a solution either I find a solution or I look for a solution somebody else has found it here there is no solution because everything is happening legally and once you become a Muslim majority you start to follow those principles please understand I mean, it is not something that I'm saying that's new. It is by design. Uh, there will be discrimination against women, against homosexuals, against non-believers. There will be. What are you going to do? You will not be taught. You will not be... There will be hundred things that would suddenly... ...that would be... of the fellow in Kairana, in Malapuram, uh, think of the Kashmiri Hindu in the valley in Srinagar, who's you are encouraging to do this. He is suffering. You are feeling good because he is suffering. Should he be suffering? There are death threats to him. He can be killed any moment. He, his his uh, uh, you know, family is under threat of rape, abduction, conversion. So while it feels good for you to say that, yes, stay put, stand your ground, this is what Hinduism is, you're not doing it. Somebody else is doing it. And I don't have a response for that except feeling ashamed and guilty. Just one question, uh, just one question quickly. Yeah, oh, okay. Uh, Anandaji, make it quick and make the answers also quick, please. Yeah, the question is something that I've asked always, Kshatratvam Kutaha. We've always been asking this question. Uh, we are all happy to uh, say, Mera kya jata, kiska baap ka kya jata? And you know, let's just train our children to get into engineering overseas, go overseas and get the five-acre house. So how do we recreate? I mean, from all your conversations, the only thing that I feel is the lack of the Kshatra 
you know, the drudges, the dynamism is there, but the kshatra is missing. And how do we generate that kshatra amongst our next, next generation? Please answer in one sentence. <laughs> three institutions and the three institutions that have given us the Indian civilization. The first one is family, second is guru, third is temple. It is these three institutions that we need to re-anchor on and that is why God is central because the thing that binds all of these things is not secular, it is sacred. So uh, Rajas also comes from sacred, uh, Anandaji. The, in less than a sentence, the family is being converted, the temple is being demolished and my guru is Zakir Nayak. So. You want to add something quickly? You see, my guru is only Shifali Vaidya and Anandangarsa no Zakir Naik. Thank you for being such a lovely audience. Uh, we really don't have the time for it. You can always ask, uh, meet the speakers later on. Thank you so much. Thank you, speakers. It definitely was an eye-opening and an enlightening session. Now we have Sri J. Nandakumarji, a national convener, chief of Pregnya Prava, Indic thinker, author, and speaker to address the gathering. I request Professor Kanaga Sapapati ji to accompany him on stage. We are very sorry to inform that Mananiya Ranga Hari, a Rashtra Rishi, is no more. A father figure. to thousands of Karikattas, a genius, towering personality is no more. Let us stand in silence for a minute. Manani Anandakumarji is the convener of the nationalistic think tank Pragna Prava. He is a social worker who dedicated his life, entire life, 
for the nation building process a journalist former editor of the kesari the largest circulating publication in kerala sangha publication a well known author recently he published swa the struggle for national self food it explains as to how we need to develop the self food within us for the nation he is a known public intellectual he is connecting the intellectuals across bharat for the last 4 5 years he was one of those mentored by mananiya rangahari ji so emotionally we have all our feelings today but in spite of it he has agreed to speak to us before proceeding to ernakulam for the final for performing the final rites i request manani nandakumar ji to speak ಒಂದೆ ಗುರುಪತದ್ವಂದ್ವ ಅವಾಂಗ್ ಮನಸ್ಸ ಗೋಚರಂ ರಕ್ತಶುಕ್ಲ ಪ್ರಭಾ ಮಿಶ್ರಂ ಅದರ್ಕ್ಯಂ ತ್ರೈಪಿರಂ ಮಹತ್ ಓಂ ತತ್ಸತ್ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ರೆಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಕನಕ ಸಭಾಪತಿಜಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ ಡಿಗ್ನಿಟರೀಸ್ ಬ್ರದರ್ಸ್ ಸಿಸ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ಹೂ ಆರ್ ಅಸೆಂಬಲ್ಡ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಫಾರ್ ದಿಸ್ round lit first which was started recently <coughs> as it was uh, announced uh, by kanaka sabhapati ji <coughs> every well meaning hindu not only me is in a completely shattered mental state now of course ranga hari ji is uh, already completed 93 years it was not an unexpected death he was in hospital also uh, badly affected with the cancer and all <coughs> uh, but still you know we were all thinking that uh, that great personality will be with us forever such a great personality who gave line and light for hindu organizational movement all great things nowadays we are all thinking about we are all uh, in such a mood that we are the first person who were thinking about the hindu hindutva hindu movement and all as if we have founded and someone are claiming even we have given direction to dr hedigewar to start rss even and some new hindus are even claiming that they are giving tuition in day to day basis to mohan bhagwat and narendra modi how to be a true hindu we have to learn much about that great movement which has started 100 years back because of that great movement and that great mandhan hindu vichar mandhan which was started by dr hedigewar i have to say it bluntly that is uh, because today i want to say it i mean it you may be knowing the founder of rashtriya swayamsevak sangha the organization which i belong to and ranga hari ji belong to and kanaka sabhapati ji belong to that great founder dr hedigewa arvin he was addressed uh, by a person in a meeting related to independence struggle the question was like that it was in 1926 1926 97 years back 
there were no much hindus at that point of time who were proud about their hindu heritage hindu tradition and all that question was who is that fool who says this is hindu rashtra that person found that uh, he saw that dr edgar was also in that uh, uh, hall and in order to ridicule he asked what would have been our reaction if we were addressed we were uh, questioned like this i am quite sure many such persons will go out of that hall putting even their gamcha or that towel on their head aisa hi jana padega tha but dr hedgevar was such a personality he stood up from his chair went in front of that hall addressing all like a lion and roared i dr keshaval ram hedgevar says this is hindu rashtra and if you call such a person a fool i am that fool and i am proud of that foolishness such a great personality <laughs> ranga hari ji drew inspiration from him he started work in a place known as keral where in 1921 that great massacre took place hindu massacre took place he worked in malappuram he worked in calicut among all these adversary uh, adversaries we may be knowing we are all quite aware about all these facts that uh, islamic fundamentalist christian uh, conversion group and communist anti national group all these three dosha they are being called as three dosha vata pitta kapha if one person is one person is affected by one of this dosha we 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 are aware about what will be the his position if all these doshas got aggravated what would have been this put situation kerala situation is like that so there ranga hari ji started this work i i haven't got much time and totally i am internally i am disorganized also because of hearing that but we have to remember some things some some uh, issues related to those great personalities in 1984 85 that was the era of simi's emergence students islamic movement of india uh, actually it was uh, started and directed by some persons of kerala there they have started a campaign in kerala all over bharat there was a campaign in kerala uh, we found a poster all of a sudden some posters appeared intayuda mochanam islamilude the liberation of india through islam that was the poster suddenly lakhs and lakhs of posters appeared ranga hari ji immediately called a meeting in ernakulam of angsters like us we were all young pracharaks of rss at that time and he gave us a nara slogan the end of islam will be in india itself that was his nara <laughs> islam in the andiyam yes, someone may think that uh, uh, this is bit uh, aggressive one slogan islam in the andiyam india ilude india il thanne it will be in india that was his malayalam Uh, translation and everywhere it has been translated in uh, uh, local languages and that poster has been given and that counter campaign was a brain child of ranga hari ji just an example i'm saying we are not aware about such personalities who were actually the intellectual kshatriyas who made today's hindus mind so we have to think about that great personality today and uh, just can a professor has said that uh, needless to say that uh, it is a personal loss of mine also <coughs> right from the age of 11 for the last 47 years he was there to show me the road show me the way and everything all of a sudden i feel that uh, at the midday the sun was set such a condition is there so sorry i could not uh, talk much about 
the topic which has been given all of a sudden by Kanaka Sabhavadiji because uh, day before yesterday when he called, he told me that uh, there will be a discussion about Kerala's communist issue. So no preparation as such is necessary for me to talk about communism for two or three days. So today morning only he gave me the topic, you have to talk about uh, struggle for national selfhood. Okay, uh, such a, uh, that book was written by me. We have just uh, successfully concluded, finished our uh, Amrita Mahotsava. For the first time, Bharatiyas, Bharatiyas celebrated uh, in such a big way the anniversary of our independence. It's a 75th year anniversary. And before this celebration took place, two, three years back, uh, some of the workers generally who are thinking about the content of the celebration they all sat together and thought about how it must be celebrated. What must be its content? Naturally, the first and foremost thing uh, put before was we have to put before the society the true history of Bharat's independence struggle. Why it was thought out in that way? You are all aware about the fact we were all discussing for the last uh, one day and today also we were discussing about the situation of our uh, education, our history, what mainstream historians wrote about our Bharati, Bharat independence struggle. They are all thinking about in such a way that it was started recently after one political organization was founded in 1885 by a British personality. Then only independence struggle started. And someone are thinking in the way, and even in the history books it was written, that uh, 1857 was the starting point of our independence struggle. In such a way, our independence struggle history, history of Indian independence struggle is being portrayed in, a, in such a way. So the first and foremost thing we all thought about the celebration of Bharat's independence struggle was, put before the public the true history of Bharat's Swathinta Sangarsh. And also second, second thing was we have to think seriously about the uh, unknown heroes and heroines of our independence struggle. See, generally, if any history student was asked a question that uh, who all fought for our independence struggle? How many names they will give? Generally, they will give a family's pura name. Grandfather, father, daughter, daughter, son, and son, son. Even he also is a, a, a leader of Indian independence struggle. In such a way, a family's kitchen history is being uh, made and put before us that they fought for us independence struggle. They don't know about the great personality who actually, how many of the North Indians, not only North Indians, even Tamilians known about Wanji a year. How many uh, Tamilians even are knowing about Velu Nachiar's contribution in Indian independence struggle? How many are aware about Kuili? How many Kannadigas are knowing about uh, Rani Abbaka. There are lot of independent struggle leaders, but it is being portrayed in such a way that uh, some people or one family has fought for us. So this unknown, unsung heroes and heroines history is to be placed before the society as far as we could, we must uh, try for that. See, Swami Vivekananda, when he spoke about uh, the history of Bharat, he clearly analyzed <coughs> the situation and what we have to do to this history. I am talking about that book's background only. Samji uh, talked about it and it is being uh, published in his uh, 
लाइफ ऑफ स्वामी विवेकानंद बाई सिस्टर्न एंड वेस्टर्न डिसाइपल्स सेकेंड एडिशन कोलकाता द्वैत आश्रम इन दैट बुक इट इज प्रिंटेड ऑल्सो दैट पर्टिकुलर स्पीच आई वुड लाइक टू कॉट द हिस्टरीज ऑफ आवर कंट्री रिटर्न बाई इंग्लिश एंड अदर वेस्टर्न राइटर्स कैनोट बट बी वीकनिंग टू आवर माइंड फॉर दे टॉक ओनली ऑफ आवर डाउनफॉल they talk only of our downfall how can foreigners who understand very little of our manners and customs or religion and philosophy write faithful and unbiased histories of india naturally many false notions and wrong inferences have found their way to them our history was written by the rulers of that time there was a specific purpose of such history writing also and then in the last part of that speech swami vivekananda exhorted the young participants of that particular program he said he added now it is for us to strike out an independent path of historical research for ourselves to study the vedas and puranas and the ancient annals of india and from this make it our life sadhana to write accurate sympathetic and soul inspiring histories of the land again he added it is for the indians to be more precisely it is for it is for the true indians to write bharat's history it is needed unless and until our people our next generation will not know they they will not get the opportunity to learn about bharat's history in a true perspective why english people or the foreigners wrote this type of uh, history and gave it as us our test books shamelessly our rulers also allowed this history to continue what was the reason some 3 or 4 years back one great uh, novelist and story writer and storyteller booker prize winner ben okri visited bharat one special ecosystem wala vis invited him to jaipur i don't want to talk much about that particular ecosystem let let first they thought that uh, they may be i am not saying that they are quite ignorant about uh, uh, ben okri but i feel so that they were thinking that a black person got booker prize he must be invited to such a great illustrious lit first and he may uh, give some three four gali to pradhan mantri and rss hindutva and all they thought and invited him but in the first sentence itself he shattered their dreams he started the speech by saying that your panchatantra your mahabharata your ramayana gave me inspiration to write novels and kahani that was a starting point i don't know correctly but uh, some upashala charchas are saying that uh, none was there to give him uh, goodbye or uh, take him to delhi also just like the waters the old waters were taken to booths and uh, after that uh, they will be left there itself in that way benokri alone came by aisa discussion hai i am not quite sure about that but he came to delhi and addressed a press conference in delhi at that point of time an intelligent media person such persons are also there in media <laughs> he asked a question see mr ben your history that means nigeria africa that history and our history bharat history are almost the same we were all both were ruled by the foreigners and our histories were being history writing was being manipulated how do you think about that he repeated one of his off cotton quotation he repeated it was it goes like this i am quoting to poison a nation poison its stories to poison a nation poison its stories a demoralized the nation in between there is a small sentence also through this poisoned stories the nation will become demoralized and he say you are saying a demoralized the nation tells demoralized the stories to itself that's a dangerous situation dangerous situation you can see perfect parallel among our intellectuals in bharat also 
we are just saying that demoralized stories we talk, we uh, learned from those uh, foreigners we are repeating it to ourselves we are also saying that uh, uh, we are dravidas we are uh, aryans we came here we got controlled them this ari dravida stories and that poisoned stories are being re repeated by us in that same way benokri said a demoralized nation tells demoralized stories to itself beware of the storytellers so this type of lit first is for that such storytellers are to be taken to task that's our duty so benokri told that beware of the storytellers who are not fully conscious of the importance of their gifts and who are irresponsible in the application of their art they could unwittingly help along the psychic destruction of their people psychic destruction so we are also facing such a psychic destruction so those people who sat together to discuss about the content of the amrita mahotsava they thought about it is a apt occasion it's an opportune moment for us to put before the public the true history as far as we could we have to uh, talk about the unknown heroes and unknown heroines unsung heroes to be more precisely we have to talk about the great incidents who shape bharat's independence those things are to be put before them that was another aspect which we have discussed was actually were there no true bharatiyas who wrote true write history there were n number of historians jadunath sarkar rc majundar sardar k m panikkar if this professional historians will consider veera savarkar as a historian then veera savarkar great personalities are their historians were there but they were all sidelined or neglected you may be knowing about what happened to rc majundar he has been given the responsibility to write the history of indian independence struggle and after completing one chapter or one volume that committee was dismissed rc majundar has shown the doors by the great first prime minister of bharat and the first education minister uh, abul kalam azad abul kalam azad is being uh, explained as the most secular personality among the muslims these type of narratives have been placed before us who was he actually he was a uh, first of all he was a muslim league leader and then he came to know that the league is not proper for to make muslims uh, a, a, a totally uh, aggressive group so he joined the khilafat movement khilafat movement failed then he came to know that going back to muslim league is not that correct it will be more beneficiary beneficial for uh, muslims that he must work in congress so he went back to congress he was the person to he gave the slogan that time has come time has come oh muslims we have to be ready to make ourselves free such a personality they do know both these personalities called uh, rc majundar and analyzed the first chapter and uh, that committee was uh, dismissed and in that place one comrade turned bureaucrat turned historian was been given the responsibility to write the history of indian independence struggle comrade tarana tara uh, tarachand i do consider mr tarachand those history professors who are sitting here may uh, agree with me or not agree with me i am not i don't care also but my <laughs> inference about that particular personality he uh, is he was the first islamo leftist historian he was working in tehran as the ambassador there after working there for four or five years he was called back and he has given the responsibility to write the freedom struggles history and what he has done what already james mill has done already the british historians have made he just changed the color of the book in some places full stop has been trans changed to comma semicolon has been changed to colon that's all 
that history is being we are repeating that particular history what happened to jadunath sarkar jadunath sarkar wrote clear history of our medieval this division itself is not that correct ancient history medieval history and modern history the uh, uh, pattern of the western countries there were in their country uh, an ancient history was there that was dark age for them some medieval history was there that was an era of synthesis for them and a modern history and history of enlightenment an era of enlightenment that is true for them christian countries they, it is true but it is not true for us our ancient history what is the ancient history of bharat veda purana upanishads our scientific achievements so that period whether it was a dark age but james mill has written it in that way james mill wrote the history of british india and he claimed that i am writing it quite objectively what is his objective history writing critical analysis and all those things and his capacity and his qualification to write it he himself wrote in the introduction that his capacity to write such a history i i would like to quote the book begins with a preface in which mill tries to make a virtue of having never visited india and of knowing none of its native languages that was his qualification and he divided bharat history into three to him there are guarantees of his objectivity and he boldly claims so and such history is being repeated by this uh, leftist and uh, uh, islamist historians jadunath sarkar wrote about the uh, mughal era especially Aur on aurangzeb nowadays we are being taught that aurangzeb was the greatest secular king of bharat has been taught why aurangzeb's mughal dynasty was started not because of the hindu resistance only because of the revenue crunch revenue crunch happened during that time otherwise it would not have been that is the way in which they were they have put but that book and those great volumes written by jadunath sarkar created a uh, much attraction towards such a history writing and everything but at that time point of time congress leader father of our first uh, prime minister mr motilal nehru invited one of his closest friends from uh, a foreign university who was who was in england mr mohammad habib second name aap sabhi ko malum hai you all know about that yes his uppa in tamil tamil also uppa karte hai <laughs> abba aur uppa irfan habib's father mohammad habib was called and give gave the responsibility to teach history first of all to the nehru family he became the tutor of his son that is why the history is being written in that way and uh, mohammed abib was called and he became the authority of all history writing and everything so there were i i don't want to explain much there were historians true bharatiya historians but they were all neglected sidelined or blackened so that is why we have to bust some myths you have to bust some myths but first of all islamic invasion of india was a myth that myth is to be busted they this mohammed abib sister and irfan abib sister taught us in this way that islam or muslim never attacked the bharat they were invited by your own people especially the backward community people they were being sub suffering for several years suppressed by the brahmanical hegemonic what all what all nonsense is are there they are being suppressed so the poor harijans and backward community people invited islamic kings to invade bharat and give us light islam is light and islam is peace islam is peace also both these things so gave us peace and light so please come muslim invaders were not motivated by islam in their conquest of india that's another myth not motivated and i will just give some points only third forcible conversions of hindus were a bigger myth no forcible conversions took place 
I am not just saying something, I am not exaggerating anything. You please go through the official uh, history books. Still in use, I must say, still in use. And another thing, millions of low caste Hindus voluntarily, joyfully accepted the universal brotherhood of Islam. What is universal brotherhood? Dr. Ambedkar has said the brotherhood among them. That's all. There is, that is a co cooperation of, cooperative of them. But the history is saying that universal brotherhood of Islam to escape Brahmanical oppression. That's why it happened. Islam was a liberating force which for the first time introduced the true social equality in India as a result of which lakhs of Hindus voluntarily helped build magnificent mosques and palaces for Muslim sultans. Maybe because of that, the great intellectuals of Kerala and Bharat are inviting Hamas leader to address their meeting. That is why they are saying, they are forgetting, forgetting October 7 and talking about October 8 and onwards. What happened on October 7, everything you know. They are trying to say that Hamas is a, Hamas is a, uh, of soldiers. They are soldiers, they are warriors, they are fighters. I don't know how Tamil paper are uh, uh, writing about that. In Kerala, almost every paper, newspaper, es expect, except one paper, which was run by Dr. Edgar's party, RSS Janma Bhumi, rest, all papers are giving this type of explanation. And Aurangzeb's vast empire of Islamic bigotry imploded due to a revenue crisis and not because of his industrial scale oppression of Hindus. Another myth, civilizational duty of Britishers, education, industry, development, nation concept, everything was given by them. Actually, the independence struggle was also a contribution of Britishers. That is the way in which it is being said. What is this nation, Bharat? Where was your India? One of the great uh, intellectuals, uh, uh, her name can also be mentioned, Sagariga Ghosh made a tweet. Where was your India before British came here? It was only a landmass in between Burma and Afghanistan. It was only a landmass in between Burma and Afghanistan. One of our social media activists have given a um, befitting reply to that. Yes, madam, you are correct. That's why when they came here, Britishers came here, they started a company also. British East Landmass in between Burma and Afghanistan Company. They have given, started such a company also. So this is the way in which they are giving us coaching and training and tuitions about Bharat's history. And regarding independence struggle also, they are saying actually the national concept, nation state concept has been given by Britishers. In that way, a single stream, political stream, politically motivated struggle, that was the Indian independence struggle. There was no other phase for Indian independence struggle, Bharat's freedom struggle. The very nation concept was a colonial construct. These are the myths which are before us. There are so many other points also. So we have to address these issues. First of all, when, when was the start, what was the starting point of Bharat's independence struggle? Whether it was started in 1885 after Macaulay started, I, I mean A.O. Hume started international contest, or whether it was started on the fine morning of 1857 shooting, whether it was correct or not. Okay, uh, our own people also say that 1857 first war of independence. It became that, uh, what is imprinted into our mind and intellect and chiti even. Involuntary we used to say 1857 the first war of independence. It is to be analyzed. And what was the real inspiration for them to come here? Was it an unharmful uh, trade inspiration to do business here? Doing business is good for us also. Give and take. We will get something and you will get something. So trade is not that problematic. So we are also saying the very same thing. Britishers came here for business. Uh, Dutch came here for business. Portugal came here for business. Was it so? Is it a correct thing? Then we have to think about what was the re reason behind the great Tordicellus summit which was called by Marpapa 
why Portugal and France was called, the great leaders, Catholic leaders of kings were called and divided the whole earth into two and the eastern hemisphere has been given to Portugal and the western hemisphere has been given to France. What is the purpose? Why they took missionaries with them when they came here? When Vasco da Gama landed at Kapad Kadapuram, Kapad beach of Calicut, he has got enough number of missionaries with him. He has got enough number of cross with him. He has got enough number of Bible with him. How many of you are going to the market to purchase bindi uh, or uh, uh, banana or even machili? Purchase, when we are going to market, we are taking our purohita also with us to select good bindi. We have to take the temple uh, purohita with us. Will we? The why he, they took the missionaries with them? Was it the very, very simple, innocent trade re relative purpose was that? We have to think about it. And of course, compare the economic, educational, cultural, social and gender condition here. At that point of time when they came here, what was their condition and what was our condition? Gender condition, may I have purposefully included that. What was the condition of women in England, France and Dutch at that point of time when they came here? They attacked us. They were saying that women were given freedom, equality by them. It was their contribution. Is it a fact? What was the condition? They were discussing whether women is a human being or not. That was the condition there. In the churches and the seminaries, the main discussion was, sorry, uh, um, sisters and mothers who are sitting here, they were discussing whether women is a human being. Then the church went on to say whether they can give equal position with the men. Then comes whether they have got atma, soul. That was the discussion going on there. And uh, many of the uh, their missionary leaders directed, suggested that uh, no, they, they haven't got Atma because they, uh, women gave uh, 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 inspiration for the men to do Papa. So they, have a, they must not have uh, Atma. Then someone put a point before them, point of order. Right? See, Jesus Christ's mother was also a woman. Okay, then let, let them have half Atma, 50% Atma. That was the condition there. What, what was our condition? See, in the beginning of the 16th century, when Portugal came and attacked, attacked Ullal, who resisted? Who saved Ullal and Manglar, Mangalur? Rani Abbaka. Abbaka formed a women's army, led men's army, and fought against them. How many times Abbaka defeated Portugal? After 150, 175 years, in our Tamil Nadu, uh, what was that particular area? Shiva? Shiva Ganga district. Velu Nachyar. She was fighting. She was fighting against British. All these aspects are to be discussed. Then, what was the nature of their rule? It was multifaceted. What was our response? Whether it was multifaceted or not. Whether whole society was participated in our independence struggle. Whether women have participated, whether farmers have participated, whether tribals were participated, whether peasants participated. You have to discuss about this. And at la last but not the least, the greatest question, that is, what was the real inspiration of our independence struggle? Whether it was political alone. For that, I, will, I would like to quote Marshi Arabindo and I will... Uh, put a full stop there. Actually, the inspiration of our independence struggle was swa or selfhood of this nation. Bharat selfhood. If politics was the sole purpose of Indian independence struggle, political freedom alone, why Tantia Tope fought after Jansi Rani fought, fell? Rao Sahib died. Nana Sahib was in, taken to Nepal. Tandya Tope continued the struggle. Why? What was the reason? If it was for political power, which was the, which was the state or area ruled by Tandya Tope, Tandya Tope continued it. So, taking all into consideration, Arabindo 
defined our independence struggle in a very proper manner, I will quote. It has been printed as a small book, Awakening Soul of India by Aurobindo, in which he has clearly defined it. I am quoting. The task we set before ourselves is not mechanical, but moral and spiritual. Our independence struggle, task means independence struggle. It is not a mechanical or political alone purpose. It is a spiritual and moral war. We aim not at the alteration of a form of government, but at the building up of a nation. We are not planning to change the form of a government. It was not political alone. We have to create the Rashtra as a whole. Of that task, politics is a part, but only a part. Only a part. We shall devote ourselves not to politics alone, questions alone, not to theology or philosophy or literature or science by themselves, but we include all these in one entity which we believe to be all important, the dharma, the dharma, the national religion. I was just hearing Rakhoji was talking about that religion. That was the inspiration. Dharma, the national religion, which we also believe to be universal. It is universal also. When we are talking about our religion, our Sanatana Dharma, it is not at all. Yes, we have to fight it, fight for the freedom and fight for the uh, liberation of our people. And we have to march ahead with that prayer and inspiration. That's clear. But it is universal also. Arabindo was saying, there is a mighty law of life, a great principle of human evolution, a body of spiritual knowledge and experience of which India has always been destined to be guardian, exemplar and missionary. This is the Sanatana Dharma, the eternal religion. This is the Sanatana Dharma. Arabindo never means these words. Because, why? He don't want to fight the next election. So he, it is not necessary for him to be politically correct. It is a politically incorrect statement. He said that it is Sanatana Dharma and nothing else. Under the stress of alien impacts, she has largely lost whole lot of the structure of that Dharma, but of its living reality. For the religion of India is nothing if it is not lived. It has to be applied not only to life, but to the whole of life. Its spirit has to enter into and mold our society. Our politics, our literature, our science, our individual character, affections and aspirations. And see how clearly he has defined our Satantata Sangra, our Satyanta Sangra. This Swa or Sanatana Dharma or you can call Hindutva, it must enter into politics, industry, Education, agriculture, everywhere it must be there. Swatantra, what is the meaning of Swatantra? When we are able to uh, uh, articulate, make, construct our own tantra, our own methodology, on the basis of the swa, swa is the prefix of that particular word. On the basis of swa, when we are able to do our tantra, then only we can say we are Swatantra. Otherwise we are only tantra. That is why Mohan Bhagavad used to say, Swadhin Tase Swatantrata Ke Or Jo Prayan Iska Pachatar Sal Pura Ho Gya Hai. Swadhin Tase Swatantrata Ke Or. We got uh, uh, power or we have got the right to select or elect our own rulers. That's all. Still we are not able to promulgate, we are not able to apply this, our Swatwa, our selfhood in education, in, in our industry, our science, everywhere it is to be applied, that application is necessary. That's why on the basis of the discussion which we have started, uh, what must be the content of the uh, Amrita Mahotsava, uh, I have been given a task to write a small guidebook for our workers on this basis. Small guidebook, a, a structure. 120, 135 pages, one small book was written. And uh, while I gave it to 
Pujaniya Mohan Bhagavad. He asked me, whenever you get time, make it bit more elaborate. So three, four months, I tried bit more with the help of all great, uh, our uh, uh, fellow travelers, our karikartas, and our uh, persons, great teachers like Ranga Hariji and all, I elaborated it, enhanced it, and uh, near about 400 pages, uh, uh, one book in the name, Swa, the struggle for national selfhood, present, past, past, present, future. So what was the independent struggle? What was the real inspiration? And uh, how it was a multifaceted affair, affair how we fought in the education field, how we fought in the industrial field, everywhere our, our leaders fought the independence struggle, the, all those things, all those factors are to be taken, are considered to be independence struggle. And as far as the future is concerned, if we want to make our nation a, a Param Vaibhava Rashtra, totally developed nation, we have to apply that swa, just like swa. Maharishi Aurobindo has given that direction. We have to apply this Swatva in each and every facets of our life. That is necessary. I would like to uh, conclude uh, to add a small point further to that uh, swa, swa point and Bharat's concept, which was the true inspiration of the independence struggle. I'll give you four examples. Four examples, and I am not going to explain about that. Actually, the Bhakti movement, the Hindu Bhakti movement, was the trigger point of our independence struggle. That was a starting point. That was starting point. The great Bhakti saints who wrote the Kavitas, Bhakti, Kirtanas, about the otherworldly affairs, moksha and all, but they gave equal importance for Bharat's Mukti also. Many great uh, researchers are also sitting here, especially working in the literary field, especially what working about our history part. They must give some time for do some thorough research on this uh, aspect also. I'm, I'm not a researcher. I'm a layman. I'm an uh, organizational uh, person. But you people can take it for, further forwards. Four examples from four parts of Bharat. One is East. That is Gujarat. Person's name is Narsi Mehta. Narsi Mehta, you all are Vaishnava Janato Tene Karhiye Jeped Parai Janere. That's Kirtans were all his contribution. He wrote about that also. But along with that, he wrote about Bharat. I would like to quote four lines Bharat Ghanda Bhutalama Janani Govinda Koguna Gayore. Dhan dhan teni mata pitare, dhan dhan teni bayore, govinda ko guna gayore. What is the purpose of saying about Bharata Ghanda in this Kirtana? He was very much aware about the fact that the foreigners, invaders are coming inside. If you want to get mukti, do penance, kutapasya, dharmic activities, this land, Bharata Ghanda is the one and only one land where you can your, do your spiritual penance. Otherwise not. So it is to be saved. That was Narsi Mehta's uh, direction for the people. He might have given a WhatsApp message to uh, Shankar Dev of Assam. He say Assam jai. He must have. I think otherwise this type of one translation type sloka will would not have emerged. Shankar Dev and Madhav Dev wrote about uh, bhakti, but along with that they gave much importance to this Bharata. See. In Asamya, both these persons are of the 1400s. One Narsi Mehta, 1414, and Shankar Deva, 1449. Matho Deva also. Dhanya Dhanya Kalikala, Dhanya Naratanu Bala, Dhanya Dhanya Janama Bharata Barishe. I am again asking, Sagariya Ghosh was teaching us that the Bharat concept was a den, was a contribution of Britain. But in 1400, Shankar Dev wrote, Dhanya Dhanya Kalikala, Dhanya Naratanu Bala, Dhanya Dhanya Janama Bharata Barishe, Tapajaba Yagya Teji, Tamar Charana Bhaji, Tuvunam Khubishu Harishe. Meaning is exact ditto. Both were living at the same time. 
बोथ वर राइटिंग द वेरी गाना संगीता और कविता ऑफ भारत दोनों मिलकर व्हाट्सअप भेजा है क्या पता नहीं मेरे केरल का पूंदानम भी लिखा है साउथ के दोनों मिलकर भेजा है इसलिए उन्होंने दो बार भारत के बारे में लिखा है वट वॉज इट भारत माय अखंड मोड़ीला तमिल पीपल कैन अंडरस्टैंड इट करेक्टली भारत माय अखंड मोड़ीला वट नरसी मेहता रोट भारत खंड भूतल मा जननी पुंदानम राइटिंग भारत माय खंड मोड़ीला पारी लंगु मेलु तल्ल निर्णयम अत्र मुख्य मायुल्लो रु भारतम मे बी इट इज फॉर शंकर देवा अत्र मुख्य मायु द सेकंड टाइम भारत इ प्रदेश में नल्लारु मोरकनम all these great bhakti saints trying to uh, create a, an atmosphere of nationality among their devotees through them the whole bharat that was their purpose ye teenon se prerna lekar hai kya pata nahi gurunanak dev at that time he is more is bit more fundamental than these three because they were using only bharata gurunanak dev was using hindustana Hindu, Sachki Vani Ave Nanak Sach Sunayasi Sachki Bela Kaya Kapte Tuk Tuk Hosi Hindustan Samalasi Bola Hindustan Samalasi Bola. What was the purpose of writing these type of thing? That's why Arvindo said. That's why Lokmanya Tilak said. That's why the great leaders of our land, our Bharat, who contributed for the emancipation of the humanity, said. that the real inspiration behind the indian independence struggle was the swa part or selfhood of this nation so if you want to make this nation more glorious to make loka guru vishwa guru again we have to go in that direction on the basis of swa selfhood that is the need of the hour namaskar vande matra Thank you, sir. I request Kanaga Sabha Pati, sir, to felicitate. Let us take a quick continental coffee break and be back in fifteen minutes.
Every third of the Indian wanted to go back to Europe to make the number. What is
I kindly request everyone to be seated. Next up, we have Manoshi Sinha in conversation with Dr. Ankita Dutta, a researcher, writer, a columnist on Northeast Bharat, speaking on the topic, Look Northeast. We welcome you on stage. Vande Mataram, Namaskaram. Uh, this is for the first time, I suppose, that a whole panel is dedicated for the Northeast in a lit fest. And uh, I would like to offer my gratitude to Jagannathanji, uh, founder of Varanda Club, for conceiving about this idea and giving us a platform to present our views. Thank you so much once again. So when we uh, speak about the Northeast, the very term Northeast, what uh, uh, I'll ask from the audience, just two or three words or phrases that pops up in your mind when you hear or when you listen the term Northeast. Yeah, we, we are getting a lot of positive response from here. Yeah. Thank you so much. We are getting a lot of positive response from here. But uh, I, am a, I am from the Northeast. She is also from the Northeast. I am a Vishnupriya Manipuri Hindu from Manipur, a victim of exodus from Manipur in the 18th century. My ancestors, they had to flee from Manipur due to Burmese aggressions and they settled in Assam. So all around Manipur, bordering Manipur, you will come across so many Manipuris. They are all victims of exodus due to Burmese aggressions in the 18th and 19th centuries. So even I can call myself a victim of exodus. <laughs> and uh, uh, I came to Delhi in the year 2001. And from 2002, I started working there as an editor. So my experience was not that good initially. Uh, I, because of my features, I was asked, are you from India? Then I said, no, I am from Assam. Where is this Assam? So uh, there is lack of uh, geographical knowledge amongst a uh, few of the people I knew then. And then once, uh, it was some 15 years ago, I was termed Chinese Chinese because of my looks. So I had a very bad experience about what Northeast is all about. So uh, there are so many misinterpretations and misconceptions pertaining to the Northeast. And people have, uh, in general, people have very less knowledge about what the Northeast is all about, what the history city is all about. So I would like to ask uh, Dr. Ankita Datta, she has done ground research in each and every corner of the Northeast for the last 10 plus years. So what is the reason of this uh, misconception, this misinterpretation pertaining to the Northeast? Namaskar. 
uh, first of all, my humble pranams to one and all on and off the stage. Uh, I would like to share whatever little I know on this topic, uh, and I look forward to us interacting more uh, to the queries that you might be having uh, in the end, towards the end of the panel. Uh, and uh, But before that, I would like to congratulate the entire organizing team, uh, Varanda Club, for hosting such a lovely event and having us all together on this same platform. Thank you so much. It's a privilege and honor to be here amongst some of the best minds of the country. So when we are talking about the Northeast and sp specifically in response to uh, Manushi ji's question, about the misrepresentation and misinterpretation of the Northeast that we see, uh, that we, see uh, we, we keep on hearing. There are several reasons uh, for the state of affairs. I will dissect, let me try to dissect them one by one. First of all, the continuous neglect uh, of the region towards its development by the successive governments after independence, post-1947, is obviously one of the major factors behind this uh, situation. And this has led to some very serious and grave consequences, not just for the northeastern region as a whole, but also, I would say, from the larger perspective of uh, Bharat's national security. There has been the uprise of popular discontent amongst the people of this region, which has led to the emergence of several armed insurgencies in one state after the other, instigated by many non-state actors. So this has created the image of a volatile Northeast, a volatile Northeastern frontier in the minds of uh, the people from, uh, from other parts of Bharat. Also, the tacit support that was being provided to the religious conversion activities of the Christian missionaries by the central government post-1947. So this brought about a situation where I would say large-scale conversions had completely altered the religious demographic profile of several states across the region over a period of time. And uh, this has led to some very serious and major problems uh, on the ground. A region that was largely peaceful, the Northeast, where there was continuous resistance against cultural colonization. First, uh, of uh, first against Islamic imperialism and later against British imperialism had now fallen prey to the devious designs of the Christian missionaries after 1947. So the result has been uh, the disappearance of so many indigenous cultures and native traditions, people's traditional religious belief systems which have declined. We, we all see it, uh, when, when we visit uh, the, especially the Christian dominated states of Nagaland, Meghalaya, Mizoram, we, we see a church after every two, three kilometers. Hindus cannot cremate in the state of Mizoram. They have to take the permission of the church. So, yes. So, uh, this has been the result. The disappearance of so many native cultures and indigenous traditions from these states and uh, the appearance of a society, I would say, which sees the Indian state as its arch enemy, uh, inspired by a Western culture, inspired by an alien worldview, which has provided a legitimation to all these religious proselytization activities over a period of time. Uh, also, I would like to make another point here, the way the Northeast has been projected in the Indian media. So, th the region, projection of the region as an assembly of armed nationalities, as an assembly of armed nations. So, the different armed insurgencies that have adversely impacted the different states of this region uh, 
at different periods of time in history and the way the Indian state has dealt with the situation has been decried uh, by many in the leftist media houses and as well as the Marxist intelligentsia as discrimination against the tribal communities, as oppression against the tribal communities by the Indian state. This is not the true picture and the, the result of this has been in the name of correcting this discrimination of the tribals, in the name of rectifying this oppression of the tribal communities in the Northeast, the result has been a large scale interference of outside forces, of external elements in the internal affairs of this region through various tactics, such as by uh, providing scholarships through NGOs, through uh, universities, to create, to establish this fake narrative of cultural oppression, of uh, uh, discrimination against the tribals by the Indian state, uh, and which has uh, been uh, done by the intellectual sepoys of the Western academia. But nobody is talking about the cultural genocide that these societies have gone through. The genocide that the Hindus of the Northeast have faced. Those Hindus who were kicked out of Mizoram during the MNF-led insurgency, the Ryangs and the Chakmas, the Hajongs, they are still living as refugees in their own country. Their names were being deleted from the voters' lists after they were thrown out of the state just because they refused to convert. And I, I, I recently had the opportunity of visiting one of these camps where uh, the, the young refugee children in the name of protein, they are given only one egg per week. They, they eat rice with water dal. So this has been the situation. So nobody is talking about the cultural genocide that the Northeast has gone through, the Hindus in particular, and the influence of a Western culture upon these societies has completely change the notion, the sense of identity uh, of these people, especially the youth. So uh, the, the youth, the young population, which goes out of these uh, states to other parts of the country for employment purposes, for education purposes, they project themselves as a highly westernized version of themselves among the host society because they have lost their native cultures. They do not have that sense of identity of who they are, who their ancestors were. So this has been, I would say, one of the major reasons which has led to the construction of several negative stereotypes about the people of this region, about their food habits, about their uh, dress, their culture, everything. And this has led to further alienation from the uh, alienation of the people of the Northeast from the so-called mainstream India, mainland India, and which has helped feed into the separatist ideologies, the separatist tendencies. So the breakage of this cultural link uh, between the Northeast and the rest of Bharat, uh, which has further strengthened the narrative of the Northeast as never being a part of Bharat, is something which we need to think about and rectify. Uh, as Hindus, as, as Sanatanis. I think Manushiji can take over from here. So she has the referred, Dr. Krantaji has the referred about the dying uh, communities in the Northeast. So there are around 7,000 languages in the world, out of which 780 is in India. Out of 780 languages, around 220 languages have gone extinct during the last 50 years. And I am a Vishnupriya Manipuri Hindu, my language is dying too. So it has been predict predicted that in, and by the end of the century, by the end of the 21st century, even my Vishnupriya Manipuri language will go extinct. So uh, let me uh, give a brief uh, account about my lineage. I am a Vishnupriya Manipuri Hindu. My Kula Deveta is Apokpa. He is also called as, uh, he is also known as Kumal. He is the sixth in lineage from Arjuna and Chitrangada. Chitrangada was a Gandharva princess from uh, Manipur. 
and Arjuna was a Kuru prince, all of us know. So we have this uh, connection with the Mahabharata. And uh, Chitrangada and uh, Arjuna's son was Babrubahana. He married uh, Sabitri. Their son was Dattamani. Dattamani married Jutheswari. Their son was Atiyaguru. Atiyaguru married Sabire Panthoibi. Panthoibi is considered as an uh, ancestral deity, mother goddess, amongst the Meiti Manipuri community. There are two uh, sections of Manipuris, the Vishnupriya Manipuri and the Meite Manipuri. The Meite Manipuri are in majority and the Vishnupriya Manipuris are in minority. Uh, currently, there are around 2 lakh Vishnupriya Manipuris in uh, Manipur, but according to the census reports, in 2011 census reports, only 64 uh, Vishnupriya Manipuris could speak their own language. The Meite is their language. And then, as I mentioned earlier, in the 19th, 18th and 19th centuries, most of the Vishnupriya Manipuris, including, including the Methi Manipuris, they had to face exodus due to several uh, Burmese aggressions and they settled all around Manipur. So even Bangladesh, which is very near to Manipur, Bangladesh is a, has a considerable population of Methi and Vishnupriya Manipuris. So we have this 21st Chief Justice of Bangladesh, uh, Surendra Kumar Sinha. He had to resign due to some controversy that arised uh, due to some amendment. And uh, even those uh, Vishnupriya Manipuris who are staying outside Manipur, uh, their lingua franca, uh, franca is the state language of that particular uh, place where they are staying. For example, we are staying in Assam. So our mother tongue at home, because uh, uh, we stay in Assam, we speak Assamese. And our parents, they speak Manipuri, Vishnupriya Manipuri. We know our language, but uh, uh, regularly we speak Assamese. So this language is dying. So uh, though there are around 4.5 lakh Vishnupriya Manipuri Hindus all across India, out of which only a few percentage they speak their mother tongue, that is Vishnupriya Manipuri. Uh, so going back to the lineage, going to back to my lineage, so uh, Dattamani, Arjuna's uh, son was uh, Babrubahana, Babrubahana's son was Dattamani, Dattamani's son was Atiyaguru, Atiyaguru married Panthoibi, and theirs, they have, uh, Atiyaguru had six sons. The eldest was Sanamahi. So you have heard about the Sanamahism in Manipur, that's a, they, uh, in Manipur, Sanamahism is considered a separate religion. Actually, Sanamahism is, uh, comprises of a pantheon of ancestral deities, all the des descendants of Arjuna and Chitrangada. So, Sanamahi is uh, considered as a household deity in Manipur. And uh, Sanamahi's brothers, that is Atiyaguru's other sons were Mangang, Luang, Angong, then uh, Konthak Konsil. So we have, we have, you have heard all of this place. You have heard about Moirang. Actually, Moirang was the son of Atiyaguru. He was the brother of uh, Sanamahi. And the youngest was Pakhamba. So Pakhamba is also considered an ancestral deity amongst the Methe Manipuris. Pakhamba's son was Apokpa. He is also called Kumal, who we worship, we the Vishnupriya Manipuris worship as one of our oldest ancestors because he started the Kumal dynasty of Manipur. So all of these brothers that started different dynasties, all descendants of Chitrangada and Arjuna. And uh, Sanamahi is also called by different names, Atiya Siddhabba, Atiya Guru, uh, then Pakhamba is also known as Ashiba, and then, uh, so all of these five, dynasties have different uh, uh, histories. So the Kumal dynasty is described in detail in the Kumal Purana. So there are other several, several other historical records like uh, Chaitaral Kumbaba, I will not mention all the names <laughs> because the names. <laughs> uh, so there has been a misconception that uh, Hinduism has been imposed on the Manipuris in the 18th century during the time of Pamheba, that is, he is popularly known as Garib Nawaj. Why the name Garib Nawaj? Because uh, he was a very secular 
uh, king, uh, the Mus he was uh, very benevolent towards the Muslims as well. So this title was given by the Muslims. So even we have uh, Raja Prithu of Assam, who in 1206 uh, CE, he defeated Bhaktiar Khilji. So we all know about who Khilji, Bhaktiar Khilji is. We have read in detail about him. He was the destroyer of uh, most of our ancient universities. But we have not never read about Prithu, who defeated him in battle. And he, he was so badly wounded in this battle, fighting against Prithu, that he was bedridden for several months and then he was assassinated by his own men, Khilji. So even uh, Raja Prithu, he was so benevolent that he allowed the Muslim prisoners of war to settle in his kingdom in Assam. That's how the Muslim settlement began in Assam. So going back to Apokpa. So when we worship Apokpa, we uh, offer uh, the food we, that we offer. During Strad ceremony, we all worship our ancestors in all other parts of the country. We also worship our ancestors during Mahalaya, the Strad Mahalaya. We also invoke Apokpa. We worship all our ancestors. And uh, uh, around 108 varieties of uh, uh, ingredients are used to, to prepare the food to offer to the deities, the ancestral deities. So Sana Mahism is not a different religion. It is all about worshiping of ancestral deities. There is a story about uh, why all of these different dynasties cropped up after Sanamahi. Sanamahi's father, that is Atiya Guru, had uh, six sons. So he wanted, to, he wanted one of his sons to become the king of Manipur. So there is a resemblance of uh, this story with the Shiva Purana, the story of Kartikeya and Ganesha. So we all know about uh, Ganesha circumambulating around uh, Shiva and Parvati. So there are two stories pertaining to this. According to the Shiva Purana, when Ganesha and uh, Kartikeya grew of marriageable age, Shiva and Parvati wanted one of them to get married. So uh, both of them wanted to get married. So it, Parvati said, Ki one who circumambulates uh, ambulates the world and comes back first, he will get married. So what Ganesha does, because his Vahana is the mouse, Kartikeya's Vahana is the peacock, so he immediately he sets off Kartikeya. And Ganesha, what he did, he made both his parents sit, he worshipped them, and he circumambulated his parents. Then Shiva, he, he felt very glad, both Shiva and Parvati, they got him married. So by the time Kartikeya, Kartikeya came back, Ganesha already had children. So he got enraged, and there is a st according to the Shiva Purana, the, in the Kailasha mountains, he uh, came to the base of the Kailasha mountains, and he, uh, near the Mansarovar lake, he settled there. And Shiva and Parvati again shifted their base from the top of Kailasha to the base of the Mansarovar, because so that Parvati could catch a glimpse of his son every day. So according to another version of the Puranas, Narada gave a fruit. And uh, that's a fruit of knowledge, a mango, to Shiva. Shiva gave the fruit to Parvati. Parvati wanted to give that fruit to one of his sons. So Shiva and Parvati decided that one of them who would circumambulate the world and come back first would get the fruit. And then the same thing happens. Uh, Kartikeya immediately sets off, and uh, uh, Ganesha circumambulates uh, his parents and then he gets the fruit. The, and that's how he's called uh, the wisest of all the gods and goddesses. The fruit of wisdom he consumed. So there is a similar story in the Kumal Purana as well. So Atiya Guru wanted to give his kingdom to one of his sons. So all of his uh, uh, eldest five sons, they set off to circumambulate the world. Pantap Kamsil, the youngest, he stayed back. He circumambulated his father seven times. Then his father got very elated and he made Pantap Kamsil the king of Manipur. Pantap Kamsil, and he gave him a new name, that is Pakhamba, because he was very wise. 
and that's how uh, Pakamba became the king of Manipur amongst all the six brothers. The son of Mahi was the first to return. He was very enraged when he saw, when he saw his uh, youngest brother sitting in the throne of Manipur. Then when he objected, Atiya Guru gave, Atiya Guru, he blessed him that you are the king of every household in Manipur. So you will, from today onwards, you will be worshipped in every household of Manipur. So that's, from, since that day, Sanamahi has been worshipped in every household of Manipur and the legacy continues to this day. So I will not go into the details of, uh, because uh, they are, uh, the complete lineage is described in the Kumal Purana, the Moirang Purana, Chaitaral Kumbabba, and several more books. So we have come up with a book on Manipur. There are three authors, uh, uh, Dr. Ankita Datta, myself, and Vladimir Adityanath. So there are three sections in the book. It is from the pre-Mahavarada times to the present turmoil. And uh, the first section deals with uh, the timeline from the pre-Mahavarada times to the last king of Manipur, which I shall be uh, dealing with. And the rest of the two sections will be dealt with in detail by Dr. Ankita Datta and Vladimir Adityanath. I would like to ask Ankita Datta to please give uh, some details about the other two sections and also about the existential crisis of Manipur. Because we all have heard about what is happening in Manipur since, quite, uh, since the last several months. So please, because she has worked on ground, so she will be able to give a better idea of what is happening on ground in Manipur, especially the existential crisis. Thank you, Manushi ji, for uh, introducing to the audience about our book. It's titled The Manipur Conundrum, History, Exodus, Conversion. So uh, we, three of us, have collaborated this time together, uh, Manushi Sinhaji, myself, and uh, Vladimir Adityanath, who, uh, with whom I have been working since a long time now. And uh, she has already described her portion of the book. Uh, I am looking into the period, uh, so there are three sections in the book. Firstly, the historical and civilizational perspective of Manipur, which she is handling. Uh, then the period after 1947, uh, where, uh, which is my section basically. It's, so here I am uh, writing about the insurgency in Manipur. Not just Manipur, I have covered the insurgency in the entire Northeast briefly because uh, it is not possible to disentangle uh, one insurgency from the other because it all started with the Naga insurgency, the creation of the separate Christian state of Nagaland and how it all began. Uh, uh, in the different states, in the other states. The communist influence behind every insurgency uh, in the Northeast, uh, with special reference to Manipur, the drug problem, uh, which started after independence, and simultaneously the, the, the Christian conversions and the tacit support, as I already mentioned, that was being provided by uh, the central government um, uh, after 1947 and how uh, conversions increased at a rapid pace. And uh, also I have included the stories of uh, those communities uh, in the book which, uh, who have resisted conversions in brief. Uh, so in Meghalaya, the Hindu Jaintias, in Arunachal, the Noktes and the Wanchos. So like that I have briefly taken up and uh, the problem of illegal immigration which is affecting not just Manipur but in fact the entire Northeast and this illegal immigration is happening not just from Bangladesh but as well as from other countries since the Manipur crisis has brought to light. And uh, uh, Vladimir ji is uh, looking into the ground reports uh, related to the, the current conflict. Mm, that started in Manipur on the 3rd of May. We are also looking into the issue of the separate, the demand for the separate state of a Zalengam, Kuki Zalengam, uh, by, uh, uh, by encompassing all the areas of Assam, uh, Arunachal, some areas of Arunachal Pradesh, some areas of Tripura, the entire Manipur and Mizoram into the Kuki Zalengam. So we have also taken up that in our book. Uh, and uh, coming to the Manipur crisis uh, 
uh, uh, Manushi ji's specific question. Whatever is happening in Manipur today, the current crisis in Manipur, all I can say is that it is an ominous sign of the things that are going to happen to us, that are going to befall upon us Hindus in the near future if we do not awaken, if we do not wake up now. The, the entire concept of the Arya Dravid divide uh, that many speakers have already brought to light and spoken about it. Uh, it's, we, we know that it is a dangerous propaganda that has been uh, manufactured by the church but unfortunately to which a large section of the Hindu society has already fallen prey to. But in the Northeast, in Manipur and the Northeast, uh, the most convenient and chosen weapon of the church is ethnic divide. So uh, ultimately the goals, the goals are similar everywhere, whether it is in Manipur or in any other state of the Northeast or just in any other state of Bharat which is facing the menace of these missionaries to divide and destabilize India by exploiting all the possible fault lines within the Hindu society and, and check, uh, halt Bharat's economic growth. So we can see a similar pattern emerging everywhere, especially in the sensitive border regions of our country, the Northeast being a sensitive border region. Uh, it is surrounded by Bangladesh, Myanmar, uh, the drug problem is there from Myanmar, China. Uh, so th this pattern where uh, uh, in, in the border states, also in the coastal areas of our country, the, the increasing pace at which the uh, the conversion activities are happening, it reeks of a larger conspiracy to, uh, to, to stop Bharat's economic growth by creating conflicts, by manufacturing conflicts. So it is not a coincidence that when so many infrastructure projects are, are on the verge of near completion in the Northeast, especially the India-Myanmar-Thailand trilateral highway uh, and the imphal Jiribam railway connectivity project, so at a time when these projects are almost nearing completion, this conflict happened and it's not coming to a halt because there are certain, there are several non-state actors who are instigating this conflict, who do not want development in this part, uh, uh, in, in that part of the country. I have myself visited some of these areas earlier, I remember before 2000 and uh, 2016, uh, till 2016 in fact, the, the, Sil the, the highway connecting Imphal from Assam, the Silchar Imphal highway was, was, was in a too bad condition and it was all these, uh, the non-state actors that I have mentioned, the missionaries who did not want development in this part of the country. There have been so many reports of engineers, uh, the technicians involved in these uh, infrastructure projects who have been abducted, who have been kidnapped and who were taken to ransom and they never returned. Uh, also, so many uh, of these engineers, they have been, uh, they have been killed at gunpoint because uh, they, they could not pay the money that were being demanded by the, uh, by the militant organizations. So their ultimate goal is the same everywhere, to stop Bharat's economic progress by creating conflicts. So it is in this context that we need to understand the current situation uh, in, in Manipur. So we need a correct diagnosis of the problem uh, so that we can arrive at timely solutions to check this menace. And the, the condition of the, the situation of the non-Christian communities in Manipur, it, it is not just about the Maiti Hindus or the Vishnupriya Manipuri Hindus, but there are also Nepali Hindus there. Uh, there is a significant section of Tamil Hindus, those who might not be knowing, in the border town of More that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that is situated near Tamu, near the border town of Tamu of Myanmar. There is a significant section of the Tamil Hindus of Moray and they are, they are all Hindus. Their houses have been burned down, their shops have been looted and the community which has been doing this, they, this community has a history of conflicts with other community, communities, not just in Manipur but as well as in other states of the Northeast. Uh, so uh, the cookies, they have uh, they have a history of violent conflicts with the Hindu Karbis and Dimasas of Assam, with the uh, uh, with several communities in Tripura, the Bengali Hindus mainly. So uh, this has always been happening. So the 
situation of these non-Christian communities in Manipur uh, is, is, is symptomatic of I would say of is symptomatic of all the non-Christian communities in those states of India where missionary activities are seeing an upward growth. I think I would hand over to you. I've spoken quite a lot. Yes, yes, yes. That is why uh, I mentioned it. So, uh, Kankita ji has spoken uh, pertaining to Manipur in particular. So, I will add some more points about the identity crisis, especially the Hindu identity crisis in Manipur. So I have spoken about Garib Nawaj. So according to uh, the mainstream narratives, including academic narratives, and uh, uh, it is believed by each and every Manipuri there, that Hinduism was imposed on the Manipuris in the 18th century. Actually, the natives of Manipur, the Manipuris have been Hindu since the pre-Mahabharata times. There is uh, uh, the Adi Parva of the Mahabharata tells us about Raja Pravanjana of Manipur who, uh, for, who did not have any children so he worshipped Shiva, he invoked Shiva and Shiva granted him a boon that uh, each generation after him would have only one ch child. So that's how after Pravanjana each generation had one child and then Chitra, Raja Chitra Vahana, the father of Princess Chitrangada. It's only Chitra Vahana who had a daughter instead of a son. So he, Chitra Vahana made Chitrangada a putrika. He initiated her as a putrika. So that if Chitra Vahana, Chitra Vahana dies, Chitrangada would be the king of Manipur and Chitrangada's son will be, will be continuing the lineage of Chitra Vahana. So that's how Babru Vahana, instead of Settling down in the Kuru kingdom, he settled in Manipur and he became the king of Manipur. And then all of the descendants of Babru Bahana, they have been worshippers of Vishnu and Shiva and Devi Durga. And uh, coming back to Garib Nawaz, because we have uh, time constraints, coming back to Garib Nawaz in the 18th century, the practicing Hindus have uh, undergone an initiation under Vaishnavite saint Santadas Adhikari in the 18th century. So for example, if I am a Hindu, I am already a Hindu and I get initiated into the ISKCON and become a worshipper of uh, Krishna, but I am a Hindu but again became a Hindu only, initiated into the uh, ISKCON belief systems, the rituals. That's how the Hindus of Manipur got initiated as Vaishnavites under Santadas Adhikari. And then a section of the Manipuris, like according to Santadas Adhikari, the Manipuris were supposed to take a bath at the sacred tank called the Nongthrang tank. And then uh, after that they were initiated. But a section of the Manipuris that did not agree to that. They said we are already Hindus, we are already Vaishnavites, we have been worshippers of Vishnu, Shiva and Durga since time, time immemorial. So we won't want to take a bath in the sacred tank, but you can initiate us. So Santadas Adhikari, uh, named two communities, one who had taken a bath in the Nongkrang tank and one who had, did not take a bath. So he divided these two into Meite Manipuris and Vishnupriya Manipuris. So the Vishnupriya Manipuris are the ones who did not take a bath in the tank. And the Meite Manipuris are the ones who took a bath in the tank. So Meite Manipuris are actually the descendants of the Mangang dynasty. Mangang the son of Athiya Guru. Uh, one of the sons of Atiyaguru, and we, Vishnupriya Manipuris, are the descendants of Khumal, Raja Khumal. The lineage is described in detail in the Khumal Puran. So uh, the details are described in the book, all of this, the, uh, the Manipur conundrum. And then going quickly back to the Hindu identity of the Northeast in general. So there is uh, uh, the Khasi tribe, Khasi tribe, no? Karbi, Karbi tribes. Karbi. The Karbi tribes uh, uh, have a connection with the Ramayana. Uh, their book is uh, Sabin Alun, composed in the uh, 14th century. He uh, was a uh, contemporary of uh, poet Madhava Kandali, who was a court poet under uh, Raja Mahamanikya of the Kachari dynasty. 
under the patronage of Mahamanikya, Madhav Kandali translated many of the Sanskrit epics, the Ramayana, Mahavarata and other texts to SMEs. So Sabin Alun, actually the uh, tradition of Ramayana, the story of the Ramayana was transmitted from one generation to other through orally. It was an oral tradition until Sabin Alun, he composed it. And uh, when once the narration of the Ma uh, Ramayana starts, it continues non-stop for three nights. And when the narration stops, the, the uh, celebration of the rituals and all it starts. And uh, the Karbi tribes, they consider themselves to have, their ancestors consider, them, consider themselves to have uh, uh, assisted Sri Ram during the Treta Yuga. Means their ancestors assisted Sri Ram to Lanka. They carried his bows and arrows and, and also of soldiers. Few of the Karbis, they also consider themselves to be the progeny of Balmiki and also of Sugriva. I would like to ask uh, Ankita ji to delve a little more about uh, the Ramayana Parampara of the Northeast. Yes, I think you have already mentioned Sabin Alun is the beautiful Ramayan Parampara of the Karbi community of Assam about whom I just mentioned when I was referring to the conflict between the Hindu Karbis and the Dimasas uh, of Assam. So every state in the Northeast have had their own Ramayan Parampara before the advent of a foreign religion and uh, the most, without going into the details of uh, the Ramayan Parampara because all my talks are available uh, in the Varanda Club YouTube channel and as well as in various other channels. I had done and I had the pleasure of doing an entire series of the Ramayan Parampara in the Northeast for the Varanda Club. Uh, so they all are available there. I have mentioned all the details but what is most unfortunate at this point of time is that they these all are dying traditions. We I do not know how to resurrect them at this point because they all are declining traditions, especially in the states of uh, Nagaland, Mizoram and Meghalaya. In Meghalaya, the, the Hindu Jaintia communities, they, uh, still, uh, they, they still have kept alive certain traditions like uh, on, uh, uh, they celebrate Ram Navami, Maghi Purnima. Uh, and different uh, other Hindu festivals. If there, there is also a tradition among the Hindu Jaintias of Meghalaya that uh, if somebody uh, have uh, ha if, if a mother has given birth to twin sons, uh, so there is a tradition of naming their sons as Ram and Lokhon. Uh, so this tradition still persists. They even plaster the Hindu Jaintias. They even plaster their homes with uh, cow dung uh, uh, today. So they have kept alive uh, some of these traditions and we also need to, when we, are, when we are talking about the Ramayan Parampara in the Northeast, we also need to go back into the past. What were the different causes that led to the decline of this tradition? For example, I remember the, this, uh, this example uh, from Mizoram, they had several institutions known as uh, uh, Zaul books before the advent of Christianity in the Mizo society and th this Zaul book, uh, they, it, it was similar to a say, I would call a gurukulam, the, the, the similar gurukulam system in, in Hindu dharma. So the boys would be sent after a certain age uh, to these Zaul books and they would be taught the basics of, uh, of how to lead a life of a Kshatriya and uh, they, they were also taught the Ramayana, Mahabharata and our Puranas and everything. But uh, when the uh, after the advent of the British and uh, there were various conflicts when conversions had begun happening, all these, uh, uh, there was an expedition in the 18th century when these Zaul books were burned down in the middle of the night. Copies of the Mizo Ramayan which were kept in these Zaul books were also burnt along with them. So we also need to understand the history behind uh, these traditions, what led to their decline and uh, what can we do to, to resurrect these traditions? One of the most important things that I have come across during my ground studies is that uh, the, the last remaining population of the Hindus in, uh, in states like Meghalaya, uh, the Khasis. So the Khasis who are the Niam Khasis who follow their own traditional belief system, Niam Khasis, uh, they, 
if we look into their belief system, it is nothing different from Hindu dharma. But they won't call themselves Hindus. They would call themselves, we are indigenous, we are animists. So, uh, because there is no benefit of being a Hindu in this country. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that's all I could understand. So, they say, nahi, hum, uh, ma'am, hum, hum Hindu nahi hai. Hume Hindu mat boliye. Hum indigenous hai. Hum animist hai, lekin hum Hindu nahi hai. So, uh, this is the situation on the ground and uh, uh, they also oppose their Christian uh, joke, uh, people in their community who have become Christians, they oppose them as well. But they say, nahi, hum Hindu nahi hai, we are indigenous, we are animists, we are indigenous. So at the academic level also we need to rectify this, uh, this binary divide of which has been created that animists are different, it's different from Hindu dharma. So this is something which needs to be corrected to bring these people back to the fold of dharma again. So. I think Manushi ji will take yeah. over. <laughs> yeah, yes. and uh, about the connection of the Northeast to the rest of the country, uh, the talk will go on and on, but I'd like to give just one example. Uh, due to time constraints, I'll conclude it within yeah, five minutes. I also want to key, have some interaction uh, with the audience. Uh, just I'll take, yeah, two, three minutes. I, just one example of the intercultural relations with, from the, with the Northeast, with the other parts of the country. So around the last years of BC, Raja Vallabharman of uh, Assam, he held a swayambar ceremony for his daughter, uh, Princess Amrita Prabha. Uh, this uh, chapter is described in detail in my book released yesterday, that is Echoes of the Ancients. So uh, we have all uh, heard about uh, the swayambar of Nala Damanti, about uh, Ram and Sita, Pandu and Kunti. So here is this uh, swayambar that took place between um, Amrita Prabha of, of Assam and uh, Meghavahana of uh, Kashmir. So, uh, Meghavahana's ancestor uh, who ruled uh, Kashmir, he was Yudhishthira, he was blind, and he happened to be the, a very weak ruler. So, the ministers ousted him from the throne, and uh, they, another person, he became the king of Kashmir. So, for 192 years, uh, this uh, rulers from this new dynasty, they became the kings of Kashmir. And uh, Meghavahana belonged to the Gonanda dynasty. So the Meghavahana's father, Gopaditya, he took refuge uh, at the court of the king of Gandhara. So Meh Meghavahana was born in Gandhara. And uh, by the time he went uh, to attend the Swayambar ceremony of uh, Amrita Prabha, he was al already a refugee. He did not have his kingdom. And uh, uh, Raja Balabharman, he owned a parasal parasol and a type of umbrella that uh, was gifted to Narakasura by God Varun, Varun Deva. Balavarman belonged to, uh, to the dynasty, the Bhama dynasty started by Narakasura. And uh, uh, th this parasol remained uh, with the Burmans till the time of Amrita Prabha. So, uh, with the garland in hand, Amrita Prabha, along with few of her bridesmaids, she started moving from one prince to another. The bridesmaid used to hold the parasol over the head of the prince. So this way, they, like several princes were re rejected, all the princes who attended from across the country. So over the head of Megabahana, the parasol emanated a very cooling effect. That's the parasol emanates a cooling effect only over the head of a person who would be a very uh, pros who would be very prosperous and who would be, very, would be very superior, who would have a very prosperous kingdom. So, but uh, uh, Balabharman he objected because Megabahana did not have a kingdom. He is a prince only in name. But uh, but uh, Amrita Prab Prabha suggested that uh, this parasol is the proof that he will one, one day he will be the king of Kashmir. So the Swayambar ceremony, the marriage took place and uh, Megavahana, he took Amrita Prabha to Gandhara. So meanwhile, uh, the king of Kashmir, the last king of Kashmir, he left his kingdom and he went to the forest. 
He had no interest in ruling the kingdom. And the ministers from Kashmir, they started looking for a descendant from the Gonanda dynasty and they found Meghavahana. And they took back Meghavahana and Amrita Prabha back to Kashmir and Meghavahana became the king of Kashmir. <laughs> so, and uh, Amrita Prabha was the chief queen. Now she was a Vaishnavite. And uh, Meghavahana, he used, uh, though uh, Ballabarman was a Vaishnavite, he held, uh, he had uh, courtiers from all other Sanatana faith, Jainists, Jain, from Jainism, Buddhism, etc. in his uh, court. So he took one of the courtiers, a Buddhist, uh, to Kashmir. And there they built a lot of Buddhist viharas. Amrita Prabha also built a number of uh, temples, including Buddhist temples. So this story is again, this is a very short uh, description that I gave. It is described in detail in my book, A Cause of the Ancients, that was released yesterday. <laughs> so as we are, uh, there's lack of time, so we would like to uh, open the Have floor for questions. Yeah, some questions. If you talk something about the Madhuri Island and the culture. Yeah. yeah. I am Sita Lakshmi, settled in Coimbatore after my return from, from SBA as an AGM. I work in North. I am a traveler. I solo pack. I don't wait for anybody to come. So as I retired, I told my family, my children were abroad, please let me travel throughout India. North is the only state I not gone alone. So there was one senior governor there. He said, Many of us do not know all the seven states, seven sisters of Northeast. That prompted me, why not I go? I travel alone. Gaukati is a hub. The sari which madam is wearing is from Su Sualkuchi. Am I correct? <laughs> Sualkuchi is the hub of uh, Assam silk, but uh, this is not from Sualkuchi. I don't know it's a weaver's uh, hamlet <laughs> created. The textiles of Assam, each of them have got a specialty, Nagaland. Yes. In fact, I, I would like to, to cover, other than Gauhati, I mean, you didn't even cover Gauhati. We could talk about Nagaland, that money, that, you know, in places of you know, cultural revolution like Shankar. Incidentally, the governor of Nagaland, Mr. Ganeshan, is from Tamil Nadu. Uh, uh, sir and uh, ma'am, they said uh, about Majuli Island, about uh, Sankar Dev. So we, we have this tradition amongst the SMEs. Sri Manta Sankar Dev, he started the <coughs> Vaishnavic movement in Assam. Due to, the, due to that, in almost every, uh, for every 15 to 20 to 30 homes, there is a Namgar, there is a temple. And it is a must for every SMEs to visit the temple. So right from childhood, Till the last breath, one has to go to the temple. And there the Bhagavad Gita is recited, Bhagavad part is done, and then uh, there is dramatic performances of stories taken from the Mahabharata, Ramayana, and other ancient texts. And the same um, tradition is there amongst the Vishnupriya Manipuri community. There is a temple, one temple each for every 15 and 20 families, and it is a must for every Vishnupriya Manipuri Hindu to visit the temple. And uh, during the month of Kartik, for one full month, the Bhagavad Gita is recited. And it is a must for all the villagers to uh, visit the temple and listen to the recitation of the Bhagavad Gita. And for example, if uh, any uh, person is ill and very elderly and cannot visit the temple, there is loudspeaker in the temple. And through the loudspeaker, the person gets to hear, gets to listen. And uh, this is the reason why 99.9% .9 of the Vishnupriya Manipuris are still Hindus. They have not converted. And I. The, uh, uh, she, uh, uh, Ankita, you will add something. Uh, so, a um, gentleman was asking about uh, the Majuli Island. It is the hub of Assamese Vaishnava Dharma, but also at present, it is the it is the place where 
Christian conversions have been increasing rapidly of late. I went there last in, uh, during my PhD when I went in 2015 first, there were not many churches in that place. But I went in 2021 October during the, uh, just a few days before the Majuli Rakh festival begins, there was a church after every three to four kilometers. This is the situation which is, hap this is the ground situation in, in Majuli. Although some families have come back uh, because of the efforts of some leaders on ground, but uh, the situation is not, pardon? There are some satradhikars who are doing uh, some work, yes, uh, but uh, I think they came in late because by that time already a huge majority of the missing uh, tribes had converted. So they are being fed all these uh, dangerous propaganda that what you are, they have, a, the missings have a traditional drink, it's rice beer, it is fermented and uh, it, is, it is considered very sacred uh, in their culture and tradition. So these missionaries would come up with uh, ideas such as why are you drinking this, this is polluting, this is dirty and uh, we will provide you wine, we will provide you foreign liquor and all of that. So. So many of the herbs and uh, traditional uh, ingredients that are used to prepare these drinks, uh, they, uh, the young generation do not know about them. much for listening to us. Thank you for the informative session, ma'am. I kindly request Manoshi ji to felicitate Dr. Ankita Dutta ji. Now it's time for Sri Surya Sarathi Roy ji to speak with Sumedha Varma Oja, an author, speaker and columnist on ancient India and the epics who is based on Switzerland to speak on the book launch of her new book, Chanakya Scribe. We request you to come on stage, ma'am. I call upon Wing Commander Sudarshan ji to come up to the stage to launch the book. Wing Commander Sudarshan ji has come all the way from Bangalore for the Lit Fest. A quick reminder that our Western Ghats Lit Fest is being live streamed in Prachyam, Dinamalar and Swarajya. Do share the link with your family and friends. So, Sadar Pranam to this August Assembly once again. And uh, thank you, Varanda Club, for allotting a session, complete session on Northeast. This is, in fact, even I am seeing for the first time. And this was really much needed, very much needed. <laughs> Northeast has been really neglected in terms of our Purani Kitihasa. Uh, I, being a researcher on Kurukshetra, uh, you know, uh, I know the linkages, many of those linkages which Manushi was indicating at. Now let's come to today's session. We have only 30 minutes with us and uh, we, we, we have the book launch. So I will give you, uh, yeah. 
So I will give you a quick, uh, you know, glance of a uh, few uh, snippets from Dwarka that I received a request, uh, multiple requests yesterday to sh showcase some of the details of Dwarka that I was discussing. But prior to that, uh, as a tribute uh, to what uh, Dr. Ranganathan had earlier mentioned today, and at, as a tribute to you know, people like Madam Kutti, I will share one story from my own life, something that I have seen with my own eyes. And why I'm sharing this story with you is we are discussing on cultural heritage about the antiquity of this nation, about Bharata's civilization. This was the year 2011, and I had started only two years then uh, my research on the Sri Jagannath culture. You know, and uh, during my research, I was trying to identify the geographical location uh, which is mentioned in Skanda Puran or Niladri Mahodaya or the Padma Puran from where Jagannath's origination happened and also Britain Mahabharat. So after a lot of search, I stumbled upon a place. Uh, the place is named by a small town called Kantilo. Uh, in the Niagara district of Orissa. This is around a hundred odd kilometers from Bhuvneshwar. And the place that came out to be, it is on the Mahanadi Valley, okay? In Orissa, there are two prime valleys, the Mahanadi Valley and the Prachi Valley, where ancient civilization used to, uh, you know, foster. And Mahanadi Valley was a place which had a lot of uh, Vishnu, uh, you know, Vishnu worshipping happening over there. So obviously, which is indicating of the uh, fact stated in the uh, Puranic Kitihasa. I reached that place with my wife and kid. My wife, kid was very naughty at that time, and he was five years old. And the temple, uh, ancient temple, it was located on a hilltop, uh, on a very high hilltop, and surrounded by dense forest. It was there in the middle of the forest, and there was no road to capture. I went on an Indica with a lot of risk along with my family. The, Tires were skidding also on the way, many a times. And even today, I, my goose, I get goosebumps when I remember that incident. So I reached there. Uh, my kid started running around, and as it happens, uh, you know, he, his nails by, you know, got, a, got stuck in a stone, and the nails got peeled off. So we were all nervous. You know, he was bleeding profusely. So the Panditji, uh, in Orissa, they call him Nana. So the Nana uh, assured me in, uh, you know, uh, his local language, and he went inside the jungle. Around after 15, 20 minutes, he came back doing like this, you know. Jaise khaini khate hai, waise karte huye wapas aya with some jari booty. So I thought that, I don't know what would be. I said, okay, fine, let us try, because you don't have any medical facility within 100 kilometers of this place. It was that, you know, that uh, situation. He pasted it, he pasted it, and he said, just wait for some time. Would you believe me? I mean, I'm quoting it on camera, so I'm, I'm not going to, uh, you know, uh, share something, a bluff over here. In around 20 to 25 minutes, uh, the place, the wound, healed like as if nothing has happened. We just washed it off with water and everything was fine. And I asked him, what was it? What could it be? Any guesses what it could be? Any guesses? No. Vishalya Karani. The four herbs that came with Dronagiri, which Mahabharata, sorry, Hanuanji brought. Vishalya Karani. And there is a dense vegetation of Vishalya Karani in that jungle. That is our country. That is Bharat. So, you know, this is one I wanted to share. Uh, the other, uh, you know, uh, thing that I want to share with you, the two small anecdotes, uh, as a researcher from Kurukshetra, I am writing a book on Kurukshetra, which is slated to come out somewhere in March, April next year. And uh, one of the research findings is, and which has not been reported in any of the history texts right now, and not even on social media, let me tell you. Uh, one of the key destinations in Kurukshetra is the Brahma Sarovar. Many of you might have heard of it. 
some say that it was uh, created by Bhargav Parshuram. Some say Brahma created the universe out of that. But what is not reported, not even in the district gazetteer of the Haryana government, that there is a fort, there is a fort at the backyard of the Sarovar. The remains of that fort, the, particularly the wall, boundary wall, is still there. And that fort was built by Alamgir Aurangzeb, you know, for what purpose? To shoot at the devotees who would vis come for visiting Brahma Sarovar. And it was made in a way because Brahma Sarovar, within 200 meters of Brahma Sarovar is Sanyet Sarovar. And these two lakes are so much of religious sanctity, I can't tell you, the, as per the Puranic texts. Anybody coming in those two places will be shot at. That was the only purpose with which this fort was built. Then there is Sanyet Sarovar, just next to it. Mahabharat says that this is the place on, in which uh, Sri Krishna, Devki Putra Krishna, met for the second and the last time Nand Baba and Yashoda Maya on a solar eclipse day in Kurukshetra, in Sanihit Sarovar. Because Sanihit Sarovar is famous for the solar eclipse. Anybody taking a bath uh, on the solar eclipse day will attain the piousness of attending or conducting thousand Ashwamedh Yagyas. So obviously, uh, it's very highly venerated. Now, when you look at that, uh, you know, incident which is mentioned in Mahabharat, so somewhere around uh, 1630s or 40s, I don't remember the exact year, Akbar was camping on Sanhit Sarovar on a mission, you know, and uh, the sadhus and solar eclipse day was there and the sadhus had, uh, you know, large number of sadhus had gathered over there for the dip in the solar eclipse. There was some fight and this episode is mentioned in Akbar Nama by Abul Fazal and, uh, and there is a drawing in Akbar Nama on this massacre. And it, Akbar used that event and some, uh, you know, he goes on to mention that there the fights between sadhus was happening. So in order to contain the security of the place, uh, he ordered his uh, Mughal soldiers to butcher the sadhus in cold blood. So an estimated 10,000 sadhus were murdered on the solar eclipse day in Sanihit Sarovar. So this is this kind of history since we are talking of our culture constantly, of our cultural heritage, the antiquity, the narratives. I thought that this is the right session since it is speaking of narratives mentioned by Sumedha ji, to share these stories, you know, what we are and what has been suppressed. With that, I will quickly take you through something. Uh, no, uh, huh. I mean, what is cultural heritage? I've just captured over here. And as you can see, it's tangible and intangible. Intangible with the folk dances, the art forms, the skill sets of the artisans, traditional festivals. And tangible heritage is the built heritage then the coins, manuscripts, ancient texts, iconography. Why, why, what comprises typically of cultural heritage and what we should look at? So oceanography, archaeology, numismatics, which is the study of coins, iconography, study of sculptures, epigraphy, study of manuscripts and inscription, the historicity or antiquity of that place, and of course, reading our Puranic Itihasa. My personal interest has been in archaeology and epigraphy, so I typically work on these areas. Now this is on Konark, uh, you know, I will just, this is the history of Konark, but what I'll show you is uh, what many people are not being told in the, whenever they visit Konark and the, um, temple architecture. So this is, this digital diagram that you see is what Konark used to actually look like. And uh, to be very candid, the middle, middle structure is standing today, which was stuffed with sand, okay, si sand and iron clamps in 1902. Uh, by the British engineers so that it can survive. And last year, ASI, after a lot of deliberation, has started working on a project to take out the sand from Konak because it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and make some alternative technological arrangements to ensure that the, jug this is called Jagmohan, uh, the Jagmohan is, you know, open, thrown open to public. It's beautiful inside. And uh, what you can see uh, is the Garvagriya, the Antarnala, and the, uh, no, the kitchen, uh, sorry, the, the Mandapa. 
Now this this is very important. Uh, this is a you know a cross-sectional drawing you can say of the entire complex. But what is important? Why I wanted to share this with you is the Jagbohan, which is standing today, which, which is stuffed with sand on which ASI is working. It is around 80 feet. But why it is important is this is the only found sketch uh, drawn by James Ferguson, who uh, was an epigraphist with ASI, and uh, in 1837 CE. And you can see at the back, the Garvagriya or the Viman or the Deul, which is standing at 220 feet. Uh, the southern, southern part of the Viman was surviving at that point of time. So, and you can see the Surya on hearse, the Surya on chariot, then the, there's a Maya Devi temple, the kitchen, the horses. I'll show you a bit of it, how it is linked to our Puranik Itihasa. So this is a drone picture and a little description of what all structures are there. And then, now this is very beautiful, you know, the iconography, why I uh, chose to share this with all of you is, you look at the war elephants, we know of the Chaturangi Sena that our, you know, uh, kings used to have in the Puranic times or even in the medieval times. So you look at the war elephant, how it is trampling a warrior, you see, and you look at the war stallion, how it is trampling another warrior. They were trained uh, to kill, these animals were trained to kill and uh, the elephants particularly of the Orissan kings, the Kalingan kings were very famous. Uh, that is why the Kalingan kings were also called Gajapatis to some extent. And uh, these war elephants were used in the Kurukshetra war also. They participated. In fact, for that matter, uh, Bhagadatta, the son of Narakasur, his elephant who, I mean, Bhagadatta was killed by Arjun, uh, but uh, when he participated in the war, his elephant gave a very tough time to the Pandavas. And of course we know uh, Alexander, the problem or the challenges he faced and his army's fear of facing uh, Porus. Porus had only some 800 elephants if I correctly remember. But what f the ferocity of those elephants created so much of fear in the minds of the Greek soldiers that they didn't want to move ahead when they heard that the, uh, you know, the, the Mahapadma Nanda, uh, the last ruler of the Nanda dynasty, who was defeated by Chandragupta Maurya later on, Mahapadma Nanda had a brigade of one lakh elephants and majority of these elephants uh, came from the Kalingan kings. And as I said that Prague, Jyotishpur, Assam elephants were also participating in the Kurukshetra war. So this is the time wheel, uh, this is the wheel, uh, famous wheel of uh, the Sun Temple. I just picked it up, it's the same picture which was uh, showcased by uh, Pradhan Mantri ji, Narendra Modi ji. But why I picked up, so that you people could understand and have a look, it's self-explanatory of how this wheel was carved to capture the time throughout a day. Many of you must be aware that there are Jantar Mantars in many of the cities of India like Jaipur or Delhi, you know, which were used uh, for this thing. And this is on Dwar Dwarka. This was two minutes. Just give to me. Yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, I wanted to show you of Dwarka that I was speaking on the satellite analog technology. So uh, you can see the walls of uh, Dwarka that I was mentioning about the Puranic description that was uh, referred by Dr. Rao, okay. And as you can see, uh, it's a lotus form. There are many forms which have come out after study and, uh, you know, ship's hulls are there. Just take a look and you'll understand uh, what, is, what, is the, what is we have underwater, which needs to be explored. Uh, this is my personal collection and uh, this is a ship anchor, uh, which was excavated by Dr. Rao uh, during his excavation in Dwarka. So this is a 4000 uh, BCE uh, dated ship anchor. Okay, this is found from Dwarka. This is kept, this is kept in one of the museums in Kurukshetra, but sadly people do not know about these stuff that are being maintained and kept. This is another, uh, uh, you know, ancient city. We were talking of, Manoshi was also talking of uh, Harshavardhan, the Pushyabhuti dynasty, Bhaskar Barman. So this is the capital city, the ruins of the capital city of the Pushyabhuti dynasty, uh, the city that was built by Harshavardhan and his father Rajavardhan. 
and uh, this is ancient Thaneshwar, which was also plundered by Mahmud of Ghaznavi. Uh, this place is called Harshkatila. It is around 22 yards, which was excavated by ASI, and uh, you know, lot still remains to be excavated. So, if we start ex ASI starts excavation, lot many things will come out. Okay, thank you, Veranda Club, for the time. And now I would uh, request uh, Sumida ji to come on stage, and you know, let's have a quick discussion on the book. So, uh, welcome Sumita ji once again. And uh, regarding your book, I was going through it yesterday. Uh, it mostly speaks about various narratives that you have tried to highlight. So, uh, I have two questions for you and for the audience to understand a bit more. One is, if you can tell us in brief a little about your book, what it uh, primarily consists of. And secondly, uh, at least uh, two narratives that you have covered in the larger context, if you can take us through. Uh, Varnakam to everyone and Namaskaram. Am I audible? Yes, okay. So, you know, this is a bit of a different book. All of you, since yesterday, have been seeing books which are history. This is not history. This is historical fiction. So, it is historical fiction which hangs on the facts of history, but it has a lot of people, a lot of stories, which are not really history. So why do we need the genre of historical fiction? Because it is a story which is much easier for people to understand. So I, as uh, Surya has mentioned, there are many narratives which are wrong about Indian history. In this book, I have tried to uh, deal with all of them. A little bit about myself will also tell you why I wrote this book and what was the purpose of a number of things inside it. So I am a lapsed communist. I am a product of Delhi University in the 80s and uh, well I was more uh, communist than the SFI but you know very soon I s listened to them, I listened to what they were saying and I would ask them a few questions and they would not answer. So they said uh, that Hindus do all these wrong things and they are communal. So I said if Muslims do the same thing why are they not communal? So you know there was no answer to that. I was disillusioned, I was disillusioned by the SFI and then I did not find in my own life, in my own upbringing, the kind of things they said about Hindu society. My mother was not a regressive woman, I was not brought up inside Parda, nobody discriminated against me. So there was this huge disjunction between what my professors tried to teach me in Delhi University and what I saw in my own life. And that led to a number of questions, thankfully. I come from a family where, you know, I was reading Sahitya Academy translations when I was in school. So I had a good idea of pan-Indian culture. When, well, I joined the civil services, I worked as a commissioner income tax, and then I decided to go back to my first love, which is the Mauryans. So the Mauryans are the basis of this book and why are the Mauryans important because I think they are the prototype of the modern Indian state. One wrong narrative the one you have asked me about is that India was never a country. So Bharat, India was always a country for a very long time civilizationally. Politically it was for the first time that Chandragupta Maurya with his preceptor Kautilya he made this entire country into I mean this entire landmass into one kingdom. And that kingdom was the kingdom of Bharat. They also, the Mauryans also use the word Jambudweep for their, and you know the Bharat Khande, Jambudweepe. So they also use the word Jambudweep, Ashok has used it in one of his inscriptions to uh, describe this landmass. So I feel that in exploring the Mauryans, I explore a lot of the roots of the India that we have today. And I call myself an unofficial ambassador from the kingdom of uh, the Mauryans, the court of Chandragupta Maurya to modern India. I want everyone to see the wonder that was India and not in the way that A.L. Basham has described it, but in the way that our own original sources described it. Now Surya had a very interesting 
list over here of what kind of things are there that we through which we learn history and many of those are they are the evidence through which we understand history now a bit about this book this book the protagonist is a woman she is who is she she is a spy she is a spy in the pay of chanakya she works for the mauryan kingdom the story starts just after chandragupta maurya has taken over from the nandas and he has to establish his fledgling kingdom and this spy network which is the urna nabhi which is the spider's web across the entire empire that is why this book is called urnabhi it is a tadbhav of urna nabhi a sanskrit word for spider's web as you would know so um, the idea is to explore through her eyes not just how the kingdom was established but what was the position of women what was society like and a 360 degree view of ancient indian society so one of the wrong narratives that you had asked me about is the thing about india never being a country the second one is a one which hits me directly you know what was the position of women in the past were they actually in need of rescue were they actually in need of being told by some other alien culture no this is the way you should behave you poor things you are just being demeaned humiliated etc so there is a whole uh, school of marxist feminists who have spent all their time doing this i write a lot of stuff debunking whatever they have written and they are wrong on evidence they are wrong on understanding they are wrong on interpretation they use the false aryan invasion theory to prove their points so on whatever basis you want to take they have not got the backing for the kind of things they say but tell me something how many people this hall is a different matter but how many people average people in the country are interested in all this very few so how do you tell them all this by writing books by writing stories which they will find very easy to read and in this book i have exemplified all these threads of narratives that we are talking about that we have been talking about also about our dharm what was hindu dharm all about is it really that kind of you know dark hole that kind of regressive superstitious religion that christianity and islam tells us no so i say no but how do i prove it what is the way in which this can be conveyed to people so that is what i have tried in this book through a description not just the it's a fast moving spy thriller but the basis is the correction of a lot of wrong historical narratives which have taken root everywhere and uh, let me tell you you know i live in uh, geneva in switzerland and i talk to a lot of international audiences about this book so one they are unwilling to believe that at least 2300 years ago such a kingdom existed in india so they say it's all lies to whatever is written in the book no you have misrepresented the position of women it was not like this so because what is mr kesi she is a free agent she is a courtesan of that time a ganika of that time and ganikas of that time were uh, you know sampann with the 64 arts they used to act as diplomats they used to act as spies they used to act as cultural uh, nodes of disseminating all kinds of knowledge so all this really needs to be told to people not just in terms of hard facts but in terms of books which are stories so that you can hang these important things on historical facts and make it interesting for people do you have any other question yeah you can talk for another 5 minutes no actually uh, i don't know probably none of you would have read the book so uh, maybe i can just describe it for you so it's a trilogy the first one is called the story of a modern dancing girl the second one is called chanakya scribe because my protagonist becomes uh, an assistant of acharya chanakya and the third one which is upcoming is called the waters of the mauryans because during the mauryan times there was a great paucity of water and a huge famine and how did the state deal with it what did the state do 
there are still some extant water works in Girnar which were made by Chandragupta Maurya and there are some inscriptions which tell you who made them. It was Pushyagupta, one of his viceroys who had made that uh, uh, water body to provide water to all the area around Girnar. So the third one is going to be based on that. If you read these three books, you will get a very perfect idea of the Mauryan period, how Chandragupta Maurya established his empire, how it was extended, and what were the social, religious, political, international, and uh, again, I must repeat myself, a 360 degree view of ancient India. So I would invite you to read it and you know, learn more about the Mauryan past. So just to add on to, uh, you know, your uh, international audience, uh, the reference that you made that they are unwilling to accept. Uh, I just want to share one an an anecdote, you know, in 2005 when I was staying in France, I was staying in Marseille for a few months on a training and I was interacting uh, with a few French students and uh, I wanted to understand, oh, you are from Inde, yeah, in French they call it Inde. So, uh, I asked them that what, what do you know about Inde? So they told me something uh, which many of us today know that you know it is a land of uh, snake charmers. You know that's what officially was taught in the French textbooks in the schools. Land of snake charmers. So when you have that kind of curriculum getting into it, so these are the same people who have grown up and you have been interacting with them and that becomes as a cultural shock. And uh, he has uh, talked about the way English has taken over whatever we are, what all of our cultural modes also. So he had given the idea of Sanskritizing English. At the same time, you know, I have also been thinking of that. So if you read these books, you will find so many Sanskrit words. But it was a great fight because I wanted to put in Sanskrit words, my publisher did not. So we had 13 rounds of editing and some of them stay. The point I'm making is again, uh, in Rome, I had a book reading with two or three British women who attended the reading. They came up to me after that and said, I mean, what have you done with English? This is not English. What are all these words over here? And uh, I mean, you, I cannot even recognize that this is English. So there was a German woman over there who said, yeah, okay, it's fine. English is not my first language either. And uh, Sanskrit is, I don't know it, but I am ready to understand the story. I am ready to understand it. If I can read Latin or English or any other language, French, then why can't you also accept a few of the Sanskrit words or Hindi words which are used here simply because they are untranslatable. They cannot be translated. And uh, you have to use those original words so that the impression of that period, a correct impression, and the culture of that period really comes through. So again, I've tried to do a lot of things with this book, and I would love it if people would read it and tell me whether these things have really happened or not. Thank you. Another interesting story. Uh, very recently, many of you must be knowing that Orissa has emerged as a hockey, our national hockey hub, right? We have the World Cup hockey is being hosted over there. And as a part of Intech, uh, one of my colleagues was uh, from Odisha, the Bhuvneshwar chapter. He was given the responsibility of taking, because Bhuvneshwar is a temple city, right? And he was given the responsibility for taking around the Belgium team, with Belgium hockey team, with entire crew up there. So they were standing at the Parshu Rameshwara temple, one of the most oldest temples of uh, Odisha, 6th century. And um, it has Saptamatrikas and it has uh, panel, Navagraha panel on the door jam, which is not Navagraha, but Ashtagraha. That's the only temple in Orissa with Ashtagraha. So, uh, you know, they, they were looking, everything understanding and looking, and then after some time, some of them getting a bit jittery, they come to my friend and ask them that, uh, where are those erotic structures, uh, erotic iconography? So, then he, he diverts again, but then these people again come back. Uh, where are those? You know, they are very interested in it. And my friend uh, gets agitated. So he turns around and he tells them that, listen, you know when this temple was made? This was in 6th century B, uh, sixth century CE. That was the time when your ancestors were wearing skins of animals and hunting in the jungles. And our ancestors were building this temple. <laughs> so, 
So that's the kind of expression, that's the kind of thought process, you know, these people still carry. So uh, any questions from the audience? Most welcome, please. What would be your process for something like this? Uh, I mean, some basic source would be from a Mudra Rakshas, of course, of course. So I call my book the sequel to Mudra Rakshas. So if you read Mudra Rakshas, a lot of the characters are here. And the heroine is called uh, Misra Kesi. Misra Kesi is from the Natya Shastra, the two uh, Natyanganas who were created by Brahma. So Misra Kesi and Sukesi are from there. Misra Kesi is also from Kalidas because she is the one who rescues Shakuntala. So there are a lot of, uh, see these are the fictional literary things, but the historical references. Now uh, there are uh, Sanskrit sources, there are Greek sources, there are Roman sources, then there are Sanskrit Buddhist and Jain sources and Prakrit Buddhist and Jain sources. Uh, there are also the Jatak Tez, the Ashok Vadan, the Deep, uh, the Deep Vadan uh, and uh, other than that Ashokan inscriptions. Is she a Vishkanya? Sorry. Is she a wish? I don't want to give any spoilers. I don't want to give any spoilers. I was of this. I was <laughs> no, spoilers, <laughs> no spoilers, please. No spoilers, please. But if you read uh, the Mudra Rakshas, then you can get a bit of the story, but please, no spoilers. And uh, I have also, you see, I read all original sources, so Mauryan inscriptions. Then uh, a lot of uh, the plays of Bhas because Bhas lived somewhere around the Mauryan period. So for understanding the character of the women and the men, I have used the plays of Bhas. And uh, see, I was born in Patliputra or modern Patna. So a lot of that history, a lot of the archaeological remains I have grown up with. A lot of those archaeological remains, the Ashokan pillars, they are, so we do have a lot of information about the Mauryans. But it's a very hotly contested uh, terrain. Information is there, but it's so long back that you have to take a very kind of judicious view about everything. But evidence is all, and uh, I pride myself that you open any book, any page, ask me where I have got that particular fact from, and I will be able to tell you. <laughs> so I, I think that is my USP as a historical fiction writer. In fact, just to add on to us, uh, uh, since you mentioned the Mauryan and the Ash Ashokan pillars, so one of the very wrong history that has been taught to us is uh, the Kalingan War. Uh, we, we discussed yeah. about it yesterday in lot, uh, was fought in Kalinga. And the war field, even I grew up with those understanding and I have been to that place as well. It is called Dholi, uh, you know, Dholagiri yeah. Dhol or Dhol Dholi, uh, this thing. There is an Ashokan inscription over there and it is being widely preached even today that the battle was fought on the banks of the, uh, you know, uh, Daya River. The Daya River is flowing there, it's banks of Daya River on two or three days and it's just finished and huge number of Kalingans were killed. But the actual history is uh, the Kalingan war was actually fought for six to seven years time and it was not fought on the banks of Daya River and the Daya River did not turn red and uh, <laughs> and it was actually fought much interior uh, in, in, in the Kalingan territory. So No, so uh, let me add a little bit of depth yes. to that. Ashok was a viceroy for his father Bindusar. Yes. And when he was a viceroy, there was an uprising in Kaling. Kaling was not outside the Mauryan Empire at the time, but already inside. We know this because of Karavela's inscription, which is also found over there. So this whole thing has been blown up, not just by historians, by dear great Ashok himself. Yes. Because he was a megalomaniac. You read those inscriptions, it's all about I, me, myself. So not only has he yes. uh, blown it up, but historians have blown it up. So Kaling was a local uprising of one region of the Mauryan Empire, which was then suppressed by Ashok as a viceroy. And later he made up his own stories. He was already a Buddhist by that time. But these stories, this hagiography has been built up. So, you know, those dead white men who wrote the sacred books of the East. So these dead white men have a lot to say about Buddhism, which is very good. Hinduism, which is very bad. 
so they built up ashok as the good buddhist good buddhist great king against all the other bad hindu kings there's so much so much wrong over here that you need a, a lot of books on this unfortunately it is only the other side which is writing books upon books on ashok patrick oliver is the latest to write another hagiography of ashok after nayanjot lahiri who honestly speaking is one of the best historians of the modern period today i will give her that much but she is also written a hagiography of ashok patrick oliver has written a hagiography of ashok no one has written one of chandragupt but i am going to do so <laughs> just to add on to her uh, for for records and for your information also ashok murdered in cold blood 10000 ajivikas right in budh gaya right in budh gaya he murdered can i stop you there surya taranath Uh, account is what this is based on taranath wrote in the 17th century so we should take this with a pinch of salt because taranath was not to be relied on now ashok is widely said to be very very fierce and very very cruel but taranath's accounts because he wrote in the 17th century of something which happened 2000 years ago let's take it with a pinch of salt but uh, we we come across other uh if i correctly remember rc mazumdar also uh, shared the a main uh, the original source is taranath is the it? original source of all this okay. is taranath so, yeah anyways, so we no, have no, to take taranath sure with a no, pinch of salt no. he was supposed widely said to be very very cruel and he fought with all his brothers to be the king it was only tissa who he let him live he fought with all the others kunal became blind so yes there's no doubt surya that he was a very very hundred, cruel person hundred yeah. of his brothers yeah no absolutely absolutely no. and actually you know i have written a lot in the swarajya magazine about ashok and the mauryans so ashoka the not so great please read it it's there in swarajya magazine also dr grave of sempere also yes so you know he was a rahul gandhi of his times his father and grandfather gave him a big kingdom and he just drove it to the ground he ups the, the parallels between ashok and rahul gandhi are just too much to miss and all his inscriptions are blown up as yeah. in right actually yeah and you know uh, he is said up. to be the father of the welfare state now whatever is written in his inscriptions about the welfare of the people is the indic political science theory you read the arthashastra you read those inscriptions it's like parallel absolute you know copy of each other you were saying something now online you'll have congress saying uh, rahul <laughs> ashoka the great <laughs> <laughs> i will draw that then <laughs> <laughs> all his inscriptions were blown up uh, he placed one inscription in dholgiri uh, ashokan edict that is mentioned today and then he placed all his inscriptions some of his inscription in the northwest frontier so that uh, any invader coming in can have a look at the inscription and become fearful that i have murdered so many people in kalinga and if you look at the inscriptions and scriptures and historical evidences kalinga did not even have that kind of population at that point of time even if you put kalinga and utkal and you know toshali everything put together because the odisha that we know today was actually spread into two parts one was utkal one was kalinga yeah you know so yesterday you didn't want to put the mauryans and the nation builders i'm sure it was because of the impression of ashok but ashok was the last and the worst mauryan it was chandragupta and bindusar you know who were the real mauryans mm. so we should uh, just uh, pull down ashok and build up chandragupta and remember that you know we are the modern mauryans <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah you you call it the ashok chakra but that chakra is the dharma chakra that chakra appears in the rigveda also that is the chakra of dharma so it has been found in mauryan remains and you know somehow all mauryan remains are ascribed to ashok that's not true because there are many and uh, it can also be ascribed to uh, his father or his grandfather because some of the titles that they used they were the same piya dasi for example chandragupta was also called piya dasi ashok was also called piya dasi but it was on the basis of this piya dasi which was found in sri lanka that ashok and and his grandfather chandragupta were given the chronology that we have today and that the whole mainstream narrative has been put in place but remember that everything that is said to be done by ashok was not done by ashok most of it was done by chandragupta ashok spent his time unraveling it 
and yeah you are right uh, sumedha ji uh, many of these titles you know uh, i was discussing with uh, manushi also uh, in indraprastha talks uh, karavela you mentioned karavela so karavela being a jain ruler uh, the legendary jain ruler he assumed the title of mega vahana aira karavela so mega vahana aira is also another title which is used in northeast so i was uh, you know so in ancient india or medieval india uh, many of these titles have been used and parallelly and you know, they especially uh, went in families from father to son to grandson they went in families so it is very dangerous to assume that all of it has been done by one person you need some corroborating evidence for that yes see so many vikramadityas yeah, yeah that's true that's true and let me tell you there is one vikramaditya who built the krishna janmabhoomi chandragupta vikramaditya in 400 ce and that is the same temple that was destroyed by mahmud of ghazni so in ghazni when he comes to uh, janmabhoomi katra keshav dev for the destruction his historian udbi writes that uh, sultan is so much enamored by looking at this structure that he says that only the genies could have built it that over a period of 200 years that was the beauty of that temple so with this we'll yeah thank yeah, you abhijit ji please Mudra Rakshas does not have any mention of Greeks, but uh, there is other evidence, you know, uh, from Roman and Greek sources, especially the biographers of Alexander. It is there that we get a mention of whatever happened with the Greeks. It is there. It is Justin who gives the story of all the things that we know about Chandragupt and that great fight between the Seleucids and the Mauryans, which actually ended in a sandhi. that happened near the kubha river in which is now afghanistan so chandragupt gave 500 elephants to seleucus seleucus ceded a large part of afghanistan and pakistan today's pakistan to chandragupt and also gave him his daughter to marry and uh, thus was inaugurated the era of mauryan seleucid friendship and you know we talked about trade routes and the way they are important so this was all for the control of the trade route towards the gulf and towards europe it was called the hemvat marg so seleucus wanted it chandragupt wanted it they clashed for it and there was finally a treaty signed you know it would be also interesting for if i could tell you how that sandhi is an absolute theoretical exposition of the way sandhis are explained in book 6 of the arthashastra yeah that's a very good very interesting question and i myself have written a couple of papers on that yes no so you know that is not uh, so much of a thing because you do know that indica has been lost and uh, megasthenes indica only is there in excerpts from strabo justin etc then it was j w mcrindle who put together all these and tried to reconstruct the indica and then it was translated from greek into english so what we may have lost from the indica we don't know there could be other stuff which is lost yes. but uh, we must deal with this chronology question because it is a very big one and on that is dependent the entire chronology of indian history so uh, it's a there is an inscription on which certain egyptian and greek kings are mentioned and syrian kings and they have been dated to a particular time as a ashokan inscription and depending on that the date for ashok and then the date for chandragupta has been put but there are many 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 holes in this and uh, if you are interested i can send you that paper of mine where i have also myself written on this so this is something this is an area of uh, further research and it is an uh, it could just totally change the chronology of indian history a lot of people are working on this so let's see thank you i request shri surya sarathi rai ji to felicitate shrimati sumedha ji we will resume shortly after the lunch break as we have up, as we have interesting sessions coming up
former chief of uh, Hamas outfit. And this comes at a very crucial time when we all have four gathered here and assembled here to uh, talk largely about the kind of oppressor these forces have been uh, on us and on this country and on the neighboring countries as well. Uh, Shahzad Amin, of course, this is a very terrible time uh, when we have gathered here. Uh, so one woman has died and 25 have been grievously injured of which three are critical, which also includes uh, several children. And this happened on the Sunday morning prayer at a church where both Jews and Christians also live, but uh, it was a faction of the Christians uh, which, has, uh, which was assembled there and has got grievous injuries. So this terror attack, of course, comes barely 12 hours after the Hamas, uh, former Hamas uh, uh, chief was addressing a virtual rally in Kerala. Imagine uh, this is happening in India where we take so much of pride in our democratic values that we allowed this to perpetuate and allowed a rally to be held uh, in, the, in, in the southern state. And then 12 hours later, we are witnessing uh, one of the most deadliest attacks in the recent history uh, in Kerala. So all of this must uh, provoke us to, to get angered, to also feel humiliated by the secular forces which have allowed this to perpetuate, whether it is one particular party in the national capital or that which operates in this state, that is Tamil Nadu, or that in Kerala. And if these three parties have uh, colluded with each other to perpetuate this, then I think it's a very shocking state of affairs that it happens on a day when all of us have gathered to, to understand the gravity of the situation. Uh, Shazad, I believe that uh, since we are starting on a very uh, sad note on, on this as well, uh, may I also begin to ask you that uh, what has led uh, to the origin of India outfit coming as it does with the manifesto of Congress about two weeks uh, ago, it released in it, uh, at the CEC meeting where they mentioned a support uh, for the Palestinian and did not even uh, deem it appropriate to condemn First of all, uh, beginning this topic and this discussion proof of what happens when in the name of vote bank politics you compromise with hardline fundamentalist elements and you are in a state of denial about the real and imminent threat that these radical elements pose. Like you rightly mentioned uh, just about a few hours ago, the Kerala government, and I hold the Kerala government responsible, allowed the platforming of a terrorist, Khalid Mishal, who is the one of the founders of the Hamas. And in that particular platform, which was accorded to him, if you notice very carefully, on the stage was a line called Uprooting Bulldozer Hindutva. It was mentioned on the stage, Uprooting Bulldozer. But what is the connection of Hindutva with Palestine's cause and then giving a platform to Hamas? Is Hamas equal to Palestine? As far as I am concerned, West Bank does not have any Hamas. In fact, the Hamas has persecuted members of the Palestinian Liberation Organization and other elements who are in power in West Bank, which is a different area than Gaza, where the action is right now uh, proceeding against terror groups by Israel. So why would you say that? And the link is very clear. Ever since the Mumbai meeting of the Indi Alliance, INDI Alliance took place, you must have seen a series of statements that were made about Sanatan Dharma. It started off by Udayanidhi Stalin. In, thereafter, it was supported by Priyank Khadge, son of Malikarjun Khadge. 
then it was a raja who said that sanatan and hindu dharm is like aids in fact there was an old video of a raja where he minced no words when he said that it is the hindu religion or the hindu dharma which is a global menace the congress party of course has a long history of making such statements right from denying prabhu shri ram's existence opposing the ram mandir hindu terror trying to whitewash what happened in kashmir uh, always trying to shift the blame onto hindutva as being isis like or boko haram like but never calling out islamic jihad so that has been a long the allies of the indi alliance whether it's samajwadi party whether it's the rjd whether it's the trinamool congress the congress dmk all of them as if acting in an orchestra or a concert made these statements and now when you link it to this program being held just a few hours ago in kerala where a message is being sent subtly that the manner of uprooting hindutva is to do what hamas did to replicate that and after that takes place you immediately have a terror attack because i don't think there is any doubt anybody's mind now that this is a terror attack uh, from what i have heard of the agencies they have said they have uh, found that there is an ied involved so it means it's a terror attack it's not a short circuit or a fire or a gas cylinder so hours after the kerala government allows the platforming of a hamas terrorist where it said uproot hindutva immediately after that there is a terror attack where the targets could be christians and jews it was a jehovah's witnesses conclave that was taking place and i see that as a direct linkage or a direct uh, incitement for that terrorism and therefore i don't hold the kerala government responsible for being ignorant i hold the kerala government responsible for being a conspirant for being a conspirator in this entire matter and now just 5 minutes ago i've just tweeted it one of the ministers in the kerala government i am not making it up one of the ministers in the kerala government uh, about the unfortunate casualty has said this uh, lady has not died because of the blast she has died because of the fire <laughs> and therefore i can tell you the next statement that kerala government will issue is that the 1400 israelis were not killed by hamas they were killed by guns and knives <laughs> and guns and knives have no religion Uh, which is I mean my next question to you uh, Shahzad is that uh, considering that these terror attacks which were earlier very few and far between uh, the language the tone and the tenor that you see of uh, uh, these outfits the protests the demonstrations which are being held in the national capital uh, the sponsorship has come in some way or the other by the likes of the Udayanidhi Stalin who have directly taken this city where we are operating from right now Coimbatore where we are holding this session the chief minister sen himself does not have any shame left in him to use the word malaria and dengue mm. now when such statements come i want to understand from you politically india's that is india alliance's strength where does it where do you see considering there are five back to back state elections rajasthan madhya pradesh chatisgarh is bjp does bjp have it in itself to take on such people or because of the poll losses which happened in himachal and karnataka may give further setback to bjp or does bjp have the fire power to take on these people first of all uh, the bjp is actually a party and under prime minister modi's leadership we have a clear cut mission and vision for the country on the other hand think about it and we'll start from the north in jammu kashmir nc and pdp don't see eye to eye on a usual basis they have come together you go to west bengal trinamool congress adhiranjan choudhury or trinamool congress and the left don't see eye to eye they have come together then you come to uttar pradesh and we have already seen what akhilesh yadav said about congress in madhya pradesh and what congress has said about akhilesh yadav let's not get into that but usually they don't see eye to eye especially after the debacle of up ke do ladke up's two <laughs> boys after that debacle they were not seeing eye to eye they have come together in maharashtra uddhav thakre ji who is the son of baba saheb thakre ji who used to take credit for uh, ram mandir movement who used to say that we will not allow any kind of statement against veer savarkar ji is today sitting in lap of those who call veer savarkar ji kayar and darpok they have come together the same uddhav ji and his father used to say 
Mr. Pawar and his party is a party of rascals and I would rather shut my shop than ever ally with them. They have come together. Then you go down further south, you will see that in Kerala, Congress and left have constantly fought elections against each other. They have come together. So first of all, it is these people, because they don't have mission and vision like Modi ji, they only have commission, <laughs> family ka profession, apna apna ambition and corruption. So all of this has made them to come together. So there is no question of BJP feeling afraid of them. They are very afraid of Modi, therefore they have come together. Now as far as this entire approach is concerned, first of all they have to fight elections together, then we will be able to take on them as a unit. In Madhya Pradesh they are not fighting together, they are fighting against each other. One is calling them Chirkut, I don't know what I should use for English word for Chirkut. Chirkut, anybody has a good English word for it? Anyways, I think it, the word is so universal that even people from Tamil Nadu will understand Chirkut, what it means. So Chirkut is being said from one side, the other side is saying Akhilesh, Akhilesh. They are not fighting together. In uh, Rajasthan, Aam Admi Party, they are fighting against Congress Party. In Chhattisgarh, Aam Admi Party is fighting against Congress Party. In Madhya Pradesh, they are fighting. So they are not fighting together as a unit. And again, I tell you, Please think about it ever since Indie Alliance, Indie Alliance, this news has started. From then to now, no logo. Logo ke liye kya karna hai? Not clear. No logo. Logo ke liye policy, not clear. Neta, not clear. They keep fighting about who will be the Neta. Niti, not clear. What is your stand on Article 370, for instance? Because Aam Aadmi Party has supported its abrogation. Somebody else has said we will restore it. What is your position on OBC caste census? Trinamool Congress is dead hard against it and Congress party has now suddenly become a champion of OBC caste census after opposing Mandal Commission. So there is no clarity on Niti, Neta, Netritva. So they are not coming together. They are only there together because they hate one man. Because they hate one party and because they don't want India to progress. And today, if you think about it, I see this election and I made this statement in Rajasthan also. I don't see this election as an election of five states or as an election of say Rajasthan or an election of India in 2024. Please understand this is 2024 is not election between Congress and BJP. It is actually a clash of civilization. 2024 is clash of civilization. I'll tell you Rohan why. Just give me one minute for this. When the G20 meeting took place in Delhi, which was across the board celebrated worldwide for the historic successes that we had, the New Delhi Declaration, Biofuel Alliance, etc. Did you notice what happened in the G20? Prime Minister Narendra Modi invited the guests and when they were coming to shake hands with him, behind him was the Konak wheel. Did you notice that? There has been a time in this country Nehruji had invited the Saudi king once to India in 1955, specifically to Kashi. And Nehruji, what all he hid from the eyes of the Saudi king. And today in 2023, when Prime Minister Modi is standing with Mohammed bin Salman, he shows Mohammed bin Salman that this is our virasat, this is our tradition, this is our entire history, that at the time many people were saying world and earth is flat, we were calculating the distance of sun and moon and telling people the time 1500 years ago, thousands of years ago. We told that to Prince of Saudi Arabia, we told it to Joe Biden. Then when the delegates moved further to Bharat Mandapam, they saw statue of Nataraj. You know what is statue of Nataraj? Statue of Nataraj is not just a reflection of our Astha. It is actually a reflection of how advanced our Sanskriti and our culture has been, even scientifically speaking, how Vigyan and Virasat go hand in hand along with Vishwas in India. The statue of Natarajji, the Ashtadhatu statue, it's the biggest statue in the world of that kind, has four, it has four hands, two right hands, two left hands. I don't need to tell you, Lyola, there is one uh, as we enter. Yes, so... The two hands of Natarajji, the right hand, if you see, there is a damru. There is a damru, the musical instrument, which is shaped like an hourglass. It shows the continuity of time. The other hand is in Abhay Mudra. 
The left hand has fire, which symbolizes destruction and creation. And the lower, the lower left hand is in a downward position, which is signifying moksha. And the right leg is on the asur, that it has been able to take over all the evil asuras, he has been able to control it. And the ring of fire around Nataraji represents the continuous creation and destruction, just like the universe is continuously being created and destructed, which has been found out thousands of years ago by the scientists. And therefore, the same statue that we saw outside Bharat Mandapam is also outside the CERN office in Geneva, where subatomic particle research is being done by the world's most leading scientists. This is Indian culture. This is Bharatiya Sanskriti. And all of this is not happening in a vacuum. It is happening at a time when Konark is being shown, when Nataraji is being shown. At that time, our ISRO is also landing Chandrayaan-3 on the south side of the moon. And that point is called Shiv Shakti point. And therefore, from G20 platform to the south side of the moon, Sanatan ka danka baj raha hai, Sanatan's flag is rising high. And Ra Rohanji, Sanatan's flag is rising so high that a country which ruled over us for 200 years, namely Great Britain, when we have overtaken them in terms of becoming the fifth largest economy, they have had to find a Sanatani from somewhere and they found a Sanatani. Sanatani aisa mila, they found such a Sanatani. His name also has Sanatan, Rishi. And his slogan also has Sanatan. He says to Murari Bapu, Jai Siyara. And at that point, when the world from UK to G20 to Chandrama, everybody is seeing the rise of Sanatan. At that time, there is an alliance which sits in Mumbai and says how to destroy Sanatan. And therefore, I tell you, this is a clash of civilization. 2024 is not an election. It is a clash of ideas, whether the idea will be the idea presented by Swami Vivekananda, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the philosophy of Sanatan, or whether it will be the idea that in the same time period when the G20 took place in 2001, brought down two twin towers. It is a clash between these ideas. And this has to be understood. And I'm telling you, as far as I can see, because the topic is winds of change. Now the wind is changing in such a way that till yesterday who were doing Rom, 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 today I have started doing Ram, 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 Ram. <laughs> so you know, very soon you will see these winds of change that are going to happen in many other households also. My next question to you, Shazad, since I am wearing a journalist's hat today, uh, is when I asked you this question that what should BJP do or what BJP is doing to counter the narrative which is being built by someone like Odenidhi Stalin when he called Sanatan malaria. Congress and other parties often accuse your party, that is the BJP, of using ED and CBI to arm twist these opposition parties. Why I'm asking this question is because since I have also reported, reported extensively on some of the investigative scams involving Augusta Westland 2G and telecom, I often find it very unbelievable that for five years the government sits over these files does not respond and opposition then charges and accuses you that when the election approaches, you use EBI. I find that Sanatan is always with the BJP, but is ED and CBI also with the BJP? Look, I have a solution for this. If my friends in the India Alliance want to accept it, they constantly, they never say that the allegations are wrong. They never say that allegation is wrong. They say timing is wrong. <laughs> have you ever heard them come on television and say, no, 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 this allegation is wrong taking action now. Now it's election time. Don't take action now. I have two suggestions for them. One is, please tell me, when is the wrong time to take the right action? Action on corruption is right action. And secondly, if you think that every action is being driven by election, let us have one election, one nation. We will do one election, one nation. Then four and a half years we will do development and the agencies will do their job. Now as far as misuse of EDCVI is concerned, they don't answer this question by the way, Shefali. When I tell them one nation, one election chalega, then four and a half years we'll do work, we will do raids, whatever happens will happen and then six months we'll do election, everything will stop. So they say, no, 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 no. Then this is okay. Anyway, 
the point that I was trying to make is that misuse of CBI and ED, before 2014, who was being acted upon by the same agencies which were under Congress government, which it was also called cage parrot. Congress party was under the scanner, people went to jail. DMK leaders were under the scanner, they went to jail. Samajwadi party was under the scanner, disproportionate assets case. Lalu Prasad was under the scanner, RJD was under the scanner, Laluji went to jail, was convicted first time in 2013. Uh, after that, you have uh, TMC which was under the scanner because of many other corruption cases in Bengal. Today also, the same parties are under the scanner. If it was being misused or it was in that way that there was corruption in the BJP where it is not being used against the BJP leaders, then you had a government between 2004 to 14. If the BJP leaders were corrupt, what stopped you from putting them in jail? And it's not that they did not try to put people in jail. They tried all their tricks against Prime Minister Modi. He is the most hounded chief minister who was subjected to all kinds of inquiries in the 2002 case, which the Supreme Court finally said that there was no connection with the chief minister's office. Amit Shah ji was hounded. That case has also not stood in the court of law. But your cases not only stand in the court of law, the court tells you when you go as 14 parties to the court saying that ED is hounding us, they tell you that, sorry, this is not acceptable. You have to come up with something specific. And by the way, Congress party, when Manish Sisodia goes to jail under the same ED, they say, very good. When Sonia Gandhi is acted upon by the ED, they say, very bad. Aam Aadmi Party, when the same ED takes action against Chhattisgarh CM, they have come on record to say that their liquor ghotala in Chhattisgarh is a very big ghotala. Look, Aam Aadmi Party's confidence. <laughs> they have done liquor scam in Delhi. They are saying liquor scam in Chhattisgarh is very big. And therefore, ED must arrest Bhupesh Baghel. At that time, ED becomes very good. And when uh, action is taken against Sanjay Singh and he's still not got bail, and the court has said that, you know, stop making these excuses and you are prima facie involved in this and therefore answer for it. At that time, ED becomes very bad. So I think uh, this conditional commitment that sometimes ED is good, sometimes CBI is bad, this should stop. It is their hypocrisy. And in fact, finally, just a last point on this. If they had any proof against any BJP leader. Why do they waste their breath and energy on television? Even the courts of law, they, they keep praising all kinds of benches of the courts. So they should go to their favorite bench and they should file a petition that look, this agency has not been taking action. Here is the proof. In nine, 10 years, not single case against whom they make allegations has been taken to one court of law, not one case. So I think it is only a victimhood card that they play and nothing else in it. That also sort of brings me to a very interesting question which many in the audience also had asked me to ask you. That uh, coming as it does these EDI and CBI inquiries, uh, one of the fascinating inquiries which has gripped the conscious of this nation is the one which has been commissioned against TMC MP Mahua Moitra. Now this TMC MP a year and a half back as you all know had also made some uncharitable remarks on Durga saying that she is a meat eating and a liquor drinking goddess. As a proud Hindu and as a journalist, separate identities, I would not have accepted either of the two statements. But I want to understand from you that is it because of her attack on a private company that she's been targeted or also because of the fact that she has been carrying these Louis Vuitton bags that must be investigated? I think many people are now realizing where the Louis Vuitton came from. <laughs> See, there's no question of targeting anybody for anything. First of all, if that company which she raises questions against is a company that should be held responsible for all acts of corruption, then why has Mamta Banerjee allowed investment of 10,000 crores in West Bengal and given Tajpur port to that group? This is very curious. I have always heard secular communal narrative in many issues. First time I'm seeing secular corruption and communal corruption. This means that if Adani invests in a BJP rule state, it is common it has to be targeted. But Adani investment in Rajasthan, secular hai. Adani investment in Chhattisgarh, secular hai. Adani is given the Virinium port in Kerala, ati secular hai. <laughs> Adani is given Digi port in Maharashtra by Uddhav Sena, secular hai. Given Tajpur port in Bengal, secular hai. To ye kaise? How is Adani partly corrupt in some places and partly not corrupt? 
don't understand it. By the way, the TMC itself and the India Alliance is not one, uh, one on one page even on this. The India Alliance initially said, Malikarjun Khadge, Congress Party leader, I call him leader because I, you know, president is, <laughs> chalo, nominal president of the Congress Party said that we will either want a Supreme Court probe or a JPC in this, or, or is the functional word. Now, Supreme Court was approached by a Congress leader from Madhya Pradesh, we want probe on Adani. Supreme Court instantly asked for a probe on Adani. A committee was constituted which includes the likes of Nandan Nilekani and many other stalwarts from various uh, industries and fields including judges and former judges of the courts. The report was submitted to them. After going through that report, the committee concluded that there is nothing that is amiss in a regulatory pattern. Now once you have asked for the Supreme Court probe, your leader has gone and filed a petition in the Supreme Court for that probe. Because the result is not the desired result, you change the goalpost. And TMC, in all of this, the TMC had a very unique stand. TMC said neither Supreme Court, neither JPC, every state which has given project to Adani should investigate it in their state. Now I ask them, have they investigated in Rajasthan? Have you investigated in Chhattisgarh? Unfortunately, when I have these debates, I am having it with Supriya Shrinet. So you can know what is the response. So apart from calling us Nalika Kida, Ganda and all these abusive words, no answer comes and then this is the reality of that situation. By the way, Adani was not formed after 2014. Adani got first port, Mundra port under Congress. Adani started buying coal from Indonesia under Congress. Adani became biggest thermal power plant producer under Congress. Adani got six SEZ ports under, uh, SEZ zones under Congress. What is, what do we say about Congress? One of the uh, other interesting questions which people also ask me to ask you is that... Uh, but I did not answer about Mahua Mitra. So let me explain about Mahua. <laughs> no, because we had to explain about Adani first. So Mahua Mitra is a very interesting case. Mahua Mitra has now got two people who have confessed against her. One is her personal friend who was known to her. And the other person is her close friend, Darshan Hiranandani, who has given it on an affidavit. And both of them have said that she has taken money for asking questions on behalf of one group to target the other group. They have listed out items which were given to her, Ferragamo shoes. I don't even know the spelling. <laughs> Except for Bata shoes, I don't know which <laughs> is the simplest to spell and where. Bags, other things, money. Sorry? We'll come to Henry also. <laughs> we'll come to Henry. We have to come to Henry also. I mean, after all, dog is a man's best friend. <laughs> From the videos, it doesn't look he's her <laughs> best friend. <laughs> but anyways, I'm going to get into trouble. Huh? <laughs> I might be accused of sexism. No, anyways, uh, so this allegation was also made. And thirdly, and the most important allegation was, that there was a parliamentary login that every member of parliament has that was given over to somebody else to handle and to use it for asking whatever questions they wanted to target a particular entity or a group. And now Mohima Mitra, instead of answering these questions in the ethics committee, goes to two channels to do interviews where she has time. And you can understand what kind of interviews were done from the personalities who are interviewing her. And she goes there and she makes a claim that I gave my login, but the OTP was with me. <laughs> the giving of the login itself is an egregious offense that you have given it to somebody who's operating from foreign soil. Please imagine if it would have been a BJP MP who would have given his password login to a corporate foreign entity for in exchange of any quid pro quo. The same very people would have been dancing on the streets of Delhi that he has to resign. And today the very same people are giving justification about OTP. And finally even Mamta Banerjee does not buy all these lousy arguments. Mamta Banerjee has done two press conferences, three press conferences on Jyoti Priya Malik. There's a minister who got arrested in their government. A minister got arrested, they have done three press conferences on Mahua Moitra, they say no comments. So either they feel Mahua Moitra's battle against that group is not a legitimate battle 
or else they know what she has done. First time I have seen, I since I am a small karyakarta of BJP, I don't have a house in Delhi. So we hire a car, hire a house, rent a house. First time I have seen rent a MP. <laughs> this rent a MP model of Mahama Mitra. Imagine Nadia district people voted her, you know, they are the most uh, poorest, one of the poorest sections. They voted her, ki madam will go ask question for us. Madam went with Louis Vuitton bag and she is uh, allowing questions of Darshan Hiranandani because he lost a port to the other rival. So this is what is happening and all of this is covered under secularism and fascism ka narrative. Because Modi ji is a fascist, Darshan Hiranandani was asking questions. So Shazad, uh, uh, of course that we accept the fact, we see to this that ED and CBI are not being misused by the BJP. For a, for a minute we accept to this. But opposition also accuses the BJP, the party which you come from, of not even inviting them to the inauguration of the Ram Temple on 22. The inauguration went straight away to the Prime Minister. How do you look at this sort of a disparity? I am very happy, I am very happy that today, imagine the change in the scenario. Once upon a time, these people who constitute India Alliance, they used to say, Mile Mulayam Kanshi Ram, Hava Me Ud Gai Jai Shri Ram. Mile Mulayam Kanshi Ram, Hava Me Ud Gai Jai Shri Ram. Ab aisi sthiti aai hai, kaha hai Mulayam, kaha Kanshi Ram, sab milke bol rahe Jai Shri Ram. I am very happy. Only thing, this is not invitation given by government to Prime Minister. It has been given by Ram Shetra Trust, Ram Janbhumi Shetra Trust to Prime Minister. Now, as far as I understand, now I am a Muslim, but as far as I understand, the trust can only give the invitation to those who have belief in Prabhu Ram. Now, if you have given affidavit saying Prabhu Shri Ram does not exist, or if your leaders continue to say, and recently uh, DMK Ellen Govan has said that he is a mythical character. Hasn't he said it? And Congress has accepted it. Congress said, yes, yes, we have originally said that this is all myth. Mani Shankar Ayer said, Kaun se kamre mein? Which, which room Mr. Uh, Prabhu Shri Ram was born in? They have said that Ram Setu was destroyed by Prabhu Shri Ram itself. And they have said all kinds of statements about Prabhu Shri Ram. If they are willing to accept that all those statements are wrong and Sonia ji is ready to say Jai Shri Ram, I am sure the Ram Janbhumi Trust will consider inviting them also. But you can't invite a non-believer in a place where believers are going to gather. So, are they willing to say Jai Shri Ram? I'm sure they will be. Have they given any contribution for the mandir? I have also donated. I have also donated. What have you donated? They should show the slip if they have donated. It's a public donation. They could have donated. Uh, Shizad, but what actually disturbs me, not the fact that, I mean, these people have said Jai Shri Ram or not, but even some from your own party, mm. BJP, have at times hurt the feelings of uh, the collective uh, Hindu sentiments. For example, I'll give you one example recently. Uh, a party spokesperson from your party, uh, Gaurav Bhatia, he made some uncharitable remarks uh, against a Pakistani Hindu to the effect, I'm sure you, this is a googly for you, you may want to skip it. He I play all balls with the straight bat. I w I'm reluctant to comment on a colleague, but... No, but wh why I want to bring this comment is that those comments sparked a controversy in this country that it looked like the man was almost demeaning the efforts by a man who is fighting in his own country against oppressor regime being a sole Hindu cricketer who has represented uh, his, his country but has taken up the cudgels against a very fascist regime there. So I don't understand. Let me, let me uh, put it this way. I don't think, first of all, you should take statements of spokespersons, including mine or anybody else's on Twitter, to be uh, a serious statement by a political party. The po political party speaks through us only when it designates us to speak for it. For instance, I'm here, I'm speaking for myself. When I'm on television, the party has mandated me to speak. So consider my statements to be the party statements only when the party has mandated me. Otherwise, I may have the badge, but I don't have the mandate. Having said that, let me address the larger issue, which where I slightly differ and I can differ with my colleagues on it. I think that the principle that Mr. Bhatia extended in the tweet was that because a certain person belongs to this country, he said that we will sort out things with her 
you mind your own business and otherwise we'll throw you out of the arena or something like that he said my philosophy towards this or my approach towards this and i could be faulted for it uh, and people are free to decide which approach is right i give you a situation a terror attack is happening on india and an israeli who's not an indian citizen informs us that terror attack is going to happen because of his help we are able to stop the terror attack this is an israeli who has helped us on the other hand there is a indian daud ibrahim who has done a terrorist act inside india just because daud ibrahim is indian should i stand with daud ibrahim this is the principle it is not about who is indian afzal guru is indian yakub memon was indian daud ibrahim is indian arfa khanam sherwani is indian their acts are not indian and that person is an israeli that person is a hindu from pakistan kaneria but his acts are indian and therefore i go by acts of the person not by chance birth of a person ye to chance se paida hoge na inka to bas chalta ki kahan land hona hai to they would have landed up in some other part of the world they would have never chosen india she is indian by chance i don't stand with indians by chance because you have a daily choice to make where you run down the country you are abusing bharat you are undermining bharat and on the other side that person whose community has come down from 23% to 3% stands and defends the idea of bharat and calls out the idea of pakistan so i would rather think that an external friend is a friend of india not an internal enemy just because she happens to be indian or just because daud ibrahim happens to be indian so one last question from my side then i'll open it to the audience uh, since the session's name is also bharat first forward and uh, the theme of this event as well 2024 election just about 6 months to go from here on uh, why do you think bjp should return to power five reasons and uh, the challenges which are going to emerge uh, with the wins from by the congress in karnataka and himachal pradesh or the sitting governments in rajasthan and chatisgarh look there are many more reasons five reasons are too little but let me give you the five most prominent reasons why the bharatiya janata party should return to power or return to service we had an economist as a prime minister between 2004 to 14 the economist made us fragile five as an economy today we are the fastest five we have gone from 10 to 5 and in the next couple of years we will go to third position as an economy reason number 1 reason number 2 this country before modi took over had a sanitation coverage of 35% there weren't enough toilets and particularly for women in villages to not be able to use a toilet at your will to go in the morning or to go in the late evening because you can't go during day time the consequences it has on your health and your security the thousands and thousands and thousands of our women who have been subjected to this kind of monstrosity today we have 100% toilet coverage <laughs> women in this country were relegated to and we are a patriarchal society due to many reasons that were imposed upon us because of thousands of years of slavery otherwise this is the only country in civilization that prays to women as god and and considers a uh, female form of goddesses no other religion allows that space no other culture allows that space but because of whatever we have gone through because of that we have seen that women are subjected to fetching pail of water filling water doing house chores cooking the food and nobody cared about their health and today 10 crore ujwala cylinders and 11 crore tap water connections means that those women who are still subjected to spending their time in the kitchen can today save that time save their health and become permanent commissioned officers in the armed forces or they can take use of the nari shakti vandan adhiniyam that we have passed and come to parliament this is what modi has done for the women of this country this is the second reason the third reason is close your eyes and think once 2014 se pehle blast in chennai blast in varanasi blast in pune blast in mumbai blast in lucknow blast in delhi blast in jaipur blast in coimbatore 
all the places used to see deadly terror strikes every two or three weeks. And when 26-11 happened, and this is a story closer for us, especially you come from Maharashtra, we have lost our family and friends. We had an ineffectual government where the uh, air chief says to the prime minister, that prime minister, here are the camps. We must go bomb those camps after 26-11. And the prime minister who had to always look over his shoulder for a nod from somewhere else does not give the co-head. And we give MFN, most favored nation status to Pakistan. Today, when surgical strike takes place or when a Pulwama takes place and we do a Balakot airstrike, it is not MFN status, it is M T J status, Mu Tor Jawab status. So now Pakistan or anybody who dares to look at us will get MTJ, Mu Tor Jawab, Modi Ka Jawab. So this is third point. Fourth point, and be very honest. Prior to 2014, did you ever think Article 370 would be abrogated? Today, Article 370 has been kicked into the dustbins of history. And from Lal Kila in Delhi to Lal Chowk in Kashmir, Bharat Mata ki jai bhi bolte hain aur tiranga bhi lagata hain. Aur yeh toh Rahul ji, Rahul ji went for Bharat Jodo Yatra, although he should go for Indi Jodo Yatra. So start Indi Jodo, pehle Indi ko toh jod do. Indi wale hi lad rahe hain ek dousre se in Punjab, Delhi, etc. When Rahul ji also went there, he has confirmed. Last time uh, brother sister went, they were playing with uh, snowballs. And now when he last time went, he has said that I could only see Tiranga, Tiranga, Tiranga. When his government was there, they could only see the Pakistani flags or the ISIS flags. Today they are seeing Tiranga, Tiranga, Tiranga. First it was PPP, Parivarvad, Pakistan Parasti and Pathar Baji. Today it is DD, Development and Democracy. From three families, the power has shifted to 30,000 people who have been elected in Jammu Kashmir and by the way, they keep talking about Dalit rights, Dalit lives matter. For the first time in 70 years, with the Ashirwad of Baba Sahib Ambedkar, the Dalit Valmiki community of Jammu Kashmir has got the right to vote. So they must support it. All the Ambedkarites, etc. should support it. And last and final reason. And the last and final reason, you don't have to wait for 2024 elections. You only have to wait for January 22nd. Before this, Ram Lala was in a tambu, in a tent, and on January 22nd, Ram Lala will be in a Gagan Chumbi, Bade Se Bada Mandir, the biggest mandir in India and the world. And you think about it. First, we used to say India is recognized by what they would talk about one mausoleum, one white color mausoleum in Uttar Pradesh. Ki India ka, matla, India yehi hai. Today when we talk about India, then we show them Kashi Vishwanath Dham, we show them Mahakal Lok in Ujjain, we show them the Ram Mandir that is coming up. And for the first time after independence, in this Navaratri, for the first time near the LOC, we have had the Navaratri Puja that has taken place in the Mandir of Ma Sharda that has taken place along the LOC in Kupwada. Any of this could have been imagined in uh, before 2014 and today you can not only imagine it, you can see it happening in your eyes and therefore for this to continue, there has to be a government that believes, we don't believe in favoring anybody, we don't say tushtikaran, we say santushtikaran, whoever is there, for us it is the garib, it is the poor that we want to work for and we want to make this country a developed country, a strong country, a country with such a strong foreign policy that both Ukraine president and Russian president call up whom? Prime Minister Modi. Now also, the only country in the world and not even Mr. Biden, not even Rishi Sunak, not even Macron, not even Nanihal ki Pradhan Mantri Meloni ji, they can speak to Israel. They can't speak to Palestine. Only Prime Minister Modi can call Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu. He can have conversation with Mahmoud Abbas. He can have conversation with Jordan King. He can have conversation with Al-CC. This is because of India's credibility and clout in the last eight, nine years that has developed. And for all these reasons and many more reasons, I think the Bharatiya Janata Party has to continue to be in service of the people.
Thank you so much, Shahzad, for uh, exhilarating session and also uh, giving a prompt to most of these people in the audience to be there on January 22. I'm sure some of them will be readily agreeing to be there at the Ram Temple inauguration. Uh, we can ask some of... If, even if you're not there at the inauguration of Ram Temple, every person's mind, now a Ram Temple has been consecrated and constructed forever and that Ram Temple can never be... Uh, taken away from us ever again. Quick question, Shazad. Yes. Um, in the run-up to the elections of 2024, will a 10-year-old request, uh, a, 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 a yearning of all Hindus, will that happen? Release all Hindu temples from government control? Uh, that question won't be answered or addressed in this election simply because it's not a election issue or it is not an election subject uh, of the central government. Temple controls, if you see constitutionally speaking, strictly comes under the state list. I can assure you one thing, that the Bharatiya Janata Party government, see at many times, if you remember, there's a speech of Modi ji, he was in one of these sessions like this. And at that time, must, must have been before your CM, somebody asked him that, will you remove 370? So he said, Dekhye, janta ne abhi, how much ever Janta has given us support, it was during Vajpayee ji's government time. He said, they have given us mandate to this extent. So probably right now we can't do it with this mandate to remove 370. The day we get the required mandate, we will do it. I therefore appeal to you that give us the required mandate, not just in 2024 in the government of India, but governments of the states, and you will see that all these changes have take, will take place and will be done. I have a question for you, Shahzad. I totally understand that you're saying that 2024 is a clash of civilization and it is imperative for Bharat's future that this government comes back to power with a thumping majority. But having said that, I live in a state called Maharashtra. And where I see the compromises that are being made for the sake of getting those X number of seats and everything that you stood against as a party and everything as a citizen I stand against, those same elements are back and we are supposed to be quiet and we are supposed to, you know, even support. So tomorrow if one of the candidates stands in Pune in my constituency and I don't like him, I don't like his party, I don't like his philosophy, but just because it is 2024 election, I will vote and I will vote. But the point is, to what extent do we go for these compromises? You see, I don't call these compromises. If you see Prabhu Shri Ram, Prabhu Shri Ram is called Maryada Purushottam. Shri Krishna is not called Maryada Purushottam. He is called Leela Purushottam. Prabhu Shri Ram never broke any rules to vanquish Ravan. Prabhu Shri Krishna did not break rules, but he mended the rules so that the Kauravas could be vanquished. And therefore, I think that this is not compromise. This is inspiration from Prabhu Shri Krishna. Sometimes you have to, in the world of politics, be Leela Purushottam, not Maryada Purushottam. And at right time, right decisions are taken. Sometimes, I also tell you, it's not just for sake of small gains or small seats, etc. Many people feel that why for small number of seats you all do this. Let me give you an example of Punjab. For a very long time, we had alliance with Akali Dal. You, what did we gain in that alliance of Akali Dal? Nothing. BJP was always relegated to second position. BJP used to hardly get any positions in the government of Akali BJP. The reason why that alliance was done is because BJP put national interest, the interest of keeping Sikh Hindu solidarity intact. And therefore, we were in that alliance for a very period, long period of time. And therefore, many of these alliances, sometimes on the face of it, it looks like to be a compromise. But there are larger issues. There are large, I'm not saying in this case there must be or there must not be. In every case, it's a different situation and one examines it on that case-to-case -case basis. But there are many cases where it's not just political interest or that small short-term interest. It is the long-term interest also that parties consider and take forward. And I think the bigger achievement that has to be done is to vanquish the Kauravs and therefore Krishna ji will permit us to show a little bit of Leela in this case. Hello. Sir, we have seen uh, Article 370 gone. When will we see uh, 
యూనిఫామ్ సివిల్ కోడ్ ఐ థింక్ దోస్ హూ వీ వీ ఆల్రెడీ హ్యావ్ యూనిఫామ్ సివిల్ కోడ్ ఇట్స్ దేర్ ఇన్ ద కాన్స్టిట్యూషన్ ఆల్రెడీ బై ద వే ద యూనిఫామ్ సివిల్ కోడ్ ఇస్ ఆల్రెడీ పార్ట్ ఆఫ్ ద కాన్స్టిట్యూషన్ ఆ ఫౌండింగ్ ఫాదర్స్ పుట్ ఇట్ ఇన్ దాట్ ఇట్ ఈస్ అబౌట్ ఇంప్లిమెంటేషన్ ఆఫ్ యూనిఫామ్ సివిల్ కోడ్ and as far as the implementation of uniform civil code is concerned the bharatiya janata party has gone extremely ahead in uttarakhand wherein the drafts have been created in assam we have started one version of it in gujarat we have taken it forward because these are direct ucc currently comes under directive principles of state policy so it would be better for state governments to take it forward and having said that even at the central level as you know as you must be aware the law commission started a fresh discussion on it although first it had rejected it now the law commission commissioned another study its report is in the stage of finalization once the report comes obviously the government will consider that report and will take forward steps on that but the question today should be that on the principle of ucc where does everyone stand we stand with the principle of ucc we stand with the constitution of india but the congress party has always and always in the sake of vote bank politics has subjected women to the altar of this political game in shahbanu you know what they did against the supreme court verdict in shaira banu when the triple talaq verdict came they were standing against it in goa the ucc came through the portuguese but it was then there and the congress government was there so how come that ucc was secular and today we say that let's the, let there be ucc you say it's communal or it's to target a community and by the way whoever opposes ucc uniform civil code you tell them only one thing we accept we will not have ucc then why should we have uniform criminal code also i think somebody's criminal code says chori karoge to hath katenge rape karoge to kuch aur hoga consequence then if you belong to that category that should be the treatment to you and if some ravi or kishan or some other person is caught robbing his thing will be different will they accept they don't want uniform criminal code indian penal code is uniform criminal code why those people who are saying ucc aayega to it will be communal project it will be against our faith they never said for uniform criminal criminal code which is already existing so this is their hypocrisy <coughs> <clears throat> yes i'm not sure the supreme court has given any such direction to the center so they have submitted a no no there's no direction from the supreme court as far as i'm my knowledge goes i don't think there but let me address the larger issue the de- there is no definition of minorities in our constitution by the way our constitution is absolutely silent on the definition of minorities it refers to minorities in two contexts linguistic and cultural minorities that's the only reference to it the supreme court subsequently has come up with a definition of minorities interpreting various laws that anybody whose population is above 50% constitutes a minority but then that calculation of that tabulation i would argue why should it be done at a national level it should be done at a state level so if you do that tabulation because if you do it at a national level then you result in a situation where a particular community is a majority in one state but it enjoys the benefits of being a minority because it's a minority at a national level and whereas a community may be a majority in a national level or national context but in several states across the country they are in a minority and therefore they would deserve the rights of being a minority and frankly i think that there should be no categorization of majority and minority first of all this country needs to get out of this sense there is no majority and minority there is one majority and then there is second majority i mean if you, after being 20 crores you consider yourself minority then i think you have to examine the entire narrative how come no jain or parsi ever says i am in minority and i remember shefali has spoken quite a bit on parsis and where we come from parsis are thriving and they are richest pune wala the, the real pune wala and the serum institute and the vaccines they don't they don't see them this minority complex we have to get out of 
all people have to get out of that we are in a minority. Uh, the only minority in this country are the poor people of this country who need the hand holding, who the Prime Minister is giving hand holding to. Let me address this in a little detail. First of all, let me draw a parallel which these Islamists get so wild when they are on television debates with me. They keep crying, we are crying for Palestine, we are crying for Palestine. I say fair enough. India's position is that we support a two-state theory where Israel and Palestine peacefully coexist, peacefully coexist, and this entire situation is resolved through a negotiated peace settlement. There's no space for violence. Anyways. So I asked them, why do you support Palestine? Are nahi, Palestine par jo kabja hua hai, itna dard hai. Okay. Kabja hua hai, occupied land hai. Haan, occupied land. Yeah. Who's occupied it? The Israelis have occupied it. I say then, um, a few thousand years ago, what was Kashmir? Hindu majority or Muslim majority? Pinned up silence. I said they had seven genocides. Pinned up silence. And the last genocide was under your government, Congress government. Pinned up silence. I said, forget it. We are not telling the Kashmiri Hindus to arm themselves like Hamas and do what they do. Sanskriti or Mansikta ka antar hai. Kuch log bum or goli ki hi bhasha jante hai. Kuch log boli se jante hai. To jiski jo bhasha, jiski jo Sanskriti wo wahi karega. Ab Hamas ki Sanskriti parvarish, their entire orientation is towards war and destruction. So they will pick up a gun. And the Kashmiri Hindu or the Hindu community's entire orientation is towards construction, not destruction. So he will not pick up a gun. He will make another bigger, better place wherever he settles. And that is the history of Hindus. But I said, for argument's sake, for argument's sake, should we allow the Kashmiri Hindus to go and claim their occupied land in the manner in which Hamas claims that it is doing? Nahi, nahi, bhai sahab, aisa to nahi ho sakta. So, you know, this is the hollowness of their, first of all, their argument. Secondly, as far as the Kashmiri Hindu issue is concerned, the Kashmiri Hindu issue will not be solved by building a conclave or one rehabilitation center. Before rehabilitation should be repentance. Punar vas se pehle paschataab zaruri hai. If they see Kashmiri files as a movie and they say this is propaganda, the Kashmiri Hindu, how will he go to a place, to a person who denies the entire genocide committed against him? You tell me, can a Jew be settled in a place where the person says Holocaust did not happen? <coughs> if I am a Holocaust denier and I say the Holocaust never happened to you, Jew, how will the Jew live with me? Because he will always feel a sense of threat and I will always see him as an oppressor. No, even though the reality is that he is the oppressor, I am the oppressor. And this mindset has to change. And this mindset change has to be effected and this change of mindset will not happen in five years. Okay. It's a mindset that actually does not even date back to just 70 years. It's a mindset that goes back thousands of years. And therefore this thousand year mindset has to be cleansed and has to be oriented to the philosophy of Bharat, where the philosophy of Bharat is that all right, now we are in a constitutional scheme. We are not in a scheme where people capture each other's lands. So we have to move by constitutional means. But even in that constitutional means, everywhere where there, was, there has been a settlement, there has been truth and reconciliation. At the beginning, when apartheid ended, there was truth and reconciliation to acknowledge what happened to the Afri black community. Unless you acknowledge and unless you repent that this was happening, this happened when you shouted Ralif Salif Gali from the masjid and you said either you leave or you leave with your wives being left here or your daughters being left here. If you don't leave, we will kill you like we killed Mr. Ganju, like we killed Mr. Tikku. Unless you repent that because you are all partners in it. 
there is no it was not done by one terrorist it was supported by the entire civil society read the papers including the newspapers that was run by congress people exactly the same language that was used against the jews before the holocaust was used against the kashmiri hindus and therefore till the time you acknowledge it it can't be solved and therefore i feel that the way to solving any crisis is the acknowledgement of the situation and that's when you can then think of settling them whether in conclaves or other ways that is secondary first you acknowledge you have done something so egregious to a community in the name of religion एकाद आईआईटी में जाएंगे तो एकाद की डिग्री सर्टिफिकेट कैंसिल करने का बोल देना आप वहां पे गेट माई जो आई थिंक यू नो अनफॉर्चुनेटली आई थिंक इट्स अ I don't think I don't look at issues as religion specific. I look at them as mindset specific. I believe a lot of people in the match of Pakistan versus Afghanistan were very disappointed, and this was a very educated crowd that had gone to watch the match. Were very disappointed. Pakistan lost. I mean, why? And even if somebody supporting a team because it's your religious preference in Pakistan, Afghanistan, technically you should have supported Afghanistan. They are more hardcore when it comes to those faith and beliefs. Anyway, so it's not about religion. It's just about political convenience and i think this poison needs to be removed and cleansed and that poison will take some time i'll give you an example of it just one last example because i can see that they want to move on with the sessions the one example today i give you is that there was a time in jammu kashmir where you have seen the kind of reaction a lot of things gave uh, there was stone pelting today the stone pelting has stopped terrorism is down to two or three districts of course they attack some places but the number of terrorists who can join is is very very low and now if you know the recent uh, shahadat that took place there was a official of the jammu kashmir police you have you all heard about uh, rifleman aurangzeb so you see there are people who eulogize aurangzeb and they go to his qabr and there is also an aurangzeb with the same name fighting for maa bharti so it is more about which mindset you want to keep and that change will happen it is happening in jammu kashmir after the abrogation article 370 it was a marvelous session with you sir thank you i call upon shrimati aishwarya s rao to felicitate shahzad punawali ji and mr unni to facilitate roshan dua ji Exploring the civilization ethos we have Sri Raghava Krishna ji founder of Bharat in Indic thinker and speaker along with Sri Shrimati Vaishnavi Guru Shankar founder of Unicorn Club columnist of the Veranda Club author and educator on the launch of her new book Bharatyam science behind Hindu practices and way of life i'm sure this book is going to make all of us think I call upon Shafali Vaidya ji along with Professor Kanaga Sabhapati ji and Manoshi ji to release the book.
Hari Om. I think it's, uh, I don't know if it was by design or by uh, accident. There seems to be a sense of fire and ice. You know, you fire up the political uh, dimensions and then you try and cool it down with the cultural dimensions. Maybe Shefali ji, with her weaving experience and, you know, the passion for weaves, uh, might have weaved it this way. But this is really a pleasure to talk about uh, some of the work that needs to happen at the societal level. We cannot leave and expect that the state and the politicians will take care of all of that. We should, of course, uh, be smart about uh, our choices. Uh, but there is a more fundamental problem that all of us face today, uh, just as ordinary practicing Hindus. For the first time in the history of our long civilization, perhaps, we are not sure about transmitting our values and our culture to our next generation. And I plan to submit, uh, and I hope I'll be able to persuade you, uh, the fact that it is as big, if not a bigger problem, than, uh, than the matter of elections, whether it is state or central. Right? The, uh, the challenge that we have is, we had certain institutions of cultural transmission. I spoke about uh, three institutions uh, as the fundamental basis for civilization in a quick response. First one is family, which is where the fundamental nurturing space is given. The second is the Gurukula or the education system. Uh, we all know the problems there. And the third is where the civilization bought all aspects of cultural transmission through the process of socialization together in a temple. Because the temple is the place where the art and aesthetics, the socio-cultural ethos, the ecological concerns, the uh, mystical dimensions, the religious dimensions, and of course the spiritual traditions flourished. All of those things were held together in this sacred space called temple. And today, all of these three institutions are under immense stress deliberately because of a global cultural production engine. And today, when we look at some of the mechanisms that we need to protect ourselves, uh, we also need some way of uh, producing thought and then producing action. And I'm really honored to speak to somebody who, through her life journey, is giving us something to actually help us make sense of our culture. The, uh, the macro problem, Vaishnaviji, and I would like for you to touch upon this, seems to be that uh, we moved uh, or we are moving from an experiential tradition to an explanatory tradition as a civilization. When you and I perhaps were growing up, uh, if our parents took us to a temple and asked us to go around three times, we would first do that. The question is not why three times, why right to left, why not five? We would do that, take the prasada, get the experience, and then that is embodied. We don't need a validation for that, you don't need a science for that, because it is embodied cognition. But today, because of education, because of public culture, we've invested so much in the cognitive analytical dimension that the kids will first ask you, uh, why not uh, five times, why not left to right? And I gather that your own inspiration in coming up with this cultural offering is your own life journey as a parent. Please talk to us through that. Thank you, Ji. Uh, it's so true uh, that you said, uh, you know, this happened to me uh, with my daughter. I was, uh, it's one of our uh, tradition to light lamps in the evening, Three, uh, 5, 30, 6, we all light lamps. So one day I was asking her to light a lamp. She's like, why are we lighting? So I was just telling her, you know, the sun is setting, all the birds are going to, uh, you know, they're, uh, it's Sandhya Kal, they're all flying back to uh, their nests. So, you know, we, it's time for us to settle down. So you know, we're giving light when there's no light. So all that, she's like, oh, then it's just easy to switch on the light switch. Why do you have to light the diya? Uh, the, you know, light, when you switch on the light, it's even more uh, brighter than a small. So then uh, I was, uh, me being me, uh, I did not, uh, you know, mostly some parents, they would not have patience. You know, even I feel our parents were more patient than how uh, we were. Uh, so, so then I thought, okay, okay, switch on the light. Okay, now switch it off. And then I asked her, you know, okay, let's do my way. Uh, you know, how, uh, let's light the diya. So then uh, you can't go to a puja room just like that. Yeah. Wash your feet, your uh, face. So then, yeah, and then the whole process of, you know, chanting a mantra, whatever mantra and so that's how, uh, then I asked her, you know, now how do you feel? What's the difference? Like you switched on, you, on the light switch. Now you did all this. So now how do you feel? Ah, I feel a little calm. So we, uh, we are in a place to explain every little thing. Uh, of course, this was why we were all uh, practicing. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, simple things like lighting a lamp is spiritual. Yeah. 
deeply connected to our uh, souls at a uh, spiritual level. But nowadays, we are at a position to kind of give answers to everything just to justify that we are, what we are doing is right. Uh, I, I feel it's, it's, it's sad. At the same time, it's challenging as well. And it is needed at, uh, in this uh, juncture because, uh, uh, you know, a lot of exposure to the children at young age. And I think uh, this kind of an explanation is needed. So I think these are, uh, you know, all projects of cultural entrepreneurship are fundamentally, uh, you know, personal motivations. This is not about saving the world uh, first up. It is about realizing that you have a challenging situation in your own home. The battle has come within. And there is a bit of institutional architecture to why this happens, if you were to understand uh, the world of design, the world of motivations. Uh, we are living through a culture, and culture is always mimetic, in the sense that culture is copied, and that's how culture uh, percolates. Today, the mechanisms of that mimetic desire, or the ability to replicate and proliferate, are not ours. You have digital mediums where you have performative rituals of a liberal kind. You have educational spaces which are entirely secular. And you have increasingly urbanized uh, societies which are delinked and decoupled from the local traditions. So you are fighting against a global infrastructure. And that is a challenge that Hindu parents suddenly face because this has happened within a generation. We are not, in fact, uh, if today I were to follow a festival ritual, I will have to call my parents and ask them what is the charya and to understand the idea of charya that you just gave us, that you actually have a tool of transformation. It is not just as easy as switching the light, but the fact that when you go through this, there is a transformation in your consciousness. And like I said, when you go into that sacred space, you realize that you are more mindful. And that is what they've done to the entire land. That is why we are one civilization. The kshetras, the yatras, the tirthas were all tools of transformation so that you and I connect not as a political identity alone, we connect in far deeper ways, and that is what welds all of these things together. But the fundamental unit where this happens is still the family, and that is what you recreated for us. So this is about the ritual of the puja, and you actually use that as an inspiration to help us understand all of the cultural practices. I think there are about 25 different examples. So talk us through the structure of this book and, what, uh, and how this book should be read. So um, these, this book has... Uh, topics from uh, why idol worship because again I feel a lot of uh, kids uh, I talk to a lot of parents who are also facing similar uh, problems you know why we should go to a temple uh, why idols uh, is uh, God really there if I cut open the uh, idol what will I find inside so th this kind of uh, questions and they are like, you know, they are, you know, we talk to each other and how are you dealing with this? What are you, what answers do you tell your kids? Yeah. So uh, that's, uh, that's why like so many articles like that got inspired through, you know, just talking with other uh, parents. Uh, so the basic thing is like uh, our culture, uh, we believe in the cyclical seeing this like is a, it's not a positive sign exactly. it is not a positive sign 
pride. Yes. You know, you, I come from this culture and you have to wear your uh, uh, culture, uh, you know, with pride. So certain, uh, those, most of the articles deal with, uh, the, uh, you know, instilling pride in our culture and why we do uh, certain practices that way and some have science behind it. So uh, I've combined science, a little bit of uh, mythology, uh, stories uh, to put my uh, point forward. I think Shefaleji will tell us that uh, the Bindi thing is actually <laughs> a civilizational battle that she's been fighting, even with corporates, not just uh, you know individuals and at homes. I think this idea that you had about uh, using each word of the language as a story, while you're teaching, of course, you're positioning this as science, but you also spoke about transcending science. You do it because that is how you do it. You don't owe an explanation to do it. And you do it because that gives you a sense of belonging, that gives you a sense of propriety, that gives you a sense of identity, and that gives you a connect to the larger civilization because culture at the end of the day is which behaviors are sanctioned, what behaviors are punished. That's what it boils down to, whether it's an organization or in a nation. What you've also done very, very interestingly is use the power of storytelling to help our kids understand. And I think that's another area of our struggle because the questions are logical, but the human uh, uh, hardwiring to understand and make meaning is through stories. We don't understand concepts. We understand, in fact, in the Indian pedagogical tradition, we talk about three levels of teaching. The first one is the Prabhu Samhita, which is the Shastra or the conceptual learning. Right? Only 5% maybe will understand that. But Shastra becomes your friend in Itihasa. It is the Mitra Samhita to make sure that majority of us understand by relating to the personalities. And the third level is the Kanta Samhita, which is the poetic or the poetry and the beauty and aesthetics. I think you combine all elements. You gave the principles where it need to be given, but you also use the power of storytelling and the power of storytelling in the mother tongue and linking it to actual experiences that your kid can relate to. So through that, you also created a universal experience for all of us as parents. So talk to us about your thinking behind that. So um, basically during the COVID uh, times, um, I came up with this idea because I, uh, I do not, I don't know Hindi. I find it so difficult to cross Tamil Nadu. I'm like the language, even for a vacation to ask for food, tea, I, I uh, suffer. So I didn't want that to happen to my uh, child. So I've, I've enrolled her in Hindi, but I didn't want her to uh, miss out on the beautiful uh, Tamil language as well. So I took upon uh, myself. So I wanted to make it as interesting as possible uh, to her. Um, but at the same time, I wanted her to know our stories uh, from, uh, you know, uh, Tamil culture. So I, uh, I, for each alphabet, I, you know, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a prince, uh, you know, searching, uh, going, uh, searching for, uh, you know, uh, he had a, he had to collect some for stars. Or, yeah, he, we, he went for an adventure. So like that, so a, a, every character he meets, uh, like for example, um, uh, for I, you had, uh, you know, the, she, he fell in front of an Ayapa uh, deity. So it's something connected to uh, mythology. So, U, yeah, form, form yeah. yeah. And for U, it's, uh, you know, uh, your, uh, Udad, we say Udad Paichi, so something like yoga. So there's a person who talks about uh, yoga and, uh, to the prince. So things like that about our culture. So that's how I, uh, like she learned uh, the language. So this is something that uh, she, she uh, the thing is um, when you tell our stories, it's more connected uh, uh, for the kid. It's, yeah. she connects it better yeah. rather than, you know, yeah. uh, so our stories, because that's what, that is our mother tongue. We think uh, that's, yes, so that's, a, that's. A so uh, in the interest of time, I'll wrap it up, but uh, it looks very simple, but it is one of the biggest creative acts to be able to teach children, right? And uh, coming from the world of game development, where I uh, worked for almost a decade and a half, trying to create experiences that people engage with uh, you know, whether the medium is physical or digital, it's an extremely tough creative challenge. And there are three principles that actually all creative uh, professionals, particularly those in design, 
try to anchor on because that is the holy grail of a good product. The first one is autonomy. Autonomy in the sense that your design has to give the agency and the choice to the person who is using it. You don't design it for your hero's journey. You make the person who is using your product the hero through your experience design. The second is relatability. The point about language that you just mentioned. If there is a dissonance between what is given to me as a user experience and the world that I live in, the world that I inhabit, there is friction. And that is never going to be engaging. And the third one is purpose. Through demonstration of my skill, through demonstration of my cognitive ability, I should then be able to set my own goals and pursue them. When I think about it from you know, the massive design language that we get, we don't think about these principles, but in your creation, you've used all of these principles. You've used the power of storytelling. You have provided the agency for your child to discover. You've made sure that the skill that she would demonstrate through that is valued and she will get a feedback. And lastly, through that, there is a purpose that is generated for her. And there is a larger societal benefit that comes out of this because she will then be able to understand the literature, the language, and all of the ideas that come to her from this culture. This is given to us for, for us. Uh, you know, we are today living in a nation state, political identity culture, but uh, 9th century poet Rajashekara in Kavya Mimamsa, he said the way the civilization was fused was that the prince of literature married the princess of poetry and together they went on a journey. And as far as they could travel became Bharata Varsha. What does this mean? Just think about the beauty. It's not a language, it's not one skin color, it's not a race. It is the geocultural identity that was welded on the basis of ideas. That audacity of our ancestors to create something that of this magnitude just on the basis of uh, creative agency is the power that we have in our civilization. That if we speak of diversity, so many languages, so many food habits, that is not accidental. It is coming to you because that agency was exercised by your ancestors. If you don't have that metaphysics, you don't have diversity. If you don't have diversity, you don't have life. Thank you for you know, bringing all these diverse stories to us in one book for our children. We heard about Kutikahani yesterday. We are hearing about this. I think the most delightful aspect of this entire exercise and experience for me was that we've created something for our children that is cultural. Thank you. Namaste. <laughs> Thank you, sir and ma'am. I call upon Brahmacharya Guru Priya Chaitanya Ji to felicitate Sri Raghava Krishna Ji and Mr. Dinesh Rodi to felicitate Sri Mati Vaishnavi Guru Shankar Ji. A quick reminder that the books will be available in the Subhu bookstall for sale. Sit back and observe Srimati Shefali Vaidya's special presentation on Trishutri of Bharat's soft power, temples, textiles and travel. Hello. Namaskar. I don't like that podium because I'm too short and, you know, only my face shows. So it's like a disembodied head talking. So my topic today is temples, textiles and travel, the three sutri of Bharatiyata. I dedicate this talk to Sri Ranga Hariji, to the memory of Sri Ranga Hariji. There's a reason for it. His last book was about the Prithvi Sukta and my speech actually has a lot of references to Prithvi Sukta and when Nandakumarji told me that Ranga Hariji's last book was about a commentary on Prithvi Sukta, I take it as a personal benediction to me, his final uh, book. So uh, I'm basically a storyteller. Before I go on to my topic, I want to start with an anecdote. 
last year during pitru paksha 15 days i was traveling through five different indian states my home state of goa the place where i stay maharashtra tamil nadu madhya pradesh and assam just in 15 days the people there they look different from each other obviously they spoke different languages they ate different kind of food they uh, they they had uh, different kind of uh, things in pretty much every way but yet in all these five states they offered tarpanam to their ancestors and they offered tarpanam to their ancestors to the tune of the same sanskrit chants which were the same from tamil nadu to assam and this is not a phenomenon of 2022 our people have been doing it for thousands of years and that is the sutra that binds Bharat together. There is a fashion these days of saying and uh, Nanda Kumarji spoke about it of uh, deracinated journalists and even politicians coming up with saying that there was no Bharat before the British left. There was no Bharat before 1947. We are just an artificial uh, construct that the British left. There was no such country called Bharata Varsha. Not true. Bharata Varsha as a civilizational concept, as a civilizational whole has been in existence in India since the beginning of time. And Raghav has spoken a little about it. So let me go to the Prithvi Sukta, which is a 63 hymn Sukta dedicated to the motherland, to the Matra Bhumi in the Atharva Veda. It starts off by saying, Mata Prithvi Putroham. Mother is the earth. They say earth, they don't say Bharata in that particular hymn. They talk about Bharata later. But in 63 hymns, they describe the country as a country that was the venue of Vishnu Dev's exploits, as the sacred land that Indra protected as the land that is full of Udyamis, that is entrepreneurs, full of Krishaks, that is agriculturists, and full of Shilpins, that is artists. They describe the land as a land peopled with ice snow clad mountains on one side and a Samudra on the other side. They talk about a land which is watered by fertile rivers. They talk about the land which has so many khanijas, so many mineral deposits. They talk about the land that is sanctified by yajyas. All this, tell me, what other land could it describe? Can you think of any other land, any other matrabhumi that description, this description would fit? Anyone? Name one country, one other country to which this description fits, everything that I've said. They were describing Bharat without mentioning Bharat and they were saying that this is our holy land, this is our Pavitra Bhumi, this is the Bhumi of Bharat and I am her son, the Rishi who wrote, who composed this hymn and that is the Sutra of Bharatiyata that has held this country together since the time of the Vedas. The Vishnu Dharma Purana, of course, Rishi Loma Harshana, he describes Bharat as Bharat and he says that from the Himalayas in the north to the sea in the south, Bharat is the Varsha, the land that falls in between is Bharat and the people who live here, Bharati Tatra Santati, people who live here are known as Bharatis, we are her children. This is Bharat. So what has been keeping this country together? What is the glue? What is that one thing that is keeping this very diverse country, which is diverse in every which way? It's diverse geographically, it's diverse in languages, it's diverse in cuisines, it's diverse in lokachara, it's diverse in multitude of ways. But it still was a civilizational whole. So what was that one thing that was keeping this country together? That is dharma. And dharma as manifested in three things, temples, textiles, and travel to temples and textiles. How? I'll explain it to you in a bit. And this is not just me saying it. Foreign travelers to this country have been saying it for more than 2000 years. 
from Pliny the Elder, who, came, who wrote about India 2000 years ago, where he has praised India's textiles, to uh, Huan Sang, who came to Bharat 1300 years ago, and who traveled the length and breadth of Bharat, and he has talked about the places of pilgrimage, he's talked about the Kumbh Mela, he's talked about going to Kanchi, he's talked about going to Banaras. To Al Biruni, who visited India 1000 years ago, he has also made detailed notes about Bharatiya culture, about Bharatiya clothing, about Bharatiya way of worship, about temples. To Tavernier, who visited Bharat almost 500 years ago, and he has also mentioned the same thing. And he has mentioned something very important. He is saying that in all the other countries, he was a Frenchman who was traveling to India through many other countries, and he is actually saying that in all the countries that he visited, the elite, the richest, the most fashionable people were wearing clothes made in India. They were so highly in demand, they were so expensive, and they were considered so fashionable that the richest, most educated, most cultured people in all of these countries would say that I will wear clothes only made in India. That was another thing that held Bharat together. Now, how did this tradition of pilgrimage to temples come into being? When did it come into being? It has been in existence in India for thousands of years because when the rishis describe the land so accurately, define the borders so well, they even, the Prithvi Sukta also says that this land is peopled by people who speak different languages and Nana Dharmani is the phrase that they use. They have different ways of worship. How could they have discovered this if they had not visited the length and breadth of India? It's just not physically possible. So our rishis, our siddhas, our tapasis had traveled across the length and breadth of India in pilgrimages and they had established these holy tirthas, which a tirtha, by the way, in Sanskrit is a place where you can cross over. You can cross over from where? Not the road. You can cross over from the secular plane, from the material plane, into a sacred plane, into a higher plane. Those were the places of transmission, uh, I mean transformation. Those were the places where you would go because the, the act of doing pilgrimage to these places would fundamentally transform you. Those were places which already had high divine energy and over the thousands of years where the Siddhas meditated, where the Rishis meditated, where the devotees went and prayed with all their heart, the energy just kept on increasing. Which is why when you go to a pilgrimage, when you go to a Tirtha like Kedarnath or Rameshwaram, you find a different kind of energy. And if you let it transform yourself, it will transform you. If you are a Shiva Bhakta, you could go to Rameshwaram, you could go to Kedarnath, you could go to Somnath, you could go to Kashi. All of these places are located in the four different corners of the country. And it was the devout Hindu's dream to visit all these four places and there were certain rituals made for it like you were supposed to get Ganga water from Kashi and you were supposed to do Abhishekam to the Lingam in Rameshwaram uh, uh, with the water and this is a practice that is followed by thousands and thousands hundreds of thousands of people in India even today a few years ago when I'd gone to Hampi I met people from a small village in MP they were traveling they had some I think almost hundred buses and they were traveling, they had started their journey from the village in Madhya Pradesh, then they had gone to Kashi, and from Kashi they were carrying Ganga water, and they were going all the way to Rameshwaram. And they were traveling the way Tirthayatris do. They carried their food, they carried their stuff, they had no place to stay, they had not booked hotels or anything. They would just stop near a temple, near a Tirthakshetra, do darshan at the temple, and camp outside near that, take a bath in the river, cook for themselves, do darshan, move on next day to the next temple. And that time they had come to Hampi to do the darshan at Virupaksha. After that they were supposed to go further down south. So this is what 
S. N. Agarwal, who has written a monumental book on the pilgrimages of India, has described as the great civilizational churn. When people travelled from their hometowns to places of pilgrimage in ancient times, they often travelled on foot. Sometimes they carried their food. Sometimes they were reliant on the hospitality of the people they met along the way. and they stayed there there was a lot of exchange happening they were talking they were exchanging notes on cuisine they were exchanging music they were exchanging they were singing bhajans they were exchanging literature and that is how this great concept known as bharatiyata was slowly taking shape now where do textiles come here if you study the textile clusters in india even today you will realize that many of the textile cluster clusters even today are in and around temple towns when huen sang had come to india in 643 ce he has spoken about textile clusters in kanchi there is a textile cluster in kanchi even today he has talked about a textile cluster in kashi there is a textile cluster in kashi even today he has talked about textile textile clusters in puri they exist even today even today temple towns in the south like shri kalahasti they still have their own crafts their own weaves their own uh, idiom of art it's continuing even today despite so many transitions despite so many transitions of political power because that is what keeps bharat together and consider the diversity if you were a shiva bhakta you would go to the shiva temples scattered across the country if you were a shakta or a devi bhakta you had 108 shakti peethas to go to starting from hinglaj which is in today's baluchistan all the way to kamakhya which is right at the other end of the country in assam if you were a vishnu bhakta you had to go to badri you had to go to dwarka you had to go to ayodhya you had to go to shrirangam again the deity is common the the god that you worship is sri vishnu but the ways of worship the architecture of the temple is different but the divine energy the transformative power of the place is the same that is why you have the concept of 108 divya desams where the alwar sang 108 vishnu temples so imagine those days how they must have traveled all the way to rudraprayag or all the way to badri from tamil nadu and sang the uh, sang the song sang the, the divya pravandam songs there how was it even possible it was possible because this entire country breathed the same air of bharatiyata we are a culture where in kanchipuram there is a very very beautiful temple called kailashnath koil i don't know how many people uh, have seen it that was built by the pallavas who ruled from kanchi now they had a intergenerational rivalry with the chalukyas of badami for generations so one generation kanchi would win the pallavas would win another generation the vatapi kings would win so the king of vatapi um, vikramaditya he vikramaditya won he defeated the king of kanchi and he came to kanchi like a victor now we know of history where foreign invaders when they enter a city like a victor what do they do the first thing they do is they destroy every place of worship that belongs to the vanquished they loot they plunder they burn they rape they take people as slaves what did vikramaditya do he went to the kailasnath koil he said i have heard that there is this very beautiful koil here i want to see it he went and saw the temple and he was so enamored by the beauty of it by the beauty of the carvings that he said in my kingdom i want to build a temple which is just like this but which is even better and then he went he probably carried some of the shilpins from here and he built a temple known as the virupaksha temple at patadakal which is based on the same similar kind of architecture as the kailashnath koil the story doesn't end here and mind you the kailashnath koil is named after mountain kailas which is 3000 kilometers away from kanchi most people who were building the temple probably hadn't even seen hadn't even been anywhere beyond 100 kilometers of their uh, village or where they hailed from but they still named the temple after the lord of kailasa 
So anyway, to continue the story, the political wheel took another turn, and the Rashtrakutas defeated the Chalukyas. And the Rashtrakutas saw these temples, both these temples actually, and they said, we want to build an even bigger temple in our territory, but we want it even more different and something that nobody can copy. So they built a very similar temple, but they carved it out of a monolithic rock and they called it the Kailash Temple of Elora, which exists in Maharashtra today. That is a three-story temple which is carved top down from a single hill like the Mahabalipuram temples. Again, they named it after the Lord of Kailashnath. That is our culture. We do not destroy. We add. We create. So, this tradition of yatras and pilgrimages has been in continuance in Bharat for thousands of years. When Yuan Sang talks about the Magamela in Prayag, he says that so many people had come here to take a bath at the holy confluence of the Ganga and the Yamuna and the Saraswati. How did they get to know? How did they get to know that it's a month of Mag? How did they get to know that this is the precise planetary position where they need to come here and take a bath? There was no WhatsApp in those days. There were no phone calls. There was no social media. There was no way to gather everybody on Twitter saying that, hey, we are going to worship in this place. But people still made it at the right time, at the right point, at the right precise location, at the right precise planetary con uh, configuration to take a bath. That is because that is civilizational knowledge that is very, very deeply embedded within us. So where did this stupid idea of there is no India before the British, there was no country before the British left, where did it come from? First time it started by one guy called John Strake, who was a civil servant and he every time he gave a orientation to the newer people who used to work under him, he used to start with this thing that there was never an India, there never is an India and there never will be an India. Because it was, a, it was a narrative convenient to him. If he could establish that there was no country to begin with, it's just a con con conglomeration of places, then it makes the British rule legitimate. That is the same reason why they came up with this Aryan invasion theory also. If you establish that the first people who came here were colonizers from outside, that somehow legitimizes the British coming here and colonizing us. So this was a massive lie that was told to us about there never was any India before and there never will be any India. And sadly, that is a life, that is a lie that is being, parent, being parroted even today. So all this is talk. I want to show you how we are one, how we were always one. I can show it to you in a very nice, colorful way through the journey of a motif, the peacock. Only one, because I don't have the time. And once you see that, you will know that this is one motif that has been with us as a civilization, as a culture, since the Sindhu Saraswati civilization days. It is a motif that is common to our, our scriptures. It is a motif that is common to our literature. It is a motif that is common to temple architecture. It is a motif common to paintings. It is a motif common to dance, music. You name it, all the arts and crafts that we have, the peacock is present. And it is the most colorful ambassador of our culture. Move on. Uh, so this is peacock in a Tanjur style painting. Next please. So we see the pictorial representation of the peacock as a motif for the first time in the cave paintings of Bhimbetka where you can see that there is a man who is trying to uh, probably hunt the peacock. Next please. Now we come to Sindhu Saraswati civilization pottery where if you see on the right you will see a peacock and there is something inside its stomach. Now. Experts have been saying that the painting inside the peacock's stomach is actually a soul. So the peacock had a function, had an auspicious religious function. He would take the Atman, the Sukshma Sharira, from one life to another 
and that is again a basic civilizational concept the concept of punarjanma the concept of the sukshma sharira leaving the stula sharira when physical death happens and moving on to a newer loka moving on to a newer life next please now we come to peacock in dharma in temple sculptures and you see that we see peacock everywhere in the south part of bharat as the vahana of skanda and this is a very very beautiful swami malai bronze of skanda sitting on a parrot on a peacock and you will see this different kind of peacocks being depicted whenever skanda is depicted next please this is the peacock on the torana of sanchi this is a much 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 earlier uh, structure and you can see that how stylistically the peacock has been portrayed now this peacock is very different the portrayal of it the actual physical sculpting of it is very different from the peacock we saw earlier as a vahana of skanda but you know that that was also a peacock this is also a peacock that is again a very essential characteristic of indian art where as long as you keep to the broad concept you have enough creative freedom to converge and diverge so you see that in music also for example a same karnatic kriti if ms subalakshmi sings it and if maharaj puram sandaram sings it there will be slight differences but the raga will be the same the shruti will be the same the aroha avroha will be the same but the individual artist also has the creative freedom to diverge and then converge to diverge and then converge next please now this is again a very very beautiful depiction of uh, skanda in aihole where he is actually fighting sura padman and you can see that his body language it is so aggressive it is so lively it is so active and even the peacock the the kind of expression that the peacock has it's also very ferocious it's a very beautiful bird it's a very calming bird and it is used as a very calming bird in a lot of places but here even the mount of skanda is very war like next please this is a beautiful peacock on the hoysala temple there is a entire line where they have the peacocks and the musicians and here the peacock is a thing of beauty it is depicting beauty it is depicting serenity it is depicting the good things in life pleasurable things in life next please this is a surasundari and she is holding a peacock because peacocks were kept as pets as well in royal households and she is see see her grace see the way she is standing see how she is holding the peacock and how calmly the peacock is looking the whole uh, the whole overwhelming mood of this sculpture is very uh, very gentle very beautiful very feminine next please uh, this this one this one i think it is an aihole next please this is uh, in uh, himachal pradesh yeah this is in jageshwar or bageshwar i forgot where this i went recently and i have so many photos on my phone that i'm kind of getting jumbled but this is definitely either bageshwar or jageshwar group of temples in uttarakhand ha jageshwar so next please this is on the fort in jaisalmer now here it's a pure decorative element there is no auspiciousness attached to this this is secular architecture this is not temple sculpture this is uh, the palace but even there they've used the peacock motif because the peacock motif symbolizes pur purity it symbolizes passion it symbolizes beauty next please this is actually outside india this is the famous peacock window in baktapur in nepal those who have gone will know this is to tell you that bharatiyata is not limited to what are the geographical boundaries of bharat today bharatiyata is a concept that embraces what is today's afghanistan what is today's nepal a lot of other countries which are no longer a part of bharat but they were once part of this civilizational entity this civilizational construct called bharat next please this is uh, in mahablipuram 
there is a panel where they show a lot of animals. There is a monkey there, there's an elephant there, but there's also a peacock there. Next, please. This is again Pallava art. Next, please. This is Mailapur, Kabaleshwara temple. And this is obviously much later. This art has been created much, much, much later. But even there, they have stayed true to the motif and they've used the peacock. And of course, the colors are more lurid. The presentation is not as refined and artistic as it was earlier. But the peacockness of the peacock is still there. Because that is the peacockness of this peacock is a metaphor for the Bharatiyata in us Bharatiyas. Next, please. This is also another modern, like contemporary temples in Tamil Nadu, a peacock in that. Next, please. This is Skanda, but in Odisha. Yes. So now the thing is, if you see the depiction of Skanda, which I showed in the beginning, and you, sh you see Skanda here, you see that everything is different. Even the facial features are different. Even the way he's sitting is different. Even uh, the, the form, the Pratima Lakshana is the same, the proportion is the same. But if uh, you know that it's Skanda, because we are all Indians and we are all Hindus, but if I show these two pictures, to some foreign citizen and ask them if these two pictures, the first, the Swami Malai bronze and this one, and ask them, are they these pictures of the same deity? I don't think they'll be able to say yes. But we know because we have the civilizational connect and we know intuitively that there is a God who is carrying a spear, who has a peacock. It has to be Skanda. Next, please. This is one of the yoginis who also has the peacock as the mount. This is in, this is in Hirapur. Next, please. This is the clay art. This is again Skanda. But this is the terracotta temples in Bengal. Now, yeah. But again, if you see the way he's dressed, the way he's standing, his body proportion, his face, it's very different from the Skanda you see on the Parshurameshwar temple or the Skanda you see in the Swami Malai bronze. But it's the same God. It has the same ayudhas, it has the same depiction, it has the same mount, it has the same story, it has the same religious significance, everything is the same. But this is the depiction that the artist in Bengal did it. Next please. So you see Peacock in the paintings as well. This painting is a very famous Ravi Varma painting of Saraswati and uh, Peacock. And this is Krishna, this is calendar art. This is Krishna with Peacocks. Next please. Now we find peacock on coinage. So that is, uh, these are Skandagupta's coins. And you can see that's again Skanda. And you can see that he's minted on, uh, as uh, riding a peacock. Next, please. Now we come to the peacock in contemporary architecture, in secular architecture. See, the, the thread called Bharatiyata, it pervades in the sacred, yes but we also carry it in the secular. There is no clear distinction because for us, everything is a yagya, everything is secular, everything is connected to the root that we call Bharatiyata. So this is a, a palace in Jaipur where they use the peacock as a very beautiful motif. This is actually a Jain hall of meditation which is being designed in the shape of a pichi, the peacock fan which the Jain monks use to sweep the floor and that's how they have created this meditation hall. Next please. This is of course peacock in the weaves and again if you see these are these are these are both kanchi weaves and if you can see the depiction of the peacock in this that will replicate the peacock as it is shown in the temple sculpture in Kanchipuram. It will not look like the peacock in Banarsi saris. It will look completely different because they have copied it from their temple motifs. And the artists, the weavers in Kanchipuram have got their inspiration. Peacock in nature, of course, but also the peacock sculptures that they have seen in the temples of Kanchipuram. So this is a Pallava peacock. Again, that is a very, very uh, temple architecture inspired peacock. Next, please. So now this is actually a peacock from Banaras, the one on left. 
and you can see that it's the same peacock but the way it's depicted it's very different that is again the same diversity in unity sort of thing that plays out in bharat again and again unity in diversity not diversity in unity diversity in unity is what the india alliance does the previous one please the one on the right is the peacock in patan patola paintings patan patola sarees so here again you see that it's a def different pe depiction of peacock and if you see the peacock carvings in the patan uh, pa step well you will find peacocks with exaggerated plumage like this there because they got their inspiration from the carvings on the patan pato patan step well next please so this is a peacock in fulkari on the left embroidery now we move a different art form this is a peacock in can anyone identify what's this art form what is this embroidery called kasuti so again the kasuti peacock is very different it's the peacock everybody can make out that it's a peacock but they have their own aesthetics they have their own language they have their own art idiom which is likely inspired by the temples in that region next please this is peacock in the gujarati kachi embroidery on the left and that is the peacock in kantha in bengal next please this is the peacock in zardozi next please now here again uh, previous one so this is a embroidery which became very popular after the advent of islamic rule in india and you can see that now there is lot of exaggerated plumage exaggerated colors because somewhere the spirituality of the motif has been stripped down and it has remained merely a decorative motif the bharatiyata is being diluted somewhere and that is why you see so much of lurid colors so much of uh, so much so much of exaggerated plumage in this next please this is peacock in the ragamala paintings this is the peacock that i showed earlier <coughs> in tanjore paintings next please this is peacock in shri kala hasti kalamkari next please this is peacock in gond paintings now the vanwasi societies in bharat they have their own stories they have their own legends of creation they have their own beliefs and those beliefs are very much in line with the bharatiya concept the dharmic concept of finding religion or finding spirituality in anything so they have their own legend and they depict it through these paintings where they show the peacock under the tree of life next please this is peacock in varli paintings again they have their own uh, own legend of creation so they show the peacock they are basically a vanwasi community which is heavily dependent on agriculture so the rainy season is a time of great joy for them and when peacocks dance with their plumage full out that means that the rain has been good that means you are going to get good crops that means the gods are happy and their god who is basically a form of lord shiva is always accompanied by this peacock with the full plumage next please now we come to peacock in metal craft i am showing these different art forms to you because i want you to understand that ultimately there is only one thing that is connected to all these disparate art forms that is the concept of bharatiyata and that is thousands and thousands of years old that has been there in the sindhu saraswati civilization that has been there in the vedic uh, richas and that is with us even today next please oh the right one is a beautiful depiction in dhokra art of uh, bastar in chatisgarh where they have shown the peacock as a boat in which shri ram uh, janaki and lakshman are crossing the sharayu and there is a there is a boatman there now this is what is known as a what today's people would call today's new age woke people would call the subaltern depiction of <laughs> the peacock but ultimately it's telling the same story of shri ram janaki and lakshman crossing the sharayu river next please so peacock in jewelry next please <coughs> peacock in contemporary pop culture 
So now we have come to a point where the peacock has been stripped of all religious associations, all spiritual associations, and it is now just a motif to be used in contemporary culture. So you see it anywhere. Next, please. It's there in logos. Next, please. And it's there in the ultimate expression of pop art. It is there on the back of trucks. So the motif has been there with us from the Sindhu Saraswati civilization to the trucks that you see on the road even today. That is what is known as Bharatiyata. And that is the elusive thing that has kept us together, that has made us believe in this concept of Bharata Varsha, even though there was political disunity, even though there were many kingdoms here and there. But we believed in the same dharma, we believed in the same spiritual concepts, we believed in the same spiritual thread that bind us together. And this is not just unique to Hindus. All Indic dharmas, Buddhists have their own sacred geography. They have their own stupas, they have their own chaityas, they have their own caves that are scattered all over the country and they take, undertake pilgrimages to them. Jains have their own places of pilgrimage where the Tirthankaras lived, starting from Tamil Nadu, going all the way to Odisha, to Assam, everywhere. So all dharmic faiths whose destiny, whose existence is inexplicably and permanently linked to this sacred land called Bharat have had this sacred geography because that was the way to keep the country together. So that is why I say that temples, textiles and travels to temples and by temples I don't mean just Hindu temples, I mean Jain temples also, I mean Buddhist temples also. Even the youngest faith in Bharat, Sikhism, has his own pilgrimage because many Sikhs actually trace the path of Guru Nanak Dev. So he went to Puri, that's why they go to Puri, where he composed his most famous song, which is Gagan Me Thal, where the story goes that he was not allowed inside. So he said that I will do the Aarti of uh, Sri Jagannath and uh, heaven is my Aarti Thali and uh, the sun and the moon are my Diyas. What a beautiful concept. We, somebody talked about Shankar Dev, Sriman Shankar Dev, I think it was Manushi. He traveled all over India. And then he went to Assam and then he started his, uh, his, uh, his doctrine. Uh, Adi Shankaracharya traveled all over India and he established the four mathas. And he did this Digvijaya twice. Swami Vivekanand went on a Bharat Brahman to understand what this country is all about, to understand what is this underlying unity in diversity is all about. Even the saints like uh, Ramdas Swami or Namdev have also traveled across India. And even today, the best way to understand the pulse of this country, best way to understand this thread of spiritualism that is connecting this elusive principle called Bharatiyata is to travel to temples and to textiles. Thank you. Thank you for the session, ma'am. Let us take a quick coffee break and be back in 15 minutes.
स्टेज सर Good evening, respected elders, dear brothers and sisters. Now we are going to have an interesting session, very informative session on bleeding red, the violent politics of the left. Because most of us, I would say, even the main highly educated people do not know the violent part of the uh, leftist politics, leftist ideology. So we thought we should expose these people because uh, they are acting against the interests of the nation since their birth, 1925. That is why even scholars like Dr. B. R. Ambedkar are completely against it. So we have Dr. Anirban Ganguly. He is from West Bengal. He is the chairman uh, of the uh, Dr. Shyama Prasad Mukherjee Research Foundation. He is an author. Uh, and uh, he has studied civilizational history the very deeply. So he writes regularly for uh, newspapers. He has edited many books. So he'll be uh, focusing on West Bengal uh, leftist violence. Yes, Look, yes. yes. First, I'll give an introduction, then Dr. Ganguly will be speaking. After that, I will narrate a few instances uh, from Kerala because we are very near to them. You know, communism is the most violent political ideology in the world. This we have to understand. It's the most violent ideology. So that is why it has killed. There is, was a professor, Professor Rodolph Joseph Rummel. He was professor earlier with Iowa University, uh, with Iowa University, earlier with Yale, 
much working in different universities. He was a political science professor. You know, for about 30 years, he has been documenting the communist violence across the world. He has written many books, Death by Government. There are several books. And he says, he has estimated that 148 million people, 148, almost 15 crore people were murdered, killed by the communist ideology, by the government, government, communist governments. In fact, he gives one statement. All the governments in the 20th century, they have killed 221 million people, 22, you know, 21 crore, 211 million people, 21 crore, of which 14.8 crores killed by communist governments alone, almost 70% of the murders. That too in just 70 years, between 1917 and 1987. We all know, even in Kerala, I will quote a few instances later as to how uh, killings take place after Penayari Vijayan became chief minister since 2016. So this is communism for us. I have made a rough calculation. If we take uh, the annual uh, deaths by communist governments uh, between 1917 and 1987, on an on annual average of murders was 21.1 lakh annual. Daily, 5,792. So between 1917 and 1987, communists, wherever they were in power across the world, they have been killing 5,792 uh, 5, people. You know, this we have to keep in mind. So they resort to mass killing uh, through variety of means, executions, famines, death through forced labor, deportation, starvation, imprisonment. In fact, uh, Professor Rammel coined a new word for this kind of uh, deaths. He calls it as domicide, domicide, death by government, death by government. So this is how uh, communists have been killing people all across the world since uh, 1917. This we have to understand. In India also, uh, we will be explaining a few aspects of it. Uh, it will show as to how the communists have been killing our own people wherever they are in power. So first point I want to, I want all of you to understand is communism is the most violent ideology in the world and as a result of which they have killed the largest, highest number of people anywhere in the world. Thank you. Now I'll invite Prof. Dr. Anirban Ganguly to speak on Bengali violence, eh? violence in West Bengal. I want to thank uh, uh, the organizers of Western Ghat Lit Fest. It's so, it's so musically named also. And also, Shefali Vaidya Ji, who continues to inspire all of us and, and to do such fundamental work on narrative building, uh, despite great odds and challenges. And uh, I want to also thank uh, Professor Kanak Sabhapati ji. Uh, he's the secretary of the organization of which I am the chairman, uh, that part of the introduction remained. And I want to thank all of you. You know, this is the last session. I didn't expect that there will be so many people uh, here to hear about violence. All the pre yeah, I mean, all the previous sessions have been so sublime. of this lit fest to you know to the greater democratic ideal and spirit that india represents so thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and uh, for being here and nanda kumar ji had he been here it would have really also uh, been very interesting but he was he had to leave he was there earlier today 
now you see i i don't know where to start with because one is that um, uh, we could easily get into a conversation format after a while and i don't want to make it just a monologue uh, but as professor mentioned now the dilemma with west bengal today is that it is not only communist violence communist violence in west bengal is history it is now lumpen violence that we are witnessing in west bengal but it is a continuation of the tradition that the communist violent tradition that the communist had initiated in west bengal and perpetrated for the last four decades that they were in power nearly four decades that they were in power and that has been continuing now in a much more crass form without the bindings of an ideology or of a party structure the communists perpetrated violence in the name of ideology they took control they controlled through violence they had an ideology they had a political structure and in the name of that ideology through that political structure in the name of emancipating the people people the proletariat they carried out violence today the violence in west bengal has gone beyond a certain level and limit we come to that later but primarily let us focus on communist violence of course uh, i think comrade pr natarajan must be in delhi protesting against israel in support of hamas so you in coimbatore you know what communists and what communism are uh, now west bengal is a very peculiar state you must remember that even during the british period when the british took control of west bengal in 1757 of bengal in that sense the first major famine there were no famines before that and uh, in that sense the first major famine was in 1770 it completely destroyed the social fabric of west bengal of bengal besides killing millions of people and when the british left in 1947 they again gifted one last mega famine that was in 1943 the great bengal famine which killed 3 million plus people and it is the 80th year of the bengal famine this year shama prashad mukherji had a towering role in famine relief in mitigating the effects of that famine he resigned his position as a minister in the bengal government but that's altogether another story and how the muslim league took advantage took advantage how the muslim league took advantage of the famine and started even converting the razakars of the muslim league were active they started converting people in the name of famine relief shama prashad mukherji had to step in and whereas the hindu mahasabha conducted famine relief every day the hindu mahasabha would feed up to 4 lakh people give them medical aid give them distribute grains open kitchens where food was served cooked and served by the hindu mahasabha even the british intelligence had to accept that the hindu mahasabha was a force to reckon with and it did not differentiate between communities and between religion we must remember that the majority of those affected in the bengal famine were landless peasants who were majority were muslims because that was undivided bengal and the hindu mahasabha did not make a single distinction it served everyone equally but the muslim league continued uh, with their uh, politics i am just giving you this background for this reason that perhaps bengal is the only state which has faced uh, three partitions one can say <coughs> in 1905 the bengal partition the first partition the british brought it about because they wanted to stymie the nationalist forces it was annulled in 1911 and the capital was shifted to delhi uh, professor you can stop me if i go on and on you know i mean then, i mean because you know i want uh, yes people like us don't get such audiences often so you know <laughs> yes uh, and a such an erudite audience also and people so patiently listening usually we are used to that slogan hearing kind of an audience so so uh, 
the second partition was in 1947. That partition saved a portion of Bengal and the creation of West Bengal. It is the 75th year of West Bengal also. As we celebrate 75 years of independence, we are also we should also reflect on the formation of West Bengal 75 years ago. West Bengal was formed as a homeland for the Bengali Hindu. Let there be no ambiguity in that. Shama Prashad Mukherjee saved a portion of Bengal because at that time a number of Congress leaders, a few Congress leaders, among them Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose's elder brother. Please remember in 47, Netaji was already had already disappeared. His, his uh, elder brother Sarat Chandra Bose and Suravardi, H.S. Suravardi, who was the kingpin of the 1946 direct action day. Suravardi, Sarat Chandra Bose and Kiran Shankar Roy of the Congress, they decided to float a theory of united, sovereign, independent Bengal. A united, sovereign, independent Bengal, had it happened, would have a Muslim league and a Muslim majority. It would be a Muslim majority province with a Muslim league government. I'll tell you why I'm coming to this. I'll tell you why I'm giving you this back background. I'm leading you to that. So, Shama Prashad Mukherjee threw cold water. He threw a spanner into this. He told Gandhiji, Gandhiji had nearly, he, he started exploring the idea. Sardar Patel, Shama Prashad Mukherjee said, you know, I have only one condition. Let Suravardi say, give it in writing, that united, independent, sovereign Bengal after it has been formed, should not accede to Pakistan. Will Suravardi give this in writing? Because you see, with a Muslim League government, with a Muslim majority province, what would stop anyone from passing a resolution in the assembly and saying that we want to unite with, we want to merge with Pakistan? That is exactly what they tried with JNK. They tried that with Tripura also. That is another story, some other day. And Suravardi was not willing to give that undertaking. And Sardar Patel stepped in. The entire Bengal Congress leadership, the Bengal Congress of today doesn't even know its history. <laughs> they don't even know that they sided with Shama Prashad Mukherjee in bifurcating, West Beng in bifurcating Bengal. And debate took place in the undivided Bengal assembly. Voting took place. And all the Hindu MLAs, of Bengal assembly voted for division of Bengal and the criteria were two. One was that West Bengal to be created as a homeland for the Bengali Hindu and as an integral part of the Indian Union. This is what, this is our legacy. This is Shama Prashad Mukherjee's legacy. And Jinnah had said he wants Calcutta for six months. Sardar Patel said not even for six hours. and. The moment Jinnah realized that Calcutta won't be part of his Pakistan, he lamented publicly, what is Pakistan without Calcutta? Or what is East Bengal without Calcutta? So the idea was this. Now what was the role of the communists in this? The communists said, like we said, we said we don't want division of Bengal. We want the entire Bengal to stay in India. But if we see that you are trying to send entire Bengal to Pakistan, we oppose it, we want a division, we want the Hindu majority provinces to come to India. This was our stand. The communist said, and comrade Jyoti Basu was an MLA at that time, he said, uh, you know, we don't want division of Bengal, but we want the whole of Bengal to go to Pakistan. Because we feel that uh, Pakistan has a legitimate right to exist. And India is not a nation. It is a congery of 17 nationalities. That was the resolution they passed. And since then, since then, they supported, started supporting every Muslim League program which demanded Pakistan. And in 1946 direct action, what was Comrade Jyoti Basu's stand? His stand was, we will support the Muslim League Hartal wherever it is necessary. We will oppose it wherever it is required. This was the, Paki, this was the communist stand. Now, after independence, after partition, it is unfortunate that Shama Prashad Mukherjee died, was rather killed in Kashmir 
in 1953, 23rd June. Since after that, the entire refugee population that started coming in, I'm, and I'm, I'm skipping, uh, Shujoda, you know I'm skipping, I'm skipping phases because we have a focus in this. The entire refugee movement, the communists started taking control of it. I'll give you one example. Shama Prashad Mukherjee demanded sanction against Pakistan. Why? Because Pakistan is unable to give protection to its minorities. He demanded sanctions. The communists took out a procession in the streets of Calcutta saying that Shama, against Shama Prashad Mukherjee, raising slogans against him, saying that he must be sanctioned and not Pakistan. 30 years in West Bengal, for 30 years from 1947 to 67, 77, it was Congress rule. From 1967 to 77, the 10 years that saw the rise of the CPIM, the Communist Party, was a period, a decade of instability. In 1967, the Communists managed to come to power in a coalition go government with a breakaway faction of the Congress, the Bangla Congress. And uh, Comrade Jyoti Basu became the Home Minister in that government. Now imagine, this United Front government lasted for in two terms for about two, two and a half years or so, not more than that. Ajay Mukherjee, one of the stalwarts of the Swadeshi movement, one of the stalwart, a stalwart freedom fighter was the chief minister. Jyoti Basu was the home minister. It is the first time in history in that sense that one sees a coalition partner hooting against, hounding the chief minister of that coalition. The communists declared, being part of the government, they declared a war against its own government. And they would do it at a very crass level. They would hoot at the chief minister, they would uh, threaten him, they would carry out processions, all through, in order to be able to maintain their control. Now before this, if you remember, first time Calcutta witnessed violence was in 1953 when the government decided to raise the tram fares by one paisa. It was the, it's called the Ak Poishar Andolan. Ek Paisa Ka Andolan. What did the communists do? Under the leadership of Comrade Jyoti Basu, they started burning trams. They completely brought Calcutta to a standstill. The people of Calcutta had not seen that before. And I'll give you a very uh, an interesting aside. Just after direct action 46, I mean, I j want to give you this aside to show how the mind works. After direct action 1946, towards the end of August, Suravardi called for an all-party meeting, all-community meeting. So the Congress would be represented by a leader, Kiran Shankar Roy, the Hindu Mahasabha representing the Hindus would be represented by Shama Prashad Mukherjee and Suravardi representing the Muslim League. Suravardi put in Comrade Jyoti Basu's name in it also. Shama Prashad Mukherjee said, look, I understand that I represent the Hindu Mahasabha, you represent uh, the uh, Muslim League, Kiran Shankar Roy represents the Congress, whom does Jyoti Basu represent? Which community? He's not even the largest party, not even remotely the... So this atat between the Muslim League and the Communists were there right at the beginning. And this legacy of violence has been carried forward. It's a legacy of the Muslim League that was very beautifully, artfully, beautiful in quote, very artfully carried forward by the Communists. And they realized that political control can be had through violence. And a series of violence continued. There was food, uh, food protests. It was violent. But let me also remind you, and I think these things must be discussed. Perhaps someday we can write a book. Sandeep Balakrishna and myself, we had planned to actually write a book on these issues, but it never took off because all of us have our commitments, various pulls and pressures. You see, if you, if you look at uh, the, uh, the, 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 the legacy, Inherently violent, 
and the moment they saw that it is possible to control through violence they did that and i'll give you i'll give you two three examples we know that the moment they came to power they initiated the marijapi massacre aaj tak uh, aaj tak has done a very uh, just a few weeks back an entire aaj tak team went to marijapi uh, you know they worked out and they have done a very nice story i'll circulate it in the whatsapp the one of the latest stories they interviewed the survivors and all that also 8 to 10000 people were killed who were they bengali hindu refugees mostly dalits so before they came to power these communist party uh, leaders would go to various states in india where these refugees were rehabilitated you know they were re rehabilitated in andaman nicobar in dandakaranya in in uh, in madhya pradesh in now uh, in chatisgarh madhya pradesh also so they would go and tell them look once we come to power once we come to power we will bring you back to west bengal and you will live with your heads held high in 77 when the communist party government was formed these refugees started clamoring for coming back to west bengal you know anyone who has lived in east bengal a land primarily full of rivers rivulets tributaries green lush green with a lot of humidity in the air with a lot of colors who would want to go and live in a desert in a dry arid region they all wanted to come back they were not allowed to come back in spite of that they started coming back and they said look we don't need any rehabilitation all that we need is please let us settle in this island of marijapi we will look after ourselves we don't need anything else we will fend for ourselves this was anathema to the communists they did not want a huge mass of refugees coming and settling there beyond their control so imagine please read deep halda's book i mean many of you have read i'm sure he also had a lot of problem in trying to write it down there are first hand accounts in that book it will bring tears to your eyes for 40 years the communists are so clever that they succeeded in completely whitewashing what is one of the biggest not one the biggest massacre genocide in independent india and 1979 january the biggest dalit massacre dalit ma massacre i am leaving aside bengali hindus dalit massacre also please look at it that way the biggest dalit massacre and they shout about gujarat they scream about uh, you know about uh, they have been screaming about gujarat for 15 years 20 years because they have you know whitewashed their crimes for the last four decades wells were poisoned kids were killed old old infirm women elderly who could not seniors who could not leave their huts were burnt along with their huts obviously these people will support hamas no today wo to same stand same mentality same modus operandi what hamas is doing today they did 40 years ago so there is a certain amount of kinship and wells poisoned and the police came and shot and later on when one of the communist ministers even now when the book was written was asked how many people were killed he said oh you know five people not more than that five to eight people not more than that and the official reason for that given was that marijapi is a protected forest area these refugees would come and destroy that and therefore we have done this police action again unparalleled in history where you carry out a genocide in order to protect a forest so this was one then in the 1980s you know how they burnt they killed they doused with petrol ananda margi nuns monks and uh, uh, sanyasi uh, sadhavis on bijan setu that setu is still there right yes, na and every year we still carry out some kind of protest but you know after all yes you stay away and an entire generation was brought up on that that you know anand marg is oh chele dhora ha they are they they pick the kidnappers they kidnappers so don't so so you know this contempt for the bhagwa this contempt for the for the ochre the color the sanya color of the sanyasi 
in broad daylight they burnt they doused them with petrol in the heart of kolkata south kolkata doused them with petrol and burned them to death in broad daylight, in broad daylight on a main thoroughfare on a main thoroughfare and you know i mean i don't want to sound uh, uh, you know sound it that way we have rice uh, mixed with rasam we have rice with uh, tair sadam we have but obviously the communists like to have rice mixed with blood to sign bari killing in 1970s early 1970 in bardhawan there was this congress family which was very staunchly congress the communist cadres at that time 67 to 70 67 to 77 that 10 years they carried out a lumpenization of bengal which was unthinkable the bengali a uh, political class was not ready had never faced this kind of lumpenized politics and so they went and killed these two brothers as they had sat down to have their lunch they were decapitated and that blood was mixed with rice and the mother of those two brothers the mother was forced fed that rice and she completely you know became insane till the last day she remained insane and one of the kingpins went on to become a minister in the communist government so this is their legacy not once not twice throughout the we know the nandigram massacre we know the nanur massacre where 11 landless peasants of the minority community were killed and these communists imagine could not survive for a day not even a month in east pakistan or east bengal after partition they went they said we'll build the communist party of pakistan within a month they were put behind bars and comrade ila mitra i would request because there are many of my elders my sisters and uh, mothers also here like my mothers ila mitra comrade ila mitra many uh, th those who are uh, you know students of bengal's political history know she was an extremely bold communist leader in undivided bengal the peasant movement she was one of the leaders of peasant movement supporting tribal emancipation etc etc blah 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 she was imprisoned she was tortured to hell molested physically abused and then as a nervous wreck half dead ila mitra was left on parole and she came to india they had decided no we will not come to india we will continue to live in east pakistan in india she was rehabilitated she got elected she became a member of the legislative assembly and carried on her politics so had west bengal not been there where would comrade ila mitra come and if you look at my timeline it's in bengali but if you look at my timeline on my facebook page today even today the choicest abuse that the communist that the, the choices abuse that shyam prasad mukherjee is given are from the communists 55408 deaths between 1977 and 2009 i am not saying this devaprato bandobadhyay one of the senior most is officers he was the agriculture secretary agriculture when the land reform movement took place in 1977 after the communists came to power devaprato bandobadhyay later on became a rajya sabha member from the tmc his computation says between 1977 and 2009 the peak of communist rule in west bengal 55408 political killings took place in west bengal by the communists mamta banerjee is carrying out that legacy they did soft appeasement she is doing hard appeasement we can get into that in the conversation but uh, you know so many many such examples many such examples and they got away with it you see they got away with it i mean i can give so many such this, uh, examples where even ips officers were butchered by instigated by communist ministers and uh, they created an entire web of two levels and i'll finish with that yes. one was for the rural crowd what was that every time an election came 
there would be these bike borne armed squads going around in the villages they were known as the harmats they would go around in the villages and they would threaten every because in the village you more or less know who votes for whom which family supports whom they would go around saying don't step out and vote because otherwise and they would carry around shrouds shrouds and they would say otherwise the ladies of your house would have to wear this so don't step out this was for rural uh, bengal and today the pds camp that we are seeing in west bengal where the trinamool ministers have completely outdone the others it started during communist rule look here one this is a party which spoke in the name of the proletariat they indulged in one of the worst pds scams ever in independent india's history they started it off from the yes institutionalize that yes. in the the urban spaces so you allowed them to control the port in kolkata you allowed them to control parts of kolkata city where they retran they made bombs sometimes those bombs blasted off and then you realized that you had bomb making units just next to your house so it can so this was the two levels and and one thing you must know which is not there in the book and I, it's live i don't mind because deep says the publisher insisted that he remove that when the marijapi massacre took place there was specific instruction that muslim criminals i am i am you know i mean it's all right we all we, i don't usually uh, muslim criminals were released and asked to go to marijapi and carry out operations so this is how the communist operated uh, so anyway uh, you know i can go <laughs> on and on but this was later on this continues in other forms in much more bloody forms today and the the bantala case where three women were mercilessly molested a uh, government officers attached to the unite unicef also UNICEF and health department of the government and they were done by cpm card holders party members and jyoti basu comrade jyoti basu said why do they go there ora keno jaye okhane why do they go there so you know you see the the only uh, shortcoming the only thing what has happened is they have been masters at white washing their crimes masters at white washing their crimes it's time and i am very happy that we have got this space that it's time that we keep highlighting those mari jhapi mari jhapi must continuously become a slogan i have been to that place i mean you can still see tigers there you see crocodiles anyway so i just wanted to make a few of this yes <coughs> yes we will have discussion later little later <coughs> kerala is no exception communist ruled west bengal for 34 years is indeed but as far as kerala is concerned five years ldf five years udf this is how it has been going on and i have a vested interest also in west bengal now you don't have an mp or mla from communist party marxist party but unfortunately in tamil nadu we have four mps out of the five mps of communist elected lok sabha mps four are from tamil nadu ah four are from tamil nadu and one is from coimbatore so this is this is the point you may be knowing when this unlawful activities prevention act amendment bill came up for discussion and voting in parliament in 2019 all parties including congress supported this uapa because it's against it is against those who engage in unlawful activities of course azharuddin obviously opposed it 
along with the officer duridin ovc who supported that bill uh, who supported as ovc and who were against uh, this bill communists so communists are the most dangerous creatures i will just go to the point directly and explain what has happened in the uh, neighboring state of kerala because of which coimbatore is also suffering during the last 30 years if you see kerala now whenever they mention they always mention kerala's killing fields you must have seen in newspapers etc so it is estimated that over the last uh, um, 30 40 years beginning with 1969 there were an, there were more than 300 people belonging to sangha parivar rss pjp other free footer organizations who were killed by the communist 300 persons and kannur is the political capital of kerala marxists it was in kannur in panayari village first unit of the kerala marxists was established in the year 1939 and it is the most dangerous territory even today uh, for uh, for the public the first murder by the communists took place in 1969 in talacheri taluk a swayam sevak by name radha krishnan he was a tailor he was killed murdered by the leftist goons and you know whose name figured in the fir pinayari vijayan pinayari vijayan as there were nobody to uh, go against him uh, to the police station you know no action was taken against uh, him very recently two years back the kerala congress president raised this matter and released the fir also you, some of you may be knowing so pinayari vijayan was the culprit in the first murder of uh, uh, in kerala i will just mention two three instances to present to you as to how the communists just don't kill uh, uh, our people nationalists but how brutal they are you know it will be very very disturbing uh, when i explain this in 1999 there was a school teacher kt jayakrishna master he was taking class in his school in kannur district only it was 1035 he was bharatiya janata party yuva morcha president there was police protection provided to him one police he was standing outside he disappears suddenly immediately leftist goon center and he was killed in front of the students sixth class students if i remember right 16 of them killed in front of them then left there were if i remember right some 40 wounds or so all over his body he was lying in a pool of blood so they went out with all weapons walked along the road with weapons in front of the public in front of the police no action was taken before leaving the place they wrote in the uh, classroom uh, uh, board board any of you who Uh, testify against this they will have to face the same consequences as ktr jay krishna master faced so this is how they went and the most important part of this is the communist party engaged the very senior lawyers highest earning lawyers top lawyers went up to the supreme court a lot of class there yes class. went up to the supreme court all of them were freed except one you know what happened after that after that all the killers they were brought in a procession garlanded they went they were taken to the school and in front of the classroom where uh, jay krishnan was killed there was a dais they created a dais and then they were all garlanded state senior leaders they all went there to appreciate their services and it was broadcast on tv live live 
so this was the situation the matter does not end there one person who was jailed after he came out he was made the parent teacher association of the same school can you believe it humiliation they not only killed jay krishnan they killed everybody in that area humiliation after humiliation and this is what this leftist violence is this we have to understand and why he was killed because in 1996 three years earlier the bjp district secretary chandran was killed in front of his wife that was a big blow to the party jay krishnan filled that vacuum and he took responsibility for the growth of the party as a result he was killed and it was reported that it took many years for the children to recover counseling took place for many many years several years can you believe 11 years uh, old ch children witnessing the murder of their teacher in front of all of them this is one then in 2012 another incident happened there were several i narrate only two three it will show us the gruesome nature of these leftists there was one tp chandrasekhar he was a dai fi you know communist leftist union uh, youth wing secretary he was with them only he was a close follower of vs achyudanandam now senior most leader of the kerala communist party he was with uh, communist party all along but he developed some differences with them so he left the party and promoted his own party called revolutionary marxist party in 2012 and his party was growing immediately after he prom um, established his party he contested the local body elections in kolikode district onchiyam if i remember right his village uh, they won the local body elections so this irritated the marxists so as a result while he was going in the bike as usual they came in a car threw petrol bombs attacked him he was 51 years old in 51 places they attacked him 51 deep wounds were there murdered killed and uh, they did not stop there so immediately after killing of course again this matter went to the court fortunately you know communist cadre they were all uh, punished of course they came out of the jail also some of you may be knowing that in kerala jail you know they have exclusive cells for them where they are provided with all facilities and all so it is the marx marxists they glorify these people it is the problem in kerala and the important part is that his followers erected a monument memorial for him in his village all over the years it was being getting destroyed every time once in two years three years i was told that they have already uh, repaired it rebuilt it five times now his wife kk rama has become an mla vatakara assembly constituency and she recently gave an interview in which he had said that panayari vijayan has blood on his hands this is what we said then the third instant i quote it's it will be more uh, worry some for us when we listen this there was a senior rss worker by name uttaman he was very ordinary people in fact most of the people killed were very very ordinary people and we have to remember here these communists did not kill sangha rss um, bjp people alone kerala congress leader had said that they had killed 28 of their own congress people also they have killed iuml muslim league popular people also so for them of course the serious enemy opponent important opponent is sangha parivar pjp people but they kill all others also so this uttaman one mr uttaman was a bus driver ordinary person he was a very staunch follower of rashtriya swayamsevak sangh so while he was driving in bus as usual you know bombs were thrown at the bus he stopped it he he was dragged out of the bus and he was killed in broad daylight 
in a district bazaar in front of all public in 2002. 2002. And the point is that the violence continued even after killing Mr. Uttaman. There were people who attended his funeral. They were returning in a jeep. So the jeep carrying uh, uh, Uttaman's relative, bombs were thrown at uh, this jeep. His aunt, 70-year-old aunt and the driver died. So this is how they were doing. And after 14 years in 2016, one Ramit, 30-year-old RSS worker was killed. Who was this Ramit? Ramit? Uttaman's son. So they killed the father first in 2012, 2002. 14 years later, his only son was killed. His mother Narayani openly appealed to the CPM leadership, said, kill me also, I have nobody to live with. So this is how violence continues in Kerala, our neighboring state, without most of us knowing about it, because as Anirbanji said, you know, they don't uh, allow this to get into the newspaper media because they know how to manage this media. So these are all just three instances. And I remember another important instance that happened, I think, in 1990s, late 1990s. Three young boys, ABBB, ABBB workers, they were chased and they had no place to escape. They jumped into Pamba River. They wanted to escape. But, you know, while swimming, they have to come up, they have to breathe. So whenever they came out, they stoned them. All the three of them were died in the river. All the three of them. All young boys, three of them. And suppose, let us say, there are, there are good officers. So what will happen to the good officer? I will just give one example. There was one Mr. Radha Krishnan, K. Radha Krishnan. By the way, he is a Dalit Hindu. Very honest officer. He was put in charge of Muhammad Fasal murder case. Some of you may be knowing. Kannur Muhammad Fasal murder case. In fact, many of these murders took place in Kannur. Almost one third of the murders. And I forgot to mention that this Uttaman family house is just adjacent to Panayari Vijayan's family. Same village, same street adjacent to uh, Panayari Vijayan's family. So, neighboring family, father was killed, son was killed. And this is how communism is killing people in Kerala. I mentioned this. There was one Kerala communist youngster, a worker, by name Muhammad Fasal. He shifted his loyalty to NDF, National Democratic Front, an Islamic outfit. He was having uh, followers. So the communist people thought if we leave, him, we leave it like that, then many of the uh, particularly Muslim uh, people will follow him. So they hatched a plan and he was hacked to death in 2006. For this, they appointed K. Radhakrishnan, a senior DSP at that time, as the investigating officer. And immediately after this murder takes place, Kodiyari Balakrishnan, at that time Home Minister, announces that this is the work of RSS people. Because the killers were wearing saffron clothes and they left a trishul near the body. So immediately Home Minister himself says, you know, it is the work of RSS workers. And all around that area, people go in auto, auto rickshaws, vehicles, and openly blare in loudspeakers that RSS people uh, killed Muhammad Fasal. The area secretary gives names of four RSS workers to the police. They say that these are the people uh, who have killed Muhammad Fasal. So you have to investigate them and send them to jail. Same day, Home Minister calls this Radha Krishnan and says, you have to take action within a week. He goes to the police station, he calls all the four of them and found out that they have nothing to do with the murder. 
Then he found out that it was the Kerala local communist leaders who were responsible for it. So he was writing that report. Immediately after the communist government comes to know about it, he was transferred. He was transferred. The case was handed over to crime department, uh, some other department, not law and order, crime department. He goes on leave, this uh, police officer Radha Krishnan. After two months back, he was called back. He joins duty. You know, a Kanja case was registered against him. Kanja case was registered against him. Narcotics. Ah, narcotics. This is very common in West Bengal also. Oh. Political, yes. Those who are very active, political opponents, especially youngsters, because it's non available So some of them are uh, slapped with uh, 18 such cases. So that they are hauled up and put in behind bars. Very common. Yes. Very common. Before that, on the same day, what happens? While he was returning from the duty after joining, first day, night he was returning, he goes to a friend's house for dinner, he comes out. 20 uh, CPIM goons attacked him, his spine was completely broken, spine broken, nose broken. So he goes to the hospital, he, while he was remaining in the hospital, based on this Kanja case, you know, case was filed against him. Case filed against him. And he comes out, he fights it in the court, not, uh, he did not get justice at the local level, magistrate, right? goes to the high court, high court says this is political vendetta. You know, it was, this action was taken against a honest officer. This was the judgment. The Kerala communist government goes to the <coughs> Supreme Court. Supreme Court. Finally, after Supreme Court validating the high court judgment, he was asked to join. Again, another case was put up against him. No salary was given. All his perks were frozen. Seniority was affected. Meanwhile, you may be surprised to know, to maintain his family, he sell whatever property he had, house. He was not able to repay a loan. Children's education suffered. He went to Karnataka, worked as a security officer in a private company to maintain his family. And after four and a half years, after four and a half years, again fighting in the court, he rejoins duty. He works there for eight, eight months, just before retirement, worked there for eight months. On the day of retirement at 4.30 p.m., telegram goes to him, memo issued to him, all, as a result of which, all perks, salary, arrears, everything was stopped. He was not getting anything at all. So in 2018, I remember, he went to meet the same Panayari Vijayan, met with him, told him, you know, if you don't give me salary, arrears and all, I have to commit suicide with my family. No action was taken. As far as I know, I don't know now, till 2021-22, no action was taken. This is because K. Radha Krishnan refused to file false charges against RSS people against Sangha Parivar people. He knew that the culprits were uh, these communists. Finally, of course, the case went and uh, I think s s three or four communists were also punished. But this is how honest officers were hounded. Very recently, I'll end with this, last week, October 21st or 20th, if I remember right, a university student by name Aradhana, an ABVP worker, she was distributing pamphlets in her college. You know, leftist goons pushed her into a room, locked that room, dimly lit, lighted room. She was not allowed to come out of the room. She was wearing this, uh, this. She was asked to remove it. They pulled it out. And for more than six hours, she was not allowed to come out principal could not do anything, police could not do anything. Finally, his father had to come, where, go to the police station, and later he was released. So we all have to understand in our neighboring state of Kerala, like in the case of West Bengal, they are engaged in violence, continuous violence. That is the reason why, you know, they are in a way, 
not in a way, they are indirectly, openly supporting uh, this jihadi elements, missionary elements. Otherwise, how could a Hamas leader uh, talk to them uh, via this uh, technology medium? So we all have to understand this communists, wherever they are, they engage in all these violent criminal activities. Fortunately, in Tamil Nadu, they are not in power, but even otherwise, they are supporting all these anti-national elements. So it is time for us to throw, throw these people out of this democratic political system. That is the best thing Tamilians have to do. Unfortunately, out of the five uh, Lok Sabha members, four are from Tamil Nadu. Thank you. I think my, my point is they don't need to be in power anywhere, physically. Because they wield, in any case, they wield power far uh, more than their uh, political clout. Uh, in Tamil Nadu, don't be too complacent because your Aryavalam, or what do you call it? Aryavalam. Aryavalam. They have already, they have started throwing petrol bombs and all that. Also arresting workers, same pattern as in West Bengal. In front of Rajbhavan. In front, uh, inside uh, they are lobbying. So, it's moving that way. So can we can have... Yes. Hello. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes. I have three questions actually. One is a simple one, but with not a very simple answer. Why is there a Sudhavardi Avenue in Kolkata? That too in the prime uh, location yeah. next to Park Maidan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When everybody yeah. knows what yeah. he has so, done. So that uh, is not named after the butcher. Suravardi was, one Suravardi was vice chancellor of Calcutta University. That is named after him. He was his father or something? No, no, no. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> Fortunately, in fact, in fact, there's an interesting year. Shama Prashad Mukherjee, after he completed two terms, he was not given a third term as vice chancellor. In those days, it used to be a, a two years term. So he was a total of four years. And so deliberately, they did not give him a third term and they gave it to Suravadi. So it is that Suravadi. Yeah, yeah. The second question is, okay. The second question <laughs> The second question is, we've all talked about how communists uh, start with the lumpenization <coughs> of the street worker. My question is, why is lumpenization so easy to do with communist ideology? Why is it so easily possible? I mean, tomorrow if BJP decides to lumpenize the street worker, would it be that easy? No. So what is it about communist ideology that inherently desensitizes young people to violence? It makes them feel like it's completely normal. Normal and age. You know, I, here, I think uh, you should all, uh, professor can give a better, uh, I think that the system, a very systematic system of indoctrination that they have in the party. Like, we have work, work and all that, but in the work, uh, you know, the topic of the work, the issue, we, we always, we have uh, at the core of every work is nation, nationalism, and the greatness of India. Here it is just the opposite. <coughs> that systematic party classes, now it has stopped. But when they were in power, I don't know what the situation is in Kerala today. They are of course very happy with the, uh, with the Adani port. Pinara is very happy with that. It's good. Uh, so, <laughs> deep sea port. Uh, that party classes, throughout these 40 years, they had an extreme effect. Now, this lumpenization, there are two things. One is in West Bengal. Uh, it's very interesting that West Bengal, till the 1960s, despite suffering partition, despite suffering in 1943, one of the most debilitating famines, continued to be a lead state in terms of industrial output and commerce. It is with the advent of communists that that went down. Now, in the last 35 years that they were in power, they destroyed industry, we all know that. They completely destroyed, politicized, completely destroyed education, universities. And what they did was very systematically, they, en they ensured that investment ran out of West Bengal. Most of the major conglomerates shifted to Bombay and uh, to, other, uh, to, to Chennai and other places. So they, they there's this entire section which has, uh, you know, which like 
the 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 uh, the model is of Kashmir in the past that pay them a pittance and tell them hey look you just need to pelt stones so that lumpenization is primarily from that category I don't want to use the term lumpen proletariat but it is that that there are no avenues you have completely shut them out you have give them some given them some basic indoctrination and you have told them look this is what you need to do so you need to go and hound people prevent them from coming to vote throw a few bombs in the apartments in in the apartment compound so that nobody comes out to vote etc this is your work the other lumpenization that kind of justification of violence that the urban naxals which are obviously a very clear offshoot of the uh, communist whatever they say the urban naxals they attended these classes they were part of these classes they were the ones who were resource persons also and then this cold justification of violence so i think these need, there are two dimensions to this and the tmc has actually latched on to that lumpen element on the the base lumpen element that and we have all seen it during our elections with the attacks on us even two months ago when the panchayat election took place you could see i went and visited i couldn't cover all the districts but from howda to nadia I went and visited most of our workers, most of our people, even candidates, lady women candidates. One lady had undergone a caesarean operation a few weeks ago. She stood for election, very popular in her village. She was kicked in her belly. And imagine this is happening in the villages where they know each other. She knows exactly who did it. They have been probably growing up together. So this kind of politicization which the communists did and it has been now taken to that level. There are party villages even today in Kerala. Party villages. Party villages Liberated even today. areas. Of course, okay. earlier we were not completely allowed to go inside the villages but today things are changing. You but see, Gram Chada, Gram Chada to, to drive you out of village was a, was a political weapon with the left. No, you cannot go and uh, do canvassing. Nothing. You cannot do anything. Either socially boycotted or you are driven out of your village. The party will decide which newspaper you have to read, which newspaper you have to buy and all. And apart from that, we have party campuses in Kerala. I don't know whether many of us know. The CPIM people do not allow ABVP, other uh, uh, Congress party in unions to come up. So there are party Campuses now, this is one. As far as uh, Cephalogy's question is concerned, I don't remember the exact quotation. Lenin said in those days, we have to develop our party based on intense hatred. hatred. Intense hatred we should have to achieve success. So this is how they were brought. And that is the reason why... They demonstrate in public and all. But uh, uh, when we see the story, listen to the story of Radha Krishna, he has been suffering a lot with the financial issues and uh, family matters and all. So what kind of backup did RSS give? Because RSS was to be blamed that time. They did not give proper support to Radha Krishna. They did not back on him for his family support and all. So uh, this kind of uh, uh, backup, if it is there, there will definitely there will be honest officers who can do this. But if he is not at all backed up, then Surely, backing up of uh, such honest officers will be actually regretting for being honest. And uh, demonstration of these goons will be more and more encouraging in uh, violence, you know. That's what is the... Uh, sorry, time is running out. We will discuss personally. Yes. I'm here. I'm here. Thank, Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. small there's a small booklet which is available for free distribution bloodshed in west bengal so we just got it put put it together a little hurriedly but uh, you can take it take as many copies and distribute also thank you sir
I request Shri Sundar Ramachandran ji and Shri Mati Rama Menon ji to come up to the stage for the book launch of Dr. Ganguly's Upendra Nath Banerjee book. Actually, uh, my great great grandfather uh, spent 12 years in the cellular jail. He was part of the first batch of political prisoners. Uh, he was an accused in the famous, uh, infamous Alipur bomb case in which Sri Aurobindo was the prime principal accused. Sri Aurobindo was acquitted, but he, along with Ullaskar and Barin Ghosh and uh, many others, were transported for life. And uh, just about a few months after that, Savarkarji also joined them in the cellular jail. And Savarkarji quotes my, his book in his My Transportation for Life. Uh, and his was the first memoir of life in cellular jail. The original was in Bangla, uh, which became a classic in Bangla literature. And exactly a hundred years ago, it was translated in English. He himself did the translation. Uh, so commemorating that and Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, I thought of reissuing it. And Professor uh, Bibek Debroy uh, wrote a foreword. And I have written an extensive introduction to it. And it reads uh, very, uh, that was the first memoir of how life was in cellular jail, so people got to know actually. So you have all that description, the kolu, etc. And uh, the entire torture, the mental agony, and uh, ullaskar and all. Uh, so, so that's uh. <laughs> Thank you for giving it a platform. It has not been released, so uh, it can be. <laughs> I call on stage Sri and Srimati Krishna Kumar to present a memento to Dr. Anirban Ganguly. Uh, may now request uh, Srimati Anuttama Ganguly uh, to present a memento to the uh, uh, to Akshita, who's been doing a wonderful MC work for the last two days. The display of gymnastics through yoga by students of Anadi Foundation is a performance where students demonstrate a unique blend of gymnastics and yoga techniques.
Hello. Namaste, everybody. And it's a wrap. It's the last session of the day. That was the valedictory session. And uh, it gives me great joy to see the Western Literature, uh, Western Ghats Literature Festival grow by leaps and bounds. And it was wonderful to see a full house. And it's a bigger hall than last year's. And next year, I can guarantee you that this is going to be get even bigger, even better, with lots of participation from the younger generation. That is going to be our theme next year. Thank you very much for being a lovely audience. And one thing that all the speakers have said, and they have mentioned it, this is a very quality audience. The kind of questions that have been asked, the kind of interactions that we have had with the audience has been just phenomenal. And nobody can make an event a greater success than the quality of the audience. So thank you for being so wonderful. <laughs> Namaste. Yeah. 
शूल निर्मूल शूल पाणी भजे हम भवानी पति भावगम्यम कलातीत कल्याण कल्पांधिकारी सदा सजनानंद दाता पुरारी Let us give a big round of an applause for the Anadi Foundation students for a soulful performance. I now call upon Sri N. Saravana Kumar, Director of the Veranda Club, to present the vote of thanks. Every end is a new beginning, and now is a testament to the beginning of Bharat's journey fast forward into a destination that no other country has envisioned. On behalf of the Veranda Club, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to everyone who made this event a resounding success. First and foremost, a big thanks to our esteemed Chairman Professor P. Kanaga Sabapati ji for his unwavering, <laughs> uh, unwavering support in making this event possible. Your vision and guidance have been invaluable. I'd also like to express our gratitude to our chief mentor, Shri Sundar Ramachandran ji. Your commitment to promoting the culture and heritage of Bharat is commendable. A special mention to our chief curator, Shefali Vaidyaka, <laughs> whose creative brilliance curated an unforgettable experience for all. Your your dedication to this festival is truly appreciated. I would like to thank my dear friend and brother, Jagannathan, <laughs> whose vision laid the foundation for this yatra. And my, our teammates, Balaji, Prashanji, Vignesh, and all others who have supported us. We are grateful to all the authors, speakers, and all the luminaries 
who graced our event with their wisdom and insight. To our audience and viewers online, we owe a heartful thanks, thank you for your enthusiastic participation and support. Your presence made this festival come alive and we are deeply grateful. Let's not forget our hardworking technical team who express, who expertise ensure a seamless event. Your behind the scene efforts did not unnoticed. I also thank all our sponsors and media and communication partner for their priceless contribution. As we wrap up the second edition of the LitFest, we urge everyone and particularly young minds to read more and explore the rich tapestry of Indian history and culture. Let's work together and understand our roots and contribute to the growth of our beloved Bharat. As we are planning to have one pro program in every quarter, requesting everyone to have Veranda Club program in your annual calendars. Please bring youngsters to the program because we need to pass on the Sanskriti to them. Once again, thank you for being part of the incredible literary journey until we meet again at the next event, which is not so far. Jai Hind. As the two-day extravaganza of the Western Ghats Lit Fest draws to a close, we want to express our heartful gratitude. I take a moment to thank each and every one of you for joining this event. Your presence and positive energy created an amazing atmosphere that will be cherished forever. I thank all the technicians and workers for their ceaseless efforts. I also thank each and every one of you who contributed to making this event a resounding success. Giving my special thanks to the Veranda Club. We've journeyed through the realms of literature, exploring the depths of creativity and sharing profound ideas. Today, as we part ways, let's carry the spirit of this festival with us, nurturing the love for literature, embracing diverse perspectives and continuing our intellectual pursuits. Thank you for being a part of this literary celebration. And here's to the endless stories yet to be written and the countless adventures yet to be explored. Until we meet again, keep reading, keep writing, and keep the magic of words alive. This is Akshita signing off. Thank you. Thank you.